in five, four, three, two. On September the 8th, 2007, after constant promotion and fanfare, the television show iCarly first premiered on Nickelodeon, becoming a near instant hit among the younger viewer base of the station. The show follows Carly Shay, a Seattle teenager whose life suddenly changes after footage of her making jokes is accidentally uploaded to the internet. Becoming an e-celebrity overnight for this viral hit, Carly and her two best friends decide to venture into the unknown, as they begin making weekly internet content. The show chronicles their rise to fame, starting from the bottom as they eventually become one of the most popular shows on the entire web. To people too old or even too young to have been around for iCarly, it might seem like just another kid show. But for those of us who were there, iCarly existed on a whole other level of popularity. I remember sitting down to watch the pilot episode on that first day and thinking that it was just okay. I thought it was pleasantly watchable, but that it was far from living up to Drake and Josh, which is the show that it was basically replacing. And yet, I still watched it as often as I could whenever it was on, basically. Even if you were in that rebellious stage of your childhood where you were pretending that you didn't like things that you actually really loved, the characters and world of iCarly were just too riveting to ignore. On top of all that, iCarly is also a show which lasted a very long time. For more than five years, nearly a hundred episodes, and six total seasons, iCarly outlasted everything that hoped to compete. For a sitcom to last six seasons isn't exactly uncommon, but for a children's sitcom to go on so long that it crosses generational boundaries, well, that doesn't happen every single day. iCarly also continuously proves to be one of those shows that you probably remember more about than you think you do. You might have a conversation about it with your friends, thinking you remember the pilot and a couple other episodes, only for a chain of broken memories to flood back into your mind. Spaghetti tacos and random dancing, Spencer's art and Carly's ranting, Pack Rat, Galaxy Wars, the groovy smoothie, all hidden away in the recesses of your mind, like a justifiably repressed memory. But the show being popular and quietly memorable isn't really why we're going to be talking about it here today. The real reason I've decided to talk about this 2007 sitcom in the year of our lord 2021 is that I think iCarly was ahead of its time in a lot of ways. When it was written, iCarly was essentially speculative fiction. Sure, there had been a few people by this point who had stumbled upon careers on the internet, but for the most part, the lifestyle Carly is seen living and the things that she goes through were created through the imagination of what websites like YouTube could inevitably bring to the lives of small creators. And oh so many years later, iCarly has become a pretty accurate representation of what a creator's life ends up becoming. I've met YouTubers where I go to their house and they have the iCarly set. They have all these knickknacks and oddities and they're worried about award shows and stalkers and if that sponsor is secretly a scam. And it makes me realize we are living out these fantasy lives that Nickelodeon tried to market to us. We've become the web stars that we were told we could become. And as I rewatch this show for this colossal project, I wonder if I'll look at these characters not as teenagers like I did before, but as creators struggling to survive in a very difficult market. But it's worth pointing out that my intentions and plans for this project have been sort of derailed. Because essentially at the exact same time that I told you guys that I was going to be making this video, it was widely announced that iCarly was going to begin filming an official seventh season. And while I worked on this video, it was weird to think that as I was reliving this show, which I didn't think anyone else cared about, they were literally filming more episodes at the exact same time. And so I also have to answer this question of why? Why are they making iCarly Season 7? What is the broader appeal that this new show is going to try and capture? How are they going to do that when only three of the former cast members have apparently been confirmed? And is trying to find an appreciation for iCarly paradoxical to everything that we now must recognize about the show? 
Before all of this is over, I will be trying to answer all of these questions. However, there's something big that I want to get out of the way before we're too invested here. This originally started off as something that I presumed would be a rather short video. Then my expectations became that it would be a long video, likely over an hour, because I had a lot to say. But at the time that I am recording this, it's clear that this will instead be another fleshed out mini-series. Sort of like what I did with History Channel last year. Each episode will primarily tackle a different angle, a different topic, but every part is going to be a full video on its own. And trust me when I say that it's all going to pay off in the end. If you'd like updates on what's happening with the miniseries and when new episodes are coming, follow me on Twitter. And of course, if you want to make absolutely sure that you'll never miss an episode when it comes out, hit subscribe below and make sure that bell is set to all notifications. We're trying to get to 500,000 subscribers by the end of 2021, and every person who hits that button helps us along on that journey. With that, to start us off on how this adventure took place, let's leap all the way back to the beginning. Yeah, this is an ASMR channel now. So today is January the 28th, 2021, and I am sitting down to do a little bit of camcorder footage because today is officially the day that I am beginning what I am calling the iCarly Project. Now, I don't expect to be able to get any part of this series out until, like, March, April, that ballpark area, so I know for a fact that people are going to end up asking, Quentin, why has this taken so long? And that's a valid question. Because it would have been very, very easy to just watch the first half a season, read through the Wikipedia article, rewatch episodes that I kind of half remember, and then just make a semi-long video about my experience of doing that. And that's typically what I do for videos like this. For instance, when I did my video about Cory in the house, I watched about seven episodes maybe. And even for bigger projects like uh, History Channel and Pawn Stars, while I watched a lot of the show, I didn't watch all of it and I tended to skip around a lot to get the gist. And if I had just done that, if I had just watched a minimal amount of episodes and then rushed a video out, I easily could have got an iCarly video out the week after we hit 400k. But this is not the experience that I want to have with iCarly. First of all, I'm not going to watch the first season or so. I'm not going to recap myself on all the memorable moments. I am going to watch every single episode of this show. Every special, every crossover, every movie, every single second that ever hit the airwaves. And second off, my vision for the iCarly project is not only that I'm going to rewatch this show, but that I'm going to restructure my life around watching the show being an essential element of it. Starting today, I am going to watch one episode of iCarly. No more, no less, every single day until I run out. And I'm going to go out of my way to take more time to do all of this just because I want to see what will happen when this show becomes deeply embedded into my skull. I wanted to get to the point that when I'm done with this project, my body goes through like an intense withdrawal. I want to have an anxiety attack on day 97 because I've run out of iCarly episodes and I don't know what to do with my life anymore. But there's also a second side to this, which I guess is less relevant to the show, but I still want to break down here because I think it's a really funny element to this video. So, I don't know if you guys know this fact about me, but, uh, I'm a fat piece of shit. So when I first started Quentin Reviews, I weighed over 300 pounds, and I was really embarrassed by how I look, and eventually I decided that I wanted to turn things around and, and get back on track to a better 
a better health. And by 2018, I had dropped down to like 260, 250, and I was really happy with what I had accomplished and how I looked, and I felt a lot more comfortable on screen. For the first time ever, I felt like I looked the actual age that I really was. But then in 2019, I fell into this suicidal depression spiral, and then in 2020, I stopped going on walks because I stopped having safe places to walk to. And now in 2021, I'm completely back to the same weight that I was in 2016. So how much do I weigh? Well, the other day I stepped on my scale to find out, and my scale broke. So I am newspaper punchline fat. Here's why this bothers me a lot. I think in the past few years, I have consistently proven that I am willing to do any emotional task if it means that there's a funny punchline in relation to the channel. The iCarly project is actually inspired by another thing I did a couple years ago, which I called the B-Movie Project. Now, I've talked about this many times before, but for those of you who don't understand the undertaking that that was, um, in 2017, I thought it would be funny if I started recording, like, alternate versions of every single video that I ever made. So for every video that I produced, starting there, I would also make a shorter alternate version starring a different evil me. So the idea was that one day I would upload like a fake collage of my YouTube videos and when you'd watch it you'd suddenly realize that it was all unreleased material, you know, brand new stuff that had never been seen before. And I decided that the entire project would be me discussing B-Movie, which was a really funny joke in 2017. <laughs> So I worked on this consistently from 2017 through the beginning of 2019. It was three years of dedicated work, and, and it wasn't really that funny by the time the video came out, and not a lot of people saw it. Another similar story is that in early 2020, the video game Raid Shadow Legends had become a meme, and I thought it would be funny if I started playing that game and purposefully trying to get good at it, exclusively so I could say that I was one of the top Raid Shadow Legends players in the world. In fact, if you go to speedruns.com right now, you'll discover that I actually have a bunch of world records in Raid Shadow Legends. To accomplish this, I played Raid Shadow Legends every single day for 270 days. All for a joke that was funny in January 2020, but not in January 2021. And so what's been bothering me recently is that I can do all of these emotionally and potentially physically taxing things, all for the sake of setting up jokes which aren't even that funny, but I can't take care of myself. And then it hit me really recently. All I have to do is convince myself that getting in shape and taking care of myself without telling anyone that I'm doing those things would be a really funny joke. Because I think it would be a really funny meme if old friends saw me on the street and I looked completely and totally different and they said, Hey man, what happened to you? And I got to say, with a straight face, I Carly happened to me. And so not only will I be watching iCarly every single day, but I also intend to convince my brain to associate iCarly with working out and dieting and trying to take care of myself. Because if I can work on a shitpost video for three years, and I can play Raid Shadow Legends for 270 days in a row, then I should be able to care about myself for a hundred days or so. And I am so excited to finally get into this show, to figure out the secrets that lay beneath it, and to finally turn my life around. So come on! Let's get started. I just realized... This is the wrong show. 
so the pilot episode of iCarly plays out like this. Carly Shay has been brought to the principal's office after getting in trouble with her school's most infamous mean teacher. Mrs. Hafer, I mean Mr. Sweeney, I mean Miss Briggs, yeah, sorry, Miss Briggs. Carly has allegedly been caught plastering photoshops of Miss Briggs all over school. And as punishment, it is decided that she will be forced to record and watch over the school's talent show auditions that Saturday. This is something that Carly doesn't want to do, because the school talent show is notoriously lame and embarrassing. However, in protesting this, she has cemented her punishment in the eyes of Miss Briggs. Out in the hallway, we discover that Carly did not create the mean image of Miss Briggs after all, but that it was instead her brutish best friend, Sam, who Carly took the rap for because Sam is one offense away from being expelled. Carly forces Sam to join her in judging the competition, and they recruit Carly's neighbor Freddy to handle the equipment. I just asked to borrow your video camera. What is all this? Well, that's a three-ship high-def camcorder with a hypercardioid condenser microphone, mounted on a carbon fiber tripod with a low-drag fluid head. I also brought you juice and a bagel! Freddy's whole deal in season one is that he's secretly in love with Carly. And by secretly, I mean that it's constantly stated at nearly every moment he's on screen. I was gonna walk you home from school, but I couldn't find you. Hey! One thing I noticed this time around is that Freddy is really tiny in the pilot episode. To the extent that it's hard to believe that he's supposed to be the same age as the rest of the group. And hilariously, the way they fix this for the remainder of season one is to give Freddy platform shoes that he wears constantly just so he can be taller than the girls on the show. Anyways, that Saturday, the trio watch through the tryouts and are bored out of their minds. In between auditions, they crack jokes about Miss Briggs and the students auditioning. Can we please discuss the boy's hair and glasses? He looks like Miss Briggs! <laughs> yeah, except he doesn't have Miss Briggs' crazy pointy boobs. <laughs> The next day, Carly checks to see if Freddy has posted the video, only to discover that he has made a ghastly mistake. Instead of editing out Sam and Carly's jokes and cruel comments, Freddy has uploaded only those comments, resulting in 27,000 people seeing these private outtakes. By the time they take it down, most of the school has seen the video, including Miss Briggs, who refuses to accept any students which Sam and Carly picked out from the talent show. Back at Carly's apartment, the group lament that teachers in their lives are always celebrating their ability to deny them control. At which point, Carly comes up with a great idea. For the three of them to continue making web show content live streaming every week and doing whatever they want. Freddy suggests the name iCarly, and Sam decides that she will show up every week, eat food, and contribute nothing else. At this point, we also meet Carly's brother Spencer, an amateur artist in the Seattle area who is often seen working on various sculptures. His most famous creations including The Bottle Robot, Mary Sniffmas, and of course, Toasty the Baker. Other times, he gets distracted and finds completely different and random passions for the evening. In one episode, he makes a stop motion movie, which clearly isn't stop motion, and in another, he builds a fish feeding contraption that continuously kills fish. Because if there's anything Spencer knows well, it's starting fires and murdering goldfish. He's typically seen working on projects on the first floor of the apartment, while the iCarly web show is put together on the third floor. Which, can we just stop for a moment and talk about this goddamn apartment? I know that complaining about spacious apartments in sitcoms is a bit of a trope in nitpicking. Everyone always says, how can the cast are friends, blah de blah de blah de da But like, seriously. How can Spencer afford this apartment? So there are three confirmed floors to the Shea apartment. The first floor is mostly the living room and the kitchen. 
To the audience's right is also implied to be a shower in Spencer's bedroom, as seen in episodes like I Dream of Dance. The second floor is nebulous for most of the series, but we eventually find out that's where Carly's room is placed, alongside another bathroom. The top floor is, of course, the extremely spacious I, Carly set, alongside a couple other mystery rooms which we never see inside. Incidentally, the back of the third floor also appears to have a completely separate exit from the main staircase, which I've come to believe is attached to this weird service staircase that we see in the World Record episode. This apartment also has three exits. I I repeat, three exits. A front entrance, which is featured in most episodes, a back entrance in the kitchen, which characters sometimes run through if they need to, and the elevator, which not only goes to the other two levels in the apartment, but also directly to the lobby. This is all made significantly worse by the fact that sometimes the cast will visit other apartments in the building, and they're typically nowhere near as spacious or luxurious. The supposedly haunted apartment 13B is just a normal two-bedroom apartment, and Freddy's apartment is completely different when we eventually see it. Things are made even more confusing later in the show. In Season 2, Episode 1, the apartment's elevator breaks and falls from the living room to the apartment basement, causing Spencer to exclaim, We're fine, the elevator just dropped nine floors to the basement. Later, in the extended version, only on the DVD, this exchange takes place. I can't believe the elevator's still broken. I know! I just dragged this anchor up eight flights of stairs. I don't know how I'm gonna get that boat up here. And I know, I know, why am I bringing this up as if it's something that matters? Well, because Carly and Spencer are in apartment 8C, which is easy to remember because Freddy's apartment is 8D, which is internet slang for something dirty. And I know this is going to sound like one of those math problems you had to do in school, but if they are eight floors to the basement, and Spencer has to drag this anchor up eight flights of stairs, and their apartment 8C, that means that every single apartment below them can only be a single level. Otherwise, it would be 24 flights of stairs to the lobby. So in other words, Spencer has a three-level apartment in the middle of a single-level apartment complex. And I know it really seems like I'm lingering on this, but this is an apartment that the Crane Brothers would find to be excessive, which, now that I'm processing that, I've just now realized that Frazier and iCarly are both set in Seattle, making a crossover between them entirely plausible, and I implore any of you who are good at fanfiction out there to get that on my desk as soon as you possibly can. Anyways, this all leads us around to my personal iCarly fan theory number one. Spencer is secretly Banksy. So the characters set up their first web show, and it's an amazing success. A guy squirts milk out of his eyes, a Power Rangers actor talks backwards, a nine-year-old does gymnastic poses that you'll wince and turn away from, and a girl on a pogo stick plays the trumpet. By the end, the livestream receives nearly 40,000 views, and the group celebrates with a random hat party where they begin to realize the scale of what has just happened to them. You might get famous. Yeah, I don't know if I'm gonna like that. And that's the pilot, yay! Okay, so I've only been doing the iCarly project for a couple days, but I've already gotten down to 297 pounds. So I think it's time for some Taco Bell! I've earned this. Okay then. I've earned this. Oh no! Did you see that? Why can't you sing that note next to our math teacher's head? <laughs> oh, Sam! Finish off tonight's webcast. It's important to point out here that iCarly existed to fill a quota, and her name was Miranda Cosgrow. At the time, Miranda had been one of the most promising up-and-coming child stars at Nickelodeon. With a featuring role in the sitcom Drake and Josh as the mendacious Megan, and of course a lead in the Jack Black comedy School of Rock. My point is that if the iCarly pilot had failed, I strongly believe that there would have been another show in the same time slot also starring Miranda Cosgrove. 
But considering that to be the truth, it is incredible the amount of talent that they managed to bring together for this show. I remember during the iCarly era, there were a bunch of Disney Channel shows that kind of had a similar vibe, and there was always a weak link to those. As much as I love Selena Gomez, for instance, uh, character acting was never her strong suit, and you never really got the idea in Wizards of Waverly Place that she got the joke of her character. But with iCarly, every performance is impressive. They all get their characters, they all understand the comedy of these scenes, and they're all still kids at this point. Now, I imagine quite a few of you barely remember this show, or perhaps never saw it in the first place, and in that case, I think it's time that we break down some basic, non-pilot dynamics. Now, the general consensus tends to be that out of the three main cast members, Freddy and Sam are the most interesting. The two are basically different sides of the same coin, both coming from broken households plagued by the opposite problems. Sam has a mother who, depending on what episode you watch and what joke they make, is either really tacky and gross or suffers from severe mental health problems. How come you can't read at your house? Ah, cause my mom keeps screaming at the cat to get a job. <laughs> Sam's mother, apparently, barely recognizes that she has a daughter, leading to Sam spending most of her time at Carly's apartment, even when no one else is around. Freddy, meanwhile, spends time with Carly partially to escape from his own mother, who is too present in his life. Freddy's mother is overly controlling and destructive, to the point of being physically abusive with him and invading his privacy, giving him, quote, bi-weekly body checks, as well as tick baths. While he loves his mother, a moment at the Shea household is a moment of relative release that he otherwise doesn't get to experience. This leaves Spencer as the de facto adult of the household. He has been left in control of Carly's life, as her father is stationed in the Navy throughout the show's six seasons. Incidentally, Carly's mother is never mentioned and seems to not exist. Sam and Freddy also seem to not have fathers. iCarly fan theory number two. The main characters are all clones. Prove me wrong, you can't! Spencer is a really positive figure in the show, because he makes sure to steer Carly in the right direction, while also believing that it's very important that she gets to have a childhood, making sure that she is neither stripped of a father figure, nor stifled in her ability to have constructive experiences. To both kids and adults, Spencer is a very admirable figure. To kids, he's the sort of adult that they want to grow up to be, and to adults, he's the kind of person that they they still want to grow up to be. He doesn't let go of his artistic side, but his core goal in life is ultimately the betterment of other people. Now, a big criticism a lot of people have is that out of all of these characters, Carly seems to be the least. She doesn't have a gimmick, she doesn't have a joke, and in a lot of scenes she ends up playing the straight man, while funny characters are doing something else in shot. But having just rewatched the show, I disagree with this diagnosis. In my opinion, Carly can be best described not as a generic girl character, but instead as a tangled ball of pure, unbridled anxiety. That's the garbage disposal! Oh my god! Miranda seems to be at her best in this show when her character has something to fret about. You know, when there's an internet troll who's hacked her website, or a boy she did something embarrassing in front of, or an episode of American Idol that she forgot to TiVo. Having to deal with extreme emotions is basically her thing, and typically it is thus cathartic to see her either find a solution, decide to do the right thing, or just realize that it's not that important. Now I've decided to not analyze Gibby in this section of the video, because Gibby, at this point, is not a main cast member, but someone who has a cameo every few episodes. This is, in my opinion, where the character works the best. Don't get me wrong, I love Gibby, but I think around the time he starts getting consistent standalone storylines where the other characters aren't even there is when the golden era of the show ends. Like, oh, Gibby's gonna open a pizzeria, we're out of ideas! Regardless of how you feel about that, it is generally going to make more sense to 
analyze this character a little bit later in the project. Starting now, I want to discuss a few notable episodes in Season 1, which capture one of the main four in a particularly interesting way. Starting us off is I Wanna Stay With Spencer, essentially the first Spencer episode and a really strong Carly episode. While broadcasting the latest episode of iCarly to her many viewers, Carly invites her brother on to show off his latest piece of art, a literal hammer fan inspired by something he saw on a home renovation show. Spencer notes that it really does spin like a fan. However, once he turns it on, it quickly loses control and spins rapidly. And as Spencer screams for everyone to hit the deck, one hammer dislodges and barely misses striking Carly in the head. In response to this tool time travesty, Carly's grandfather suddenly visits without prior warning, and as the kids leave to get smoothies, it becomes clear why. Grandpa Shay has decided that Spencer is not a fit person to be raising Carly, because he has never learned to be a responsible adult himself. After calling her father, he is given complete control over Carly's fate, and thus decides that she shall move with him to Yakima, which she strongly protests. The three kids try to come up with some plan to prove that Spencer is a responsible adult, and so Carly decides to change her appearance in a way that is so upsetting that Spencer will discipline her appropriately. However, things don't quite go to plan. You look fantastic! What? How can you think she looks good like that? I don't. Then why did you tell her she's a little teenager? But you gotta let kids express themselves. I a fire soon breaks out due to Spencer's chicken stir fry, and it seems that Carly is officially yet Yakimau bound. However, when Spencer rushes to make sure that Carly has her rarely used inhaler, their grandpa decides that Carly can stay with him, and all is well. If one is looking for a Sam-centered story, they can't find a more tragic example than Season 1, Episode 15, I Hate Sam's Boyfriend. In the story, Sam meets Jonah, a classmate of Freddy's who she becomes instantly smitten with after hearing his adolescent jokes in the hall. You make funny chicken noises. Freddy does a good deed and suggests that Jonah ask her out, and the two begin a turrid honeymoon phase, where they become totally bewitched with one another. For the first time ever, Sam is completely and totally happy, but only when she's with Jonah or texting him on her phone. This becomes an annoyance to Carly and Freddy, who discover it impossible to break through to her when she's in this state, becoming more of a problem when she begins missing rehearsals for iCarly in this blog disposition. I know how we could get back at her. Huh? You and I should start dating. That way Freddy! I know. Things become worse when Jonah begins inserting himself into their lives and their show, revealing that he is a very cruel and unlikable person. When she tries to reason with him in private, Jonah attempts to kiss Carly. And when Sam hears about this, she attaches Jonah to a wedgie machine that tugs him up and down by his underwear and then live streams that to the internet for several hours. The lesson? Sam might love a few boys, but nothing comes in between these two best friends. Except for the many episodes where something comes in between these two best friends. Such as, I don't want to fight. In this episode, Sam and Carly are celebrating their friend anniversary, aka the anniversary of the day that they met. Carly gives Sam a customized t-shirt, and Sam promises to get Carly tickets to the Cuttlefish concert that weekend. Sam visits Rip Off Rodney, my personal favorite season one side character, who says that he can either get Sam the tickets for $200, or the shirt that Sam is wearing. Why? Because iCarly's a hot web show. The more popular it gets, the more the shirt'll be worth. When Carly learns that Sam traded her gift for concert tickets, they break out into a huge fight, as people around the world become invested in their scuffle. Interestingly, when Freddy attempts to do a broadcast to settle the dispute, he loudly proclaims that he is in love with Carly, implying that all of the drama and character details that we see on TV are also shown to viewers on the webcast. This seems to be confirmed by the actual in-universe iCarly website. For those of you who don't know, iCarly.com was a real website during the show's run, which would typically post exclusive content that was intended to be canon. Most episodes even made a big deal out of plugging the site at the end and getting viewers to check it out. 
In my opinion, one of the coolest features of this site was the in-character blogs made to tie in to each episode, where characters would write about their feelings and things which had recently happened to them. In this one, Carly links to photos from a dream she had. What? But this post is my personal all-time favorite. If you're reading this, that means you probably watched our web show, I, Carly. Okay, one question. Is Carly the most insanely amazing girl on this planet, or what? She's cute when she's happy, she's cute when she's sad, she's cute when she's angry. How can she be so cute? I know she's gonna read this and yell at me for saying all this stuff, but whatever. Okay, I should stop talking about Carly now. Have you guys seen the new pair phone? My mom won't let me get one because she says that it's dangerous to put electronic devices next to your head. But my mom thinks everything's dangerous. She won't let me get a goldfish because she's afraid it'll bite me when I feed it. But why would I ever stick my fingers in the water? Anyway, you know what's even cuter than a goldfish? Carly! Okay, I should stop talking about Carly now. A girl I love more than pear phones, goldfish, and everything else. Can you blame me? Ugh! I can't take it. Okay, bye. Oh, and if Carly and I ever get married and have three kids and a cat, this is what our family might look like. It's important to point out here that Freddy claims that his mom thinks it's dangerous to put electronics close to his head, but then we find out in the next season that she put a tracking beacon into his brain when he was a baby, just so she could always know where he is. You guys hear that? No. Hear what? Oh right, but I almost forgot to wrap this one up. Carly and Sam are friends again, yay! Probably one of the most memorable episodes out of the early bunch is season one, episode 16, I Hatch Chicks. In the episode, Carly and Sam are paired together for a science experiment and Spencer gives them the idea to hatch chicks for the assignment. They place the eggs in an incubator on the third floor, only for the birds to escape directly after hatching. The characters have to search every nook and cranny of the apartment, trying to figure out where each chick has ended up, as they can't be out of the incubator for too long, or else they will die. Curiously, they don't search in any of the rooms on the second floor, which is still apparently an empty nothingness at this point in the show. Long story short, Spencer gets stuck in an air vent, his pants get ripped off, Freddy's wrestler bully throws the fridge, and when they only have one chick left, they realize it's in the window to the elevator. Freddy gets told to come upstairs with tools, but uses the elevator, causing the chick to fall from the window, out of the grasp of the characters. But Spencer gets out of the vent and we find out the chick flew into his mouth, meaning that all the chicks are saved, yay. Now you might notice that up to this point, whenever we've talked about the in-universe iCarly web show, it's been through a passing mention. And that's because iCarly isn't totally hingent on iCarly providing drama for the characters. Some episodes are just about Spencer dating a crazy teacher or cops trying to catch a person accused of pirating movies, who turns out to just be a guy making pirate movies. The web show almost becomes its own character in a way, with its own dedicated episodes to exploring its side of the story. It is worth discussing that there is kind of a mini art going on in the show surrounding iCarly.com. In the first few episodes, the characters will occasionally name drop how many views their videos or streams have received, and they tend to be impressive but not astounding. That's what 27,000 and 37,000 views are pretty realistic for viral videos on the early internet. And that's about where the show's popularity stays for a few episodes. However, in Season 1, Episode 8, Freddy mentions that they're receiving their highest view count ever, and the number we see at that point is 500,000 viewers. Confusingly, 10 episodes later, Freddy again states that they've received their peak viewership, only to list the new number as... 355,000. <laughs> Which implies that either one of these numbers is wrong, or these stories take place in neither broadcast nor production order? That debate is made irrelevant just two episodes later, when Freddy is late to the show and Carly exclaims, Millions of people are signing on to iCarly.com right now, so could you please pick up your pretty little camera and count backwards from five? 
And from what I've seen, from this point forward, the iCarly webcast is consistently stated to be receiving views in the millions. Now, this is incredible by the numbers of the early internet, but it's even more astounding when you realize that it's actually impossibly large by the standards of the current internet. Because the characters are not uploading videos and then seeing how many people watch in a day or a week. They're doing live streams and then noting how many people are watching their show concurrently as it transmits. Watch me juggle. <laughs> no way, baby. This iCurly web show is hilarious. If we were to compare this to, say, Twitch.tv, we'd see that only three creators have ever managed to reach that milestone. While on YouTube, a significantly older platform, only seven live streams have ever crossed that boundary. By all accounts, iCarly excelling beyond this level of popularity and on a website completely unhitched from anything else would imply that these kids are not only popular, but one of the most widely viewed things on the entire internet. But one notable thing is that despite this, often the gang's actions are depicted almost in a vacuum, as if they never consider that everything they do and say is being broadcast and archived to the entire world. And I have a huge collection of examples that we're gonna talk about at the end of our season one analysis. But for now, let's just talk about the most obvious, messing with Lubert. Lubert is the character who works in the lobby of Carly and Freddy's apartment building. Designed to be the most disgusting man possible, he is often featured on the iCarly web show where he is pranked time after time. As a kid, I always remember feeling kind of bad for Lubert, especially considering that the way he's antagonized is heavily illegal and unneededly cruel. Then, a few years ago, I remembered that he's a landlord and thus doesn't deserve my pity. But then, while working on this, I realized that I was actually remembering wrong and he's not not a landlord, he's just a really unfriendly guy with a horrible job that he hates. Ah, more people! <laughs> While I was writing this, I struggled to find a good way to describe Lubert. What traits does he personify which make him so terrible while also making me want to feel bad for him? And I eventually figured it out. Lubert is the person my anxiety tells me I would become if it wasn't around to make me stressed about everything. Do you ever go out to the mall or something and your brain kind of stops and goes, hey, what if you did this specific horrible thing? Like what if you knocked over that display or bumped your cart into that old lady or kicked that pigeon in the ass? And you think, oh my God, I, I would never do something like that. That's horrible. But then like the images that your brain generated of you doing those things keeps you up at night for some reason. Lubert is the personification of the image that your brain sends of what you would be like if you did the things that it tells you not to do that you were never going to do in the first place. As a kid, I was under the impression that all this time, Lubert never catches on to the fact that he's being pranked. But if you pay attention to the episodes, it's actually hinted a few times that he's fully aware of what's going on and considers the iCarly gang to be his rivals. But anyways, back to discussing web show specific episodes. Quite a few episodes of season one, I feel, were really prophetic about the realistic repercussions of running an internet show. Take, for instance, I Dream of Dance, where Carly and Sam ask their viewers to send in funny dances for a competition on the show. This leads to them having to watch through hundreds of dancing clips a night, leading to emotional exhaustion, and also, of course, a series of dreams choreographed into dance numbers. <laughs> then there's I Want a World Record, where the group decide that they want a world record, and realize that the world's longest live stream is one they can easily beat. They come up with numerous strategies to stay up for the 24 hours needed, including dunking their heads in ice water, and of course, the invention of the random dancing alarm. Also, if you're curious, according to my research, the actual live stream world record in 2007 wasn't 24 hours, it was 181 hours. But I don't think they had enough ice water to do that. During the broadcast, Spencer builds a statue with moving parts. But it is so extravagant that it shorts out the power on the iCarly set, briefly shutting down the broadcast. Their attempt is thus ruined, and with only a few minutes left before they would have claimed the record. 
However, it's discovered that Spencer has broken the world record for statue with the most moving pieces. And because the other kids, quote, helped, they all get to be in the world record book. Next we have I Got Detention, where the plans for the iCarly 50th web show spectacular are derailed by Sam getting detention, leading Carly to get in trouble so they can broadcast from the detention room. Freddy hides in the closet and sets up secret cameras in the room so they can broadcast without the teacher in charge catching on. Never in my entire life have I eaten one pair of pants. <laughs> one thing that becomes phenomenally obvious about the iCarly web series as you watch more of the iCarly sitcom is that Fredward B. Benson is basically the entire show. Every piece of technology, every gimmicky effect, every light on the set, every button on Sam's remote, it all comes down to him and apparently no one else. Freddy's understanding of technology and video production is beyond any other person on the planet at the time. Freddy controls the main camera of the show and also the live edits, which he somehow manages to do with two buttons on his belt, which literally will do anything he wants. He also maintains a wireless feed between all of his cameras and his laptop, which I do not believe was a thing in 2007. Although maybe it was, because that would certainly seem to explain why the web show runs at 12 frames per second. How Freddy even owns all of this stuff is never actually a Dressed. He just has all of this nice equipment and knows everything about it and they never explain why. I know that some people seem to think that because he's a member of the AV club he just borrowed it all from school, but the dialogue seems to insist at numerous points that it's all his equipment. So let me hit you up with iCarly fan theory number three. Freddy's obsession with cameras and filmography stems from his mother's attempt to build a private police state specifically to spy on him and no one else. Just imagine him as a baby crawling towards one of the 17 cameras in the living room, constantly filming him as he goos and gauze in awe. Each camera and mic would thus be a hand-me-down, as his mother swaps up to the next best waterproof camera to make sure that Freddy is shampooing twice every night. Freddy, you didn't sign the shampoo agreement. How do I know if you double pooed? I mean, it's either that or they didn't put much thought into this tween sitcom, and we all know that's impossible. Anyways, Freddy's lack of recognition on the show is addressed in Season 1, Episode 9, I Will Date Freddy. Or maybe I Want to Date Freddy. Both titles are kind of used intermediately. In the story, Freddy is asked out by Valerie, a fan of iCarly who also goes to Ridgeway Middle School. Seeing nothing wrong with the idea, Freddy says yes. They hold the date at the Spencer household to get away from Freddy's mom. Freddy and Valerie are served spaghetti tacos, and thus the two become a couple. However, shortly into the beginning of their relationship, Valerie asks him to help produce her own web show on the same night that iCarly typically airs. Freddy feels he can't abandon the iCarly team, to which Valerie points out that Sam and Carly don't exactly treat him like he's an important part of the show. It quickly becomes apparent that this is an ultimatum, and Freddy chooses to stick with his girlfriend, quitting iCarly in an email. A physical fight breaks out over this, with Freddy insisting that he'll have another member of the AV club take over as their technical producer. Predictably, this doesn't go swimmingly, and iCarly is proven to be completely non-functional without Freddy's expertise. Meanwhile, the Valerie show is an absolute hit. Things exacerbate when Valerie approaches Sam with an offer for her to quit iCarly and join her show, where she is promised top billing. Her goal in all of this is apparently to become internet famous herself and to eliminate Carly in the process. And will not Carly Shay right off the internet? And then? In a couple of years, we could have the most popular show on the web. Of course, Sam immediately tells Carly about this, and they fret over how to deal with the problem. Incidentally, iCarly is probably the only children's show in the history of TV to purposefully come up with a replacement for the term c bag. You know, the bona fide in existence term that means exactly what their sound alike term in this episode also means? She's trying to use me! That little. Say it! I don't like to say it. Spencer says it's not ladylike. <laughs> say it! That skunk bag! Now, some people argue that this word is actually a, a way of saying scumbag or hussy, but like, come on. The derogatory term used exclusively to describe women which Sam loves using but Spencer thinks is unladylike? They're saying c bag. Grow up. 
The two try and tell Freddy about his girlfriend's true motivations, and although he doesn't believe them at first, when he confronts Valerie, she tells him the truth. But Freddy says he'll only come back if he's accepted as an important part of the team, and after they say that he matters, they hug it out and iCarly.com is back together. Also, a TV falls on Valerie and she dies. She's never in the show again. If we're delving into the topics of drama, then it's only logical that we next switch over to an episode that I know you all have been waiting to talk about. Season 1, Episode 6, I... Neville. At the beginning of this episode, the main trio are attempting to spread word about their web show among their classmates, something that they often do early on in the TV show. While doing this, they run into a group of mean girls, who tell them that if iCarly was as important as they say, it would have been featured on Nevelocity.com. Upon doing some research, it's revealed that Nevelocity is apparently the most popular blog on the entire internet, gaining over 5 million views every single day. To appear on that site would be a huge boost to their popularity, and so Carly attempts to get in contact with Neville to see if he'll watch their show. Neville responds strongly to this, and invites Carly to have an interview at his home. Spencer takes Carly there, where we discover that Neville is actually an 11-year-old child. Because in this universe, the internet is controlled exclusively by middle schoolers. However, when Spencer leaves the room, we quickly catch on that Neville has invited Carly over not for an interview, but for ulterior motives. Neville attempts to put the moves on Carly, even going as far as to try and kiss her, causing Carly to shove Tapanod into his face, as he threatens to destroy her for this. You shouldn't have done that, Carly Shay! You'll rue this day, you'll rue it! This is a really weird sequence, at least in 2021, because what's essentially happening here is that Carly is being placed into a casting couch situation, and for the most part, it's being played entirely for jokes. Like, we're supposed to be on Carly's side, we're supposed to be mad on her behalf, but this is betrayed with the same level of seriousness as the episode where Carly's teacher gives her a B instead of an A. To see a situation like this portrayed in a pre-Me Too era without the seriousness that the topic necessitates, it's... weird? The subplot for this episode is that Spencer is building a butter sculpture of a character named Toasty the Baker, who then melts when he's not looking, causing him to have to rebuild him. Soon you'll be back and butter than ever. <laughs> Thank God no one heard that. I think this dichotomy sums up iCarly pretty well. What other sitcom on the planet could feature an A-plot where the female lead gets sexually harassed and a B-plot where the male lead builds a sculpture out of butter? Neville writes a scathing review of the site, causing stress to the group as they're flogged with Neville's fanbase turning on them. Enraged, the trio decide that it's time to expose Neville for what he's done, and after a series of failed attempts, they decide that there's only one person in the world who will care about this story in 2007. Neville's mom. You told me you thought girls were yucky. That was last year! Neville's mom forces him to write a positive review. The group gets more tapenade, and we end off with a happy ending. At least, for now. Bum bum bum! One episode that isn't really about the web show, but is still notable in this section, is I Heart Art. The story is easily the best Spencer episode of season one, and deals primarily with one specific theme. The struggle that artists face with imposter syndrome. All creative people worry their stuff's lame. It's an artist thing. In the episode, Spencer discovers that a museum in Seattle is opening an exhibit for talented but unknown artists, causing him to frantically work on three new sculptures to submit. He struggles to feel confident about his work, and fears that the museum will not be enamored with his material. To try and rectify this, Carly decides to invite Harry Joyner to the apartment. Joyner is Spencer's hero, a surrealist sculptor also based in Seattle, and Carly hopes his praise will raise Spencer's spirits. However, Joyner takes barely a brief glimpse at these statues before he announces that they are simply amateurish and belong in the trash. Uninterested and preoccupied, he takes his leave, allowing Spencer to react maturely in private. <laughs> 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 
Carly and the gang try to boost his spirits by showing off his sculptures on iCarly, but Spencer is too far gone by this stage, and tells Carly that he plans on quitting art to become a dentist's assistant. The trio track down Joyner and tell him that Spencer has quit art because of his dismissal, and in a twist of fate, Joyner tracks Spencer down and makes an admission. Your sculptures are better than anything I've done in a long time. <laughs> the two make up and work together on a sculpture for the dentist's office where Spencer once worked. The fine line between art and material product is addressed somewhat in Season 1, Episode 18, I Promote Tech Foots. Before any of you ask, yes, I have noticed, we'll get there when we get there. In the episode, Carly and the gang are approached by a famous shoe company to do paid advertising on the iCarly web show. The situation is very simple. They will be paid $100,000 a year, and in exchange, they will promote the new tech foot every week on the iCarly show. They, of course, accept and begin living the good life. However, within a few days, it becomes apparent that the tech foots are not up to the standard of quality that was once promised. They are prone to malfunctions, will wipe hard drives, and can even burst into flames in certain situations. Fans of the show begin threatening to boycott iCarly if they do not cease promoting the sponsor. But Carly is told by Daka Shoes that if the trio break their contract, they will be sued. Spencer, who went to law school for three days, finds a loophole in the Daka contract, wherein they were only instructed to say positive things, with no other stipulations. So, in that week's iCarly, the trio highlight the many problems with the shoe, but use language which make all of these seem like good things. It's also perfect for... ROASTED WEENIES! Daka can see that they've been beat and buy the group out of their contract for $30,000. With that money, Carly buys Spencer a motorbike, which will become extremely important later on in the franchise's history. The journey of the iCarly webcast finding mainstream and commercial recognition inevitably brings us around to episode 23, iCarly Saves TV, a sort of spiritual finale for season 1. We begin the episode with somewhat of a tongue-in-cheek satire relevant to the era. In the story, a children's TV writer is trying to get his daughter interested in a new pilot that he is going to pitch to a major network. The show is heavily implied to be a parody of Disney Channel sitcoms of the era, and is extremely lame, causing his daughter to much prefer browsing the internet and enjoying web show material like iCarly. In response, the executive decides that iCarly is exactly what television needs, and he gathers Carly, Sam, and Freddy together to offer them their own time slot. Excited as any kid would be to be on TV, the trio accept and begin filming. However, a few blemishes begin to appear almost immediately. Freddy's supposed job as supervising producer is nothing more than an empty title, as he begins to do demeaning jobs for the main producer on set. Constant intervention by the network quickly strips iCarly of everything that made it unique. A dinosaur mascot clearly inspired by Barney is inserted into the show, to the annoyance of everyone who sees the character. And after Sam beats up the actor inside the suit for minutes on end, she is replaced by an egotistical toddler starlet who Carly has no chemistry with. This is made worse by Carly being locked out of the writing room, as a group of middle-aged men begin writing her material in her place. Carly tries to quit, but is told that because the network bought the rights to the iCarly name, they own her brand and, by proxy, her. She has no option but to put up with the creative theft going on, or else she will be in breach of her contract. A few notable scenes take place in this episode, which are kind of weird and messed up. You'll remember that Freddy has been running around doing insulting tasks for the crew, despite supposedly being an important producer on the show. Well, about halfway through the episode, Freddy is called onto set because, as I quote, there is a sweaty guy who needs to be iced off. And we then cut to a large man in the corner of the set who lifts up his shirt for Freddy to rub ice on, which Freddy then does, 
This scene is really weird in the regular edit, but it's about a million times weirder in the extended edition only on the DVD. In this version of the episode, the man begins groaning heavily and then explicitly asks Freddy out on a date. You like Italian food? And you see, this is the reason that you watch the DVD version. For all the great Freddy gets molested jokes that were cut from the final release. The second thing worth pointing out here is the B-plot, featuring Spencer and Freddy's mom. In the story, Freddy's mother has become upset over her lack of things to do now that her son has a job and is away from the house. And she essentially begins visiting Spencer and babying him in lieu of her own son. Now, there's one sequence in the subplot which I think accidentally says a lot about the character. In the scene, Spencer is working on one of his sculptures and asks Freddy's mother to hand him a screwdriver. She warns him that the tip is pointy, which Spencer scoffs at before he reaches out and accidentally stabs himself with the device. Now, what I think is recognizable about this scene is the fact that Freddy's mother purposefully has the screwdriver pointed out. Logically, she could and should have pointed the handle towards him instead. But by handing him the end that could be dangerous, she asserts her role as mother as something essential. A subtle character detail which implies a greater motivation to her actions. Anyways, after Sam is fired and Carly begins fighting the changes to the show, the TV producer eventually realizes that his changes to the concept of iCarly could lead to something bigger and better. And so he creates, literally, the exact same sitcom pilot he had at the start of the show, except it now stars that dinosaur mascot. But Michelle, why would you accept two dates to the prom without telling either boy about the other? Because, Dad, Luke is so sweet, but Brandon is so hot. <laughs> There's clearly a greater purpose and a lesson to this episode. TV producers in the early 2000s, and even today, look at the internet as a source of a new age of content that they can milk and exploit. Yet their lack of understanding in what makes that material actually worth something means that they'll always revert to their initial instincts to make something unreservedly derivative. Now up to this point, for the most part, I have been discussing episodes which I had a somewhat positive experience rewatching. But what about the direct opposite? Were there any episodes that I disliked to the extent of regretting this project? The answer can be found in Season 1, Episode 13. I am your biggest fan. Let's break down what I find so terrible about this story. While going through emails sent in by viewers, Sam and Carly discover one from a fan who lives in Washington and wants to know if they would ever consider having a live audience. The fan also claims to be their biggest supporter, and the trio decide to invite her onto the show in order to create a positive experience. However, almost from the moment that this character steps on screen and begins speaking, the tone of the show shifts in a way that's initially hard to define. Hi! Hi everyone! I'm on iCarly! Hey! Hi! <laughs> I'm not really sure how else to describe this, but from where I'm sitting, Mandy is coded to be neurodivergent, and the entire comedy of this episode derives from the fact that neurodivergent people are annoying to be around and cause problems for non-neurodivergent people. What is this, the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> Of a duck. Here he comes again! This is easily one of the most painful episodes of television that I have ever had to sit through. I find it so hard to imagine someone pitching this episode to a writer's room. To have someone stand up and go, Hey, you know who sucks? Autistic children! As everyone else around them starts going, Woo! Someone had to say it! I think this episode really breaks down the inherent paradoxical nature of iCarly. 
You see, iCarly really exists as a total embrace of the sort of lol random humor which had developed on the early internet. Let's have a random hat party or send text messages with our toes, haha, <laughs> banana phone. But at the same time, the show also goes out of its way to mock and belittle anything which is divergent from a certain kind of randomness. So it's cool to be different, but not cool to be different. One thing that stands out to me about season one is that there's this running joke where the cast keeps running into a kid who likes beatboxing, and they hate him. Like a lot. No one enjoys that! This has always stood out to me as kind of weird, because I knew several kids throughout my entire school career who were the beatboxing kid. And even if they weren't good at it, everyone loved them because that was just a cool thing to be able to do when you were a kid in the early aughts. And second off, why is that the thing that the characters in this show hate? Like, being the girl who talks about how she loves jerky, that's cool. Being the kid who takes his shirt off in public, that's cool. Being the kid who likes beatboxing, we would kill you if we could. This is going to be something that continues to be an ongoing problem throughout all the different seasons and spin-offs of iCarly, so I don't want to get too intensively into it right here. But, on that note, we are now officially, basically, at the end of our Season 1 analysis, and we are ready to move on to Season 2. However, I wanted to find some creative way to mark a, a retrospective bookend to every season that we stop to look at, and I came up with a really fun idea that I think you guys are going to end up liking. And the idea that I came up with is that we're going to end every season off with a total tally of the list of crimes committed by the main characters in that particular season. If there's a season one episode you remember that I haven't brought up yet, it's probably because I saved it for this bit, so strap in! Real quick, before we do jump into this, I want to send a big thanks out to Scott Augustine, who I met on Twitter when I asked around for experts on Washington law. He basically gave me his input um, based on his knowledge on which of these things are crimes and on what level of severity they exist, if they're like felonies or misdemeanors and so on and so forth. He was a huge help in this section, and I just wanted to make sure that I send out a big thanks to him and anyone else who just gave me a little bit of input on this script, because I, I'm not an expert and everything I don't pretend to be, and people like Scott were a huge part of why I'm able to make this video. Starting us off more generally, we have crime number one. Sam consistently and maliciously assaulting Freddy when she really doesn't need to. <laughs> We may or may not have to mention this every single season. Moving on to crime number two. In season one, episode two, we see the cast fret over their weekly views stagnating, causing them to worry that they'll fail to grow if they don't fix the situation. This leads Carly to suggest a competition. The four will split into two groups and whoever can find the best way to get viewers to iCarly.com will win. And the loser will have to touch Lubert's wart. After a series of false starts, Freddy and Spencer come up with an idea to get a huge digital sign and hang it on the highway without permission. This is already extremely illegal. But what I never noticed until this watch through is that they hang the sign over an already existing road sign, which is like triple illegal. Imagine missing your exit to the airport because some guy really wanted to advertise his 13 year old sister's web show. They turn the sign on to initial success, but it's so blindingly bright and distracting that it immediately causes a six car pileup in the streets below. Spencer tries to turn the sign off, but overloads it, accidentally revealing a completely different message. P on Carl. Spencer is arrested and left off with a warning, but is told that the next time he causes one of the worst traffic jams in Seattle history, he will be arrested. Spencer apologizes to... Officer... Carl? 
and he is left off the hook. Now the thing is, Spencer's broadcast actually cuts out kind of early, so we're not shown how many car accidents this road sign ends up actually causing. Now the question is, how bad did things really get in the end? Well, in a web-exclusive blog posted later, Spencer claims that he had caused, quote, like 50 car crashes, likely making this one of the worst pileups in the history of Seattle. I'm pretty sure Spencer broke like 15 laws in this one scene, but uh, we'll just count this as a single crime for simplicity's sake. Let's move on to crime number three, which takes place during episode seven, I Scream on Halloween. On the night of Halloween, Carly and Spencer accidentally receive a letter meant for apartment 13B, and Carly tries to make sure it's ultimately delivered there. However, Lubert tells them that no one has lived in that apartment for 15 years because it's haunted. When Carly and Sam hear that there is an abandoned haunted apartment in their complex, they decide this has to be where they film the Halloween episode of iCarly much to the chagrin of Freddy. And so, Sam uses her lockpicking skills to break into the apartment, which is obviously breaking and entering. Later, we find out that people do live in apartment 13B, and that Lubert was just being a dick. The very next episode, I Spy a Mean Teacher, brings us to crime number four, wherein Freddy and Carly spy on their teacher and attempt to record details of her personal life for the purpose of showing it all on iCarly. Through a strange series of events, they end up entering her home without permission, wherein they have to hide in the closet to get away from her before they get caught and are nearly arrested. You'll notice the common theme in these two crimes, where the cast believes that uploading footage of themselves doing something illegal cannot lead to them getting caught? Like, there's this weird logic that if their teacher catch them in her home, they'll be arrested, but if they upload footage of themselves inside of her home, no one will ever find out, despite it being viewed by a million people? Season 1, Episode 11 is a sequel to I, Neville, and features the character getting back at them for the first, but certainly not the last time. In the story, Neville hacks into Freddy's network and manages to take control of everything on the iCarly set and the iCarly website. Freddy's poor security leaves his data and technology at risk, something that could have been avoided if he had just had some means of cloaking his location and IP address. God, I wish this video was sponsored. Freddy believes that they can crash Neville's computers if they gain access to his network, and thus all three of them break into his house while he's away and attempt to do this. Yet another example of breaking and entering. But their hack fails, and Neville continues to have control over iCarly.com, as he streams content from his home directly to their audience. But then Carly says, wait a minute guys, we haven't been thinking this through. We have Neville's address, we can just swat him! With a boring here! With crimes 5 and 6 out of the way, let's move on to crime number 7. In Season 1, Episode 12, Sam is in the principal's office when she overhears him share his private login information. After he leaves the room, she quietly uses this information to access the school's private network, and changes the grades of her, Carly, and Freddy, obviously without permission from any of them. When Carly and Freddy find out, they attempt to hack the school system to change their grades back, but they are nearly arrested in the act and have to lie to get out of things. Sam later publishes the passcode she used on the official iCarly website, meaning that any student at the school who saw this blog could potentially change their own grades as well. In real life, a crime like this committed in 2018 led to a student being charged with 14 felonies. When Sam gets caught, she's given detention for a few weeks. Speaking of which, episode 19, I Got Detention, is our next notable crime. As you'll recall, this is the episode where Sam gets detention on the night of the show's 50th webcast. This leads to Carly and Freddy trying to get detention themselves on the exact same night. And the main plan Carly comes up with is to pull a fire alarm as a prank when there really isn't a fire at all. Now, as I'm sure you were all told when you were young, pulling a fire alarm when there is no fire will not get you detention. It will get you expelled and potentially arrested. 
According to Washington Municipal Code, Chapter 9, Section 40, any person who makes a declaration of fire when there is none is guilty of a misdemeanor. This is partially voided out by the fact that directly after this, we see that there was indeed a fire at the school. But let's just count that one anyways. Eh, it's fun. In episode 20, a police officer stops by the Shea household and identifies himself at the door. Sam, upon seeing this, states, Freddy, take my backpack. Now, we're never told what this means, but it's shady as hell, so I'm counting it. At the beginning of episode 21, I might switch schools. Sam enters the Shea apartment and says that she picked up their mail for them. When Spencer says that you need a key to get into their mailbox, Sam replies, No you don't. Which implies that Sam broke into their mailbox and stole their mail. Now, I'm told that for such a small amount of mail only done once, this is likely only a misdemeanor. But, if Sam does this casually to numerous people, it could easily become a felony. Either way, it's crime number 10. Throughout this episode, we find out that Carly has been offered a scholarship to an expensive private school, and that she is seriously considering going. However, Sam and Freddy, worrying that this will end their friendship, plot to ruin her interview. First, by secretly moving its location to the Shea apartment, where a miniature golf course has been set up for a multitude of reasons. And then, by instructing a horde of ball-obsessed children to assault the woman interviewing Carly. At the end of the episode, the children chase the woman into Spencer's shower and then out of the front door. The implication of this off-screen moment is that for a brief second, Spencer was entirely naked and surrounded by children and a woman whose clothes were being ripped off. I have no idea what crime happened here, but it was something very bad and very wrong. Later on the iCarly website, Carly publishes the official rejection letter that she receives from this same woman. Dear Carly, I regret to inform you that we cannot accept you at Briarwood Preparatory School at this time. You are a smart, wonderful, and creative young woman. However, the interview we had at your home was quite a disaster. I also did not appreciate being attacked by that group of teenagers while I was sitting upon your beanbag. I'm still having nightmares about that. My doctor has advised me to seek professional therapy. As I said, Carly, I find you a delightful girl, but your life scares me. Now, the official finale for season one is episode 25, I Have a Lovesick Teacher where Carly's teacher attempts to ruin her life after Spencer breaks up with her. The way that the character is caught in the end is that they trick her into admitting that she pirates her music on live video, leading to the FBI coming to her class and arresting her. You set me up! That's a lie! No, we set her up. Oh, yeah. I feel like this is accidentally a really good metaphor for what it's like uploading content onto the internet. I mean, you can do so much messed up stuff, and you can publicly tell people that you've broken the law and intend to keep doing it, and nothing will happen. But if you play a copyrighted song in your video without explicit permission, they will delete your channel. That's just life, I guess. Okay, it's me, Cam Quarter Quentin again. Hey guys! So as I'm recording this, it is March 2021, and I'm recording another mini-segment because I have just finished Season 1 of iCarly. I've watched every episode, I've written out my complete analysis of those episodes, and I'm now preparing to move on to Season 2. And I just kind of figured it'd be fun to sit down and do a little update of sorts. Part of the appeal that I pitched at the start of this was that this whole thing was supposed to be kind of like a science experiment. I had a hypothesis, I had a theory, I wanted to see what this was going to do to me personally, emotionally, and physically. And I can honestly say that this project has done some weird stuff to my brain, and not necessarily in a good way. Recently, I've been having dreams almost exclusively as Carly Shea. You see, usually I have, like, anxiety nightmares, you know, things that keep me up at night, haunt me in my sleep, and all of that is still happening. Except instead of dreaming as myself, 
I'm dreaming as Carly, and all of my deepest fears and anxieties are being recontextualized as things that could happen in a sitcom world to her. One weird nightmare I had a few weeks ago was that I was in an episode of iCarly, and it was like your typical sitcom shenanigans. People were running around, Spencer was doing jokes, there was a laugh track, and then someone died. I can't remember who, I think it was Gibby, but like someone just died in the middle of this iCarly dream, and immediately it just stopped being a sitcom. Like, the studio set morphed into a real room, there was no laugh tracks. It was all very serious. Spencer was a completely different person. He, like, suddenly wanted revenge. And I was left with this sinking feeling that, like, I was next. I was going to be the next person to die. And I just desperately wanted to get back to that sitcom world. I think a far more relevant dream I had more recently was actually about the iCarly revival, which is going to be on Paramount Plus if it doesn't go the way of Lizzie McGuire. In my dream, someone at Paramount Plus invited me to come and see the iCarly revival before anyone else. And they sat me down in a room and they showed me the pilot episode of iCarly Season 7. And I hated it. The only way I could describe what I saw in the dream is it's like if someone was planning to bring back a sitcom for the network and they wrote the script before they knew what sitcom they were bringing back. I think that, like, Carly had a kid, and Freddy was, like, a cool uncle, full house style, and I remember being angry, because I had spent months of my life dedicating myself to iCarly, only to be shown a revival made by people who did not care. And thank God that can never happen in the real world. Okay, before we go any further into this, I want to go on, like, a quick tangent rant about something that probably is only going to be interesting to me and no one else, but it's something that really bothers me, so please stick with me. So when I first started working on this, my first thought was obviously, well, I need to go out and get copies of every episode of iCarly. And I figured torrent links were probably going to be very low quality, so I thought, where's the best way to go about getting these episodes, and I presumed the best source would be the official releases, the DVDs. So I went out and tried to get copies of every DVD release of iCarly, but they tend to go for pretty high prices on eBay, so I figured the next best option was to go for Netflix DVD. Those of you who've been watching the past year probably know that I really like Netflix DVD because it's an obscure service. People don't even really know it's still a thing, but you can find some cool obscure stuff on there for pretty cheap. And so I really like renting things from there and then sort of talking about the strange stuff you can find. So what I'd basically do for a while is get a DVD from Netflix, I'd uh, rip it onto my laptop, and then I'd rush as fast as I could to get it back in the mail so I could get the next DVD. And I worked really hard to make sure that I could get as many of these as I could so I'd stay on track to watching every single episode of iCarly. And then they put it on fucking Netflix. So yeah, now iCarly's on Netflix, and I can go on there pretty much almost for free and watch absolutely any episode I want from the first three seasons. So who won during this situation? Netflix, apparently, because they got money from me in two distinctly different ways! So what I ended up doing just to feel like I hadn't wasted a lot of time was I would take my laptop and I'd play the DVD copy on there, and then I'd put the Netflix copy on my TV, and I'd try and see if there were any deleted scenes, how it synced up and all that kind of thing. And the first thing I noticed is that the copy on Netflix seems to run just a little bit fast for some reason. It's pretty typical with old sitcoms for them to speed it up by like 1% so they can fit more advertisements in, but it's kind of strange that they would do this to a show on Netflix because obviously there are no advertisements, or at least there's not supposed to be. However, the much more pressing issue that really put a wrench in my plans was a little bit more obvious, and I want to see if you guys can guess what that was. Here's the copy from my DVD, and here's the copy from Netflix. DVD, Netflix. DVD, Netflix. Are you starting to catch on? 
So yeah, I discovered pretty early into working on this that despite airing in 4x3, iCarly was produced and edited in 16x9. Now, to many of you younger people at home, this probably isn't a surprise. This is probably how you watch these episodes. But for me, it was a huge shock because I watched the pilot episode in 2007. I saw it air for the first time. I was a huge Miranda Cosgrove fan. I wanted to see this new show. And I had no idea it existed in widescreen because I had only experienced these episodes in... Twink screen? It used to be called standard definition, but that's not what it's called now. And as soon as I figured this out, I was just like so excited to get back into the show because I felt like there was this new horizon of iCarly material, these slivers at the edge of the screen that I had missed out on in the past decade because I had not been shown the full production of every single episode. However, as soon as I started to watch the show this way, I realized that watching iCarly in 16x9 kind of ruins it? There's a lot of little things that affect this, like, for instance, the transitions are in 4x3, which is distracting. Freddy's camera indents are in 4x3. Generally, it was made to be a 4x3 show. But the most notable thing to me is just that the cinematography does not make sense in the expanded edits. If you ever take any rudimentary film class in college or high school, probably the first thing they're going to teach you is the rule of thirds. Now, I don't want to mansplain or anything, but in case you didn't know, the rule of thirds basically states that when you're setting up a shot, you should imagine that there are two intersecting lines going both vertically and horizontally, cutting your shot into thirds both ways. The idea is that wherever these lines intersect should be where you place the focus of your shot. Now, this isn't a universal rule, you don't have to follow this every time, but it's just kind of like a basic setup for what you should do when you're setting up a shot. So if you sit down to watch iCarly on Netflix, you'll notice that they seem to not be following this rule at all. Characters are usually like in the middle of shot, or slightly off kilter to where they naturally should be, or sometimes they're just cut off at the edge of frame for no justifiable reason. Now, if you watch the show in 4x3, it looks great. Everything looks as it should be, important stuff lines up with the rule of thirds, but when you stretch those borders out, it just gives you additional information that you don't need? But you know, this show actually ran for a while, so I'm kind of curious if we're going to get to a point where the cropped version on the DVD looks kind of awkward, but the 16x9 version looks really good. But I suppose the only way to figure out if we're ever going to get there is to keep watching the show, which I haven't been doing for some reason. So with that, let's begin iCarly Season 2. So typically when I approach analyzing individual iCarly seasons, I try to avoid a strict chronological order. I think that finding precise themes to cluster these in and subtle story arcs is a lot more interesting than just going through them episode by episode. And I would hope that this far into the video that you guys would happen to agree. However, season two, episode one, is so amazingly strange and bizarre that I feel like we have to start there because in a way it completely sets the tone for the rest of this project. In the episode, Carly and Sam both fall head over heels with one of Freddy's friends, a dorky yet cute tech student who has just transferred to their school and both quickly realize that their mutual obsession is going to cause conflict and potentially destroy their friendship. My favorite thing about this episode is that Freddy has gone through these things so often that his only hot take about this latest piece of drama is that he's tired of it getting in the way of them running their web show. So I guess neither of you can go out with Shane. Oh, too bad. Bye. <laughs> Eventually, Carly and Sam come up with a compromise that can't possibly fail. They'll both date Shane at the same time and simply allow him to go steady with whomever he likes the most. This truce obviously doesn't last very long, as their petty squabbling makes even Shane uncomfortable, and they eventually make a new pact. Whoever Shane decides to kiss first gets to date him. Now, I'm not sure if you guys have caught on to this little fact or not, but iCarly is a show that has 
a lot of weird stuff in it. And I've been kind of saving most of the weird stuff and sort of putting it to the side because, you know, we're gonna have to talk about most of that stuff on its own, you know what I mean? But this specific episode has so much weird stuff that I feel like it would be kind of deceptive to hide it from all of you, to kind of completely lie about the contents of this episode as I'm reviewing it to your face. Okay, for instance, in this bit of the episode, Sam sets up a fake kissing booth and claims that the money is going to go to charity, a charity which she makes up, all in a ploy to trick Shane into kissing her. I imagine somewhere in that sentence I just said a crime was committed, but I'll decide later when I'm writing the end of the season analysis. Anyways, the point is, Shane suddenly has to get to class, he doesn't kiss Sam, and another classmate then approaches, and this exchange happens. I don't think I have a dollar. What can I get with 50 cents? I'll spit on you. Deal. Get out of here! And it's like... Okay. Look, it's just really important that you guys understand that this show is weird and it's kind of hard to watch it sometimes. And if at any point I have procrastinated on finishing this project, it's only because it makes me feel bad on the inside. So in the end, Sam and Carly's bickering becomes more and more dangerous and more and more destructive. And Shane eventually decides that he's had enough and breaks up with both of them. After doing so, he opens the elevator door to leave, and then... <laughs> so yeah, remember earlier in the video when I casually mentioned that in one of the episodes, the elevator breaks and falls down to the basement and crashes? Uh, that's this episode? So because the elevator is broken in the B-plot, Shane falls nine stories down an elevator shaft and dies. Okay, so he doesn't really die. But he ends up pretty broken, and it's basically implied that he's in a coma. Like, the Shea household put him into a coma. And the resolution to this is that they all go out to get ice cream or something, and then Carly runs back into the room and sexually assaults him. I win. Haha, <laughs> 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 ha, that's funny. Please don't make me watch any more of this show. Okay, so I have sort of an overreaching thesis statement about iCarly and some of its sister shows that I've been kind of avoiding saying out loud because the evidence builds up for it really, really slowly. iCarly reads to me like someone watched It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia and didn't get the point. I feel like there's been actually a good number of Always Sunny episodes that have ended with the exact same scene that I just described. Like, oh, someone we had an encounter with is in the hospital because of us. We're ambivalent to this! Like, in my opinion, the cast of iCarly just constantly give off the same vibe and some of the same characteristics as someone you would see in something like Seinfeld or Always Sunny. But the only difference is that it doesn't seem to have the same level of self-awareness. Like, the writers didn't write these stories with the purpose being that the characters are supposed to be bad people. And you know what, I just want to say, in case I'm wrong, in case they did do all that on purpose, in case that is the thesis statement of the show, well then iCarly is a masterclass piece of preemptive satire of the phenomenon of internet stardom. But I think we all kind of privately know that that's definitely not the case. And so you constantly come across these weird, unnecessarily mean elements thrown into the iCarly program at face value for absolutely no reason. And perhaps a good example of this can be found in Season 2, Episode 10, I Rocked the Vote. For a little bit of context, around the time that iCarly was being made, American Idol was one of the biggest things on television, and apparently the writers were big fans. One example of this can be seen in the Season 1 episode where Carly and Freddie break into Miss Briggs' house and hide in her closet, where they discover a shrine to American Idol judge Randy Jackson. 
However, by season two, the writers went from adoring the show to being very angry at it. And so season two features a storyline with America Sings, an obvious parody of American Idol which swiftly replaces it within the universe. Now in the 2008 run of American Idol, which was airing when iCarly season two was being produced, the two finalists came down to David Cook and David Archuleta both of whom developed extremely passionate fan bases. During the time that David was on the show, his brother had been battling brain cancer for 10 years, and this was something that was obviously brought up on the program, as most details of the competitors' lives were broken open and examined. And eventually, despite David Archuleta being a very popular contender, David Cook won the competition, and the iCarly writers were pissed. So much so that they wrote this weird episode which existed only to fantasize about an alternate reality where the results turned out different. Where David Cook was exposed to be a jerk who had faked his family member's illness and the correct person won the competition. So in the story, Carly and Sam start a conversation on their web show about America Sings and how they're hoping that the competitor they dislike Wade Collins is beat by the competitor that they love, David Ar Archuleta, what? Yes, David Archuleta actually appears as himself in this one. But before you attack him, he appeared in like every show at this point. I'm pretty sure his agent was just signing him onto things without reading the scripts. So Sam and Carly are both big Archuleta stands and encourage their fans to go and vote for him in the America Sings competition. And lo and behold, Archuleta wins in the end. And it's widely reported that I, Carly, is the reason that this happened as they swayed the vote at the very last minute. In other words, in a universe where iCarly didn't exist, David Archuleta would have lost. Feeling bad, they invite Wade Collins onto their show and offer to make a music video for him since they sort of ruined his career. But as soon as the live stream is off, Colin reveals himself to be an absolute jerk, calling them all hobnockers and declaring that he hates puppies, children, and America itself. But the iCarly cast strive forward, especially after learning that Wade's mother is dying and that he was going to use the America Sings money to help pay for her medical bills. But eventually it turns out that this is all a sham he made up to win the competition. His mother isn't really dying, and upon hearing this, the iCarly cast decide to reveal behind the scenes footage of him being a jerk, and even have Archuleta come on himself to confirm this. This episode aired on February the 7th, 2009. Three weeks and four days after this, David Cook's actual brother died from brain cancer. Cook would then dedicate a lot of time in the next several years trying to raise awareness and funds for cancer research. And I don't want to be the arbiter of what's okay and what's not okay in the vast land of satire, but doesn't this episode just feel icky? Like weirdly targeted and cruel, especially considering the butt of the joke was a guy who died from cancer three weeks later. And hell, if we're going to talk about strangely mean episodes, I suppose a good place to continue from here is the event episode that was almost the start to season two. I go to Japan. Now here's a fun fact about iCarly that you guys might not have actually realized. It is a complete and utter mystery who actually created this show. Like most Nickelodeon sitcoms of the time, when I try and Google who created them, I feel a sharp pain in my forehead, a loud whistling noise, and then I black out for four days. So we really have no way of actually answering this mystery. But if I were to try and guess or presume anything about the theoretical man or woman who created iCarly, firstly I would say, that they were really obsessed with Asian people. And secondly, I would say that they really hated Asian people. Also, homeless people. Whoever made this show hated homeless people with a passion. In season one, sometimes there will be like seven bum jokes for two episodes to the show. And you can almost guess with total confidence that if someone walks into shot and they're homeless or Asian, that there's gonna be a punchline. Take, for instance, the episode where Sam hires a personal cook. 
Sonia, please make me a grilled cheese sandwich with tomato. Yes, me Sam. Yes, me Sam. I will make pie. Blueberry muffins? Yeah. Blueberry? For the first episode they filmed for season two, they decided to create, essentially, a TV movie starring the characters. In the movie, iCarly is chosen as one of the top three comedy shows on the entire internet, and they are invited to an awards show in Japan, where they will be competing live in the comedy subcategory. Freddy's mother initially protests this, saying that traveling overseas isn't safe, but when they invite her to join, she quickly changes her mind, before vaccinating Freddy against every possible disease because that was a funny, wacky thing to do in 2009. So they get on their plane, but it turns out that what Spencer managed to book is actually a cargo plane, piloted by a very shady man, with no bathroom and instead two buckets for the entire 11 hour trip. When they arrive over Japan, it's then revealed that the plane also isn't going to be stopping, and they are all given parachutes and pushed from the plane, alongside their luggage, much of which is damaged. Now here's a fun fact, I actually don't know anything about Japanese culture. Like a lot of you guys, I watched a lot of anime when I was younger, but outside of some YouTube travel blogs, the culture itself, I really know absolutely nothing about it. So I actually sent out another call on Twitter looking for people who might be able to give some insight into this section. And I managed to get in contact with a guy named Noah Oskow, who is a Japanese translator and knows a lot about the language and the culture. Now, Noah is actually from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Minnesota, but his fiance Yui actually is from Japan, so he asked for her input on everything that happens in this episode, and arguably that's a little bit more important than anything else. Anyways, through Noah and Yui, I found out a lot of interesting stuff about this episode, some mistakes they made, and some easter eggs that they hid that, as far as I know, I've never heard another person talk about. iCarly's main competition for the story is a web show native to Japan, made by siblings Kyoko and Yuki. In the story, the two take the iCarly cast on a tour of Tokyo, pretend to get lost, and then ditch them in the middle of nowhere so they'll be disqualified from the award show. Because you have to perform a live skit at this internet award show for some reason. Now, during several scenes, Yuki and Kyoko speak Japanese to each other. So my biggest curiosity was, basically, are they speaking real Japanese, and what are they saying? The answer to the first question was yes and no. Kind of, but not really. Basically, what I was told is that A, it's painfully obvious to anyone who speaks Japanese that the dialogue they speak in this episode was probably created by running English through 2008-era Google Translate, and that B, it's also pretty obvious that neither of the actors in these scenes actually speak Japanese casually outside of this episode. And this actually tracks with the background of these two performers. Harry Shum Jr., who plays Yuki, was actually born in Costa Rica by two Chinese immigrants, before moving to San Francisco at a very young age. He knows Chinese, Spanish, and English, but not Japanese. Ali Makey, meanwhile, is actually a fourth-generation Japanese-American, but she was born in Washington and raised in Seattle before she was found by a talent agent. I was told that her Japanese sounds a little bit more natural, but that it was still clearly someone reading from a Google Translate script, so it didn't really help much. And I just want to say, isn't it a little bit funny that the only main cast member in this episode who's actually from Seattle, had to pretend they were from Japan to be on iCarly. Anyways, on the topic of broken Japanese, there's two really notable things that happen in the scenes where the characters get lost, during which time Yuki and Kyoko begin arguing in their character's native language. At one point in this scene, Kyoko turns to Yuki and calls him a word that I gather you are not supposed to say in Japan. Basically, it's the Japanese version of the R slur, but it's significantly more taboo. It literally translates to the word stupid, although no, it's not baka, even though baka also translates to the word stupid. It's considered extremely derogatory against people who have mental illnesses, and it's actually banned on television and in print media within the country. Noah mentioned that when his fiance heard them say this in the episode, she was shocked because she just wasn't used to hearing it outside of really private contexts. 
Our best guess right now is that they probably just wrote the phrase into Google Translate and didn't realize what they were doing, but also it's entirely possible, knowing the creators of this show, that they just wanted to say a curse word on TV. Nevertheless, it's weird to think that the original dub of I Go to Japan could not air in Japan without being censored. The interesting parts don't stop there, by the way. Right after this, Kyoko exclaims to her brother, you don't die, which we presume is like broken Japanese for why don't you die? And then Yuki exclaims, you are not my sister, you were adopted. Which is like a big twist within the story itself that I've never heard another iCarly fan bring up as a fact about these two characters. Like, I know it's a fake conversation they make up to fool Carly, Sam, and Freddy, but it's weird to throw a piece of dialogue like that into the episode when it's supposed to be something that no one can ever understand. There's a running joke in the episode, incidentally, where Spencer is supposed to kind of half know Japanese, and he keeps going up to people in Japan and saying things that are stupid. And it's very clear that they instructed him to say real Japanese phrases, but he still messes those up. For instance, there's a joke where he goes up to a security guard and he says something in Japanese, and it's very clear, apparently, that he's supposed to be saying, Your mom is fat. But instead, he says a bunch of gibberish that sounds like it probably was supposed to be, Your mom is fat. The next time he approaches the guards, he exclaims, Inside your pants, I'm angry. Which ain't that just a mood. On top of all of that information, which I found super interesting, I also asked him for his input on what aspects of the episode are stereotypical or inaccurate. And he basically said, all of it. The hotel is a mash of the vague American perception of every Asian culture. The idea that all Japanese people are buffoons or sadistic tricksters is a relic of post-World War II depictions of the culture. Even things like the music and the font stylings are based on the American ideal of what Japan is, and not anything from reality. One thing he noted was particularly ridiculous is there's a scene where they're in the hotel and they use this tracker thing that Freddy's mom has, and they say, Hey! They're 13 miles northeast of this hotel! And then when we see that area, it's like this big stretch of rural nothingness. And like, Tokyo is the biggest city in the world. 13 miles from your hotel is still Tokyo. I've been told. I, I don't know anything about Japan, really. In the notes he gave about the episode, Noah continuously compares this episode to the Simpsons and King of the Hill episodes, where those characters go to Japan as well. Noting that while those episodes have inaccuracies and stereotypes which have aged poorly, they were still based in some fascination with Japanese culture that sort of bleeds through the content. An interest in the media, or the visuals of the cities, or even just the tragedy of the nation. And what I Go to Japan really is missing, even from an outsider perspective, is the sense that the people who made the episode felt anything about Japan except a general disdain for Asian people. Anyways, to finish my recap here, Kyoko and Yuki abandon the Akarli gang on the outskirts of the city, and prepare to win the competition by default. At this same time, they have sent Spencer and Freddy's mom to be given seaweed wraps by their cousins, who are in on the plot and leave the two trapped in the seaweed. But they eventually break out, and using the tracking device inside of Freddy's head, they find the group, manage to break into the competition building, and somehow win the award show in the end, while Kyoko and Yuki are arrested for kidnapping. Incidentally, can we stop for a moment to acknowledge how little Kyoko and Yuki's plan actually makes sense? Think about it for a second, okay? Their plan was they were going to sidetrack the iCarly gang for just long enough that they would miss the competition and be disqualified. But what's their game plan for after the competition? Won't they be arrested for kidnapping anyways? Because they were never going to kill the iCarly gang, right? They were just going to inconvenience them for a few hours, but they still kidnapped them, basically. So when the award show is over, the iCarly gang can still go to the police and have them be arrested. Like, I don't understand wh what's going on here. Either they were staking so much that they wanted this award that they were willing to get arrested for it, or this is like some Oh Brother Where Art Thou situation, where they thought their performance was going to be so good that they'd be pardoned on the spot. Look, we have just talked about a long string of episodes, which um, aren't very great, and it might be leaving you with a bit of an icky taste in your mouth that's making you wonder, why are we doing this? And so I think, as a bit of a detox, 
it's about time for a little bit of Spencer. Season 2 is packed full of a lot of great episodes which explore the relationship between Carly and Spencer. And that really makes sense, because as I've said, Spencer is pretty much the best character in the show. I actually think this run of episodes handles Spencer a bit better than Season 1. For those of you who weren't into Nickelodeon at the time, Jerry Trainer also played a character on Drake and Josh called Crazy Steve. And season one Spencer has a lot of Crazy Steve left in him. As if the writers just didn't know how to approach him quite yet. Watch me spank your daddy! <laughs> Close your eyes, don't look! Now! <laughs> This has actually led to a prevailing fan theory that Spencer is Crazy Steve. That he kidnapped Megan, brainwashed her into thinking that she was a Seattle teen with a father away at sea, and then completely took over her life. This is one of those fan theories that only makes sense if you've watched the pilot episode and nothing else. The actual text and canon of the show is a little too complex for this actually to be true. Furthermore, and I know I'm deconstructing a theory that's entirely a joke, but I can't imagine Megan Parker ever being brainwashed into becoming Carly Shay. Megan was like this weird, maniacal super genius, she had this weird Stewie Griffin bedroom and all these secret gadgets and apparently like an endless supply of money that she just pulled from all the time. If the world of iCarly really is some complex Westworld simulation, I think that Megan is the one pulling the strings. Megan is the one who has brainwashed everyone else because that is something that Crazy Steve really couldn't do on his own. But anyways, hopping back to the actual text of the show, I really did appreciate how grounded they made Spencer while also having him struggle with mental health issues which seemed to be embedded into his personality. Mainly a lack of attention span and a tendency to get addicted to things a little bit too much. Be they his magic meatball or just an art project that never ends up panning out. We see just a brief glimpse of this in Season 2, Episode 2, I Stage an Intervention. In the episode, Spencer is exploring an old junkyard when he finds an arcade cabinet for the game Pac Rat, a parody of Pac Man. After repairing it, Spencer begins playing the game all day and then all night. Soon, he's avoiding his daily responsibilities, and this eventually leads to him missing the deadline on an important sculpture which he was commissioned to do. Despite clearly having a problem, Spencer continues playing the game, and it's obvious that he needs help. So the main trio use the power of their webcast to track down the current world record holder for the highest pack rat score of all time, who turns out to be a beautiful woman who challenges Spencer to a game. Spencer plays for hours on end and is eventually able to beat her high score, giving him satisfaction at beating the hobby and allowing him to finally turn the sculpture around, but not before he casually makes out with his once fierce competitor. Call me. We'll see. God damn, Spencer Fox. Spencer's relationship to Carly as a parental figure is touched upon in two key episodes, I Christmas and I Look Alike. In I Christmas, Spencer is setting up the Shea household for the winter season, and much to Carly's dismay, ends up building a Christmas tree out of metal that he found at the scrapyard. In the middle of the night, the tree catches on fire, destroying the gifts Carly has made and saved up for. Storming upstairs, she exclaims that she wishes he was born normal, and tries to sulk in the iCarly studio. There she meets Mitch, who Carly initially thinks to be an intruder, until he explains that he's actually her guardian. Guardian Angel. To prove that he isn't lying, Mitch grants Carly her spontaneous wish, changing her life so that Spencer was always born normal. Going downstairs, she discovers that the apartment has totally changed. Spencer is now a lawyer, having finished attending school instead of becoming an artist, and he is dating Freddy's mother. In this new world, Carly discovers that Freddy has no interest in her, potentially because they're basically step-siblings. And worse than that, she is officially dating Neville, who attends Ridgeway with her. Worst of all, Carly discovers that Sam, growing up in a world where Spencer didn't allow them to be friends, is now in a juvenile detention center, as Carly was never able to help keep her out of trouble. 
Carly has a full-out breakdown, saying that she wants her normal life back. And through the magic of Christmas parodies, her gift is granted and everything is back to normal. Carly announces that she loves her life, she loves her Christmas tree, and she loves Spencer being the fun, weird, cool guy that he's always been. Walking away for a brief moment, she sees a vision of Mitch, who reveals that because of her, he has been able to get his wings. Chicken wings! Get it? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start a list of all the weird stuff in the iCarly universe that just exists, like unambiguously. We're starting off with Christmas Angels, it's gonna get weirder from here. As I mentioned, I Look Alike is another important story in showcasing Spencer and Carly's relationship. In the story, the trio have held a contest to find lookalikes in the Seattle area. And by lookalikes, I mean people who are willing to wear the same clothes that they are. Later, the three kids are all invited to an MMA match where they'll be able to interview MMA fighter Jackson Colt. However, Mrs. Benson does not approve of Freddy being in that environment. And when Carly asks Spencer to speak with her, Spencer says that he actually agrees, saying that a bloody fighting ring is not a proper place for a group of kids. He's gonna change his mind in a few episodes. And so the three ask their stunt doubles to hide in their studio so they can go live stream the event. Almost immediately, they catch on that Spencer might have been right, as they see a man looking to get his ear reattached. But they meet Jackson and his son, who both say that they are big fans of the iCarly web show. However, Spencer catches on to what's happening and goes to confront Carly. He tries to shut down the web show, but when Jackson Colt sees him being disrespectful to Carly, he throws Spencer across the room into a table. There's this weird thing that happens sometimes in the early few seasons where someone will go, Oh my god, you're Carly! I watch iCarly every week! And then Spencer shows up and they go, Who the hell are you? And it's like, what do you mean? He's Spencer, Carly's brother, who's on the web show all the time. He's on the banner of the fucking website in the pilot episode. Anyways, back at home, Spencer wakes up and insists that Carly is grounded but clearly is not fully recovered from being thrown into a table by a professional fighter. Then the episode ends, that's it. To end off this bit, I should probably talk about Season 2, Episode 6, I Pie. In the story, the iCarly gang takes Freddy to their favorite pie shop in Seattle, saying that the coconut cream pies made by the store's elderly owner are the best in the world. However, they soon learn that the owner is very sick, and after he suddenly dies, the shop plans on closing because they don't know the secret recipe. Spencer learns that Trudy, the granddaughter of the owner, supposedly has the recipe but isn't sharing it with anyone, and he ends up going on a date with her to try and get that information. Trudy becomes physical with Spencer against his wishes, which is played as a joke because assault when it happens to men is a punchline. Trudy admits that she never had the recipe and just wanted attention, but the cast are able to learn that the late owner kept the recipe in his computer. During the owner's wake, Freddy and Sam try to sneak into the back to look for it, while Spencer and Carly try to stall for time by hijacking the memorial service. Sam accidentally knocks the computer over, breaking it open but revealing that that is indeed where the recipes were kept. Inside of the computer. An interesting fact is that the iCarly.com website actually posted the recipe that the gang supposedly found inside of that computer. I probably am going to do a video at some point about iCarly Foods kind of, you know, trying out a few recipes, but it's almost certainly not going to be on the main channel. So if you want to see a video like that in the future, head over to my second channel, Quentin Retoos, and hit subscribe there. Now here's an interesting point. I realized while writing this season's worth of analysis that I have never properly gone in and analyzed the content of iCarly. Uh, iCarly the web show within iCarly the sitcom. I know that I've talked about things that happen because they have a web show, and I've talked about the production of the web show, be it drama or the technical aspect, but I haven't stopped at any point to just tell you what the web show is like and what your experience would be if it was a real thing that you could sit down and watch. And I think the reason for that is that it's really, really embarrassing sometimes. Holy, we're in outer space! But it's dangerous to be in outer space wearing only swimsuits! <laughs>
It's very obvious to me that because this show was created by older people when YouTube was a new thing, that they didn't really understand what made internet content work and what made streaming content worth it, so a lot of early jokes within the iCarly web show will literally be like the characters running around in a circle making random noises, as if the writers are like, ha ha, that's what the internet is like. There are a few skits from season 1 and 2 worth mentioning because there's a chance people will remember them. The first is a skit where Sam is playing a cowboy and Carly thinks her mustache is actually a squirrel. Then there's Kelly Cooper, Terrible Movie, a joke trailer for a teen comedy which, by coincidence, has the exact same plot as Fred the Movie. And finally, there's George the Bra, a skit where a floating, haunted bra tells ghost stories to the iCarly cast. The show consistently acts like this is the funniest idea to ever be thought of by anyone, when in reality, it's really lame. One thing I noticed about the jokes on the iCarly web show is that they tend to be really inspired by early Smosh. There's a lot of like, your thing versus my thing, sports bra versus potato, legs versus pudding, you get the idea. There's a certain focus on non sequiturs, anything annoying and impossible to ignore is treated as prime time internet content, and often a joke isn't actually necessary to what they set up. And I guess this is what a lot of internet content was around 2007? But it still reads like old people trying really hard to imitate a style of jokes that they just don't understand at all. Although on the other hand, some of the people who worked on this show also worked on The Amanda Show. So maybe they were just particularly gifted at making skits that aren't funny. Anyways, I thought talking about this briefly would be a fun way to transition back into my favorite iCarly subcategory. Episodes that specifically cover the internet, the web show, or things that happen because of the web show. And if there's any story people want to hear about in this section, it's probably Season 2, Episode 11, I Meet Fred. Now, my last video on the channel was actually about the Fred character, covering his entire history from start to finish, and I touched upon some aspects of the episode there. So if you want to hear more of me talking about Fred, consider checking that video out. But if that isn't interesting to you, here's a brief rundown of the episode without any of the context. Carly and Sam are putting on their latest web show when they decide to watch a brief clip of the latest viral craze. Fred Figglehorn, a high-pitched personality known for his wacky antics. Carly and Sam are moved by his shrill siren song, but Freddy isn't as impressed, saying that he just doesn't find Fred to be very funny. Shortly afterwards, Fred uploads a video saying that because of Freddy's cruel comments, he is going to be quitting YouTube. I mean, Splashface, sorry. And soon enough, the iCarly gang becomes the focus of targeted attacks and harassment, both at school and online. One of my favorite details in this episode is that when they read this clickbait story about themselves, it's hosted on Nevelocity.com, which I think is fun. This idea that Neville is like a petty drama YouTuber who had a beef with Carly once and now actively becomes obsessed with every aspect of her life. So they eventually get in contact with Fred and drive to his home in Idaho to meet with him. There they meet Lucas Cruikshank, the creator of Fred, who asks Freddy to take back his statements. Freddy refuses, saying that he has to stick to his principles even when they're not popular. And in return, Sam takes him into another room and beats him with a tennis racket. Not there. Ah! Freddy limps back into the room and Lucas reveals that he never really had any issue with iCarly. And furthermore, that he has no intentions of quitting the Fred character. He merely created a fake beef between them, instigating reaction, because it led to the popularity of both Fred and iCarly to skyrocket. Lucas and the gang become friends, they film an exclusive Fred video, and all is well between them. Another episode surrounding the internet can be found in Season 1, Episode 3, I Owe You, aka the Patreon episode. In the story, Freddy and Carly confront Sam over her rampant borrowing of money from the two of them, resulting in her promising to pay all of it back, despite the amount being so high. That week, on the web show, Sam jokes that if people want to help, they can send her cash via Ridgeway Middle School. Later that week, Carly and Sam are called to the principal's office, as it turns out that the school has been receiving thousands of letters from iCarly fans, all sending money directly to them. 
The principal says that they have to send all of it back because, quote, You can't solicit money from kids over the internet. It's against the law. No, it's not. Furthermore, when did they solicit money from kids? Why does this show keep acting like everyone who uses the internet is 11 while also consistently illustrating adults as being fans of the web show? They're forced to send all of the money back, that is, until Spencer discovers a loophole. You see, earlier in that episode, Spencer meets a MILF and agrees to help her daughter and the Sunshine Girl sell sunshine cookies, because Spencer has an ongoing quest in the series to bang as many one-off characters as he possibly can. Anyway, Spencer realizes that they can send fudgeballs to people who pledge to a certain tier, I mean, who sent in money. And that way, they aren't soliciting cash, they're selling a service, which they already were, because they make internet content. This episode doesn't make sense. So they make enough cash for Sam to pay them back, and she buys a trampoline with the money instead, that's it. This episode playfully predicts the phenomenon of people sending pocket change to their favorite creators in exchange for them continuing to make content, something that obviously has become a real phenomenon on the modern web. Two bucks, way to dig deep, Lewis. I also want to quickly add that several episodes in this season confirm something that I kind of presumed but didn't have evidence of, which is that the iCarly cast, outside of their one failed sponsor, makes roughly zero dollars and zero cents on their web show. No one's paying you to look pretty. No one's paying me at all! I thought I would throw this detail in for any people who think that Carly is the one paying rent, or the people who joke, wow, that internet money must have been good, which like, no, it's not good, because they literally don't make any money. Like most sitcoms, iCarly revels in the ability to introduce a character and then bring them back on occasion to build up a sense of continuity. And of course, the biggest example of this is Neville Papperman, their twice-seen web show rival, who appears four times throughout season two. The first time was in the Christmas alternate reality, the final time is in the finale, which we'll analyze near the end, and the other two times were an episode surrounding his epic plots of Rue. In season 2 episode 9, I Give Away a Car, the trio meet with the son of a local car dealer, who says that his father does a yearly giveaway of a free car, and that this year he wants to have the competition on iCarly through a riddle. Whoever solves the riddle the fastest will get the car. The gang go through with the plan, only for the person who wins the competition to be... <gasps> Neville? Long story short, it turns out that the local car dealer doesn't have a son, and the trio deduce that Neville hired an actor to trick them into giving away a car. Neville essentially confirms this, but says he is still owed a vehicle, and that if he doesn't get one within 48 hours, he will have iCarly.com shut down. Luckily, in the B-plot, Spencer buys a vehicle that he thinks is an authentic prop recreation from the film series Galaxy Wars, only for it to turn out to be a total fake. He decides that he doesn't want it after all, and thus gives it to Neville technically fulfilling the giveaway. Neville drives the car into a flower shop. The episode ends. Later, in episode 13, we actually see two lore characters return, as the trio accidentally forget to renew the iCarly.com domain, leading to Mandy Valdez buying it. You remember Mandy? The, uh, parody of neurodivergent people? Mandy tries to become the group's manager, wrecking the webcast and being very annoying to be around until the group nicely asks her to give the domain back. Mandy is confused, saying that she sent the login info to Freddy the night before, when he emailed her. Freddy says that he never emailed her, leading to the revelation that Neville now has control of iCarly.com. After numerous attempts to get it back through means of cross-dressing, Carly creates a video call with Neville and says that she will do anything to get her website back. Neville says that he would only give it back for a kiss, and Carly immediately agrees, much to the shock of Neville. They meet in a shady alley, guarded by scary men, Neville signs the paperwork, giving Carly her sight back, and it seems like this is actually going to happen. Until we find out that it's directly under her apartment window, and Spencer and the gang draw her back up with a very strong fishing pole. Carly has their sight back, and they're mean to Mandy again. What else could you ask from an iCarly episode? So the final episode this season, which is significantly about the internet, is season 2, episode 18, I Take on Dingo. Here's some basic context for this episode. In 2009, barely a year after iCarly first broadcast, the Disney Channel premiered a brand new sitcom starring up-and-coming comedian Demi Lovato. In the show, Demi plays Sonny Monroe, a quirky teenager who is given the chance to be the star of their own show. 
as they are hired for the teen sketch comedy series, So Random. Sonny gets into beef with other actors on the studio, they have a blossoming romance with the star of the drama at the network, and they get to create new skits and content every week as they ascend into an internationally recognized superstar. So allegedly, and I must insist that this is based partially on rumor, when the creators of iCarly saw Sonny with a Chance, they were immediately convinced that it was a blatant, shameless knockoff of their show. And I'm Sunny, <laughs> but I knew that. <laughs> Wait, you're that funny girl from the internet. At the very least, you can certainly argue that the program was a satire of teenage variety shows, like All That and The Amanda Show. So you could definitely see the perspective that it was basically a Disney Channel take on a Nickelodeon idea. And so, the writers of iCarly created an entire episode about the cast driving to California, going to the Disney Channel writing room, and beating the crap out of the writers of Sunny with a Chance until they're given an apology. In the story, Carly and Sam are told by a classmate that they were watching the Dingo Channel and saw a joke which was blatantly stolen from the iCarly web show. Trying to investigate, the trio all take to watching the show that weekend, which is called Totally Terry. They groan at the painful, stereotypical sitcom writing before taking note when a segment called Messin' with Rupert is literally identical to a joke from their own show. Angered, they decide to drive from Seattle to LA and convince Spencer to take them after they tell him that he can use this opportunity to look for the frozen head of Dingo founder, Charles Dingo. At the network, the writers of Totally Terry insist that it is not a ripoff of iCarly, saying that all similarities are coincidental, despite there being a board in their office which literally reads, Ideas to Steal from iCarly. Alongside at least one person on the staff accidentally admitting that they do take ideas from the web show. They're thrown out after Sam continues to hit one writer with a sock filled with butter. But while Sam and Carly were in the writer's room, Spencer and Freddy actually managed to find Charles Dingo's head. And coming back the next day, they threaten to leak photos of the head to the internet if the writers don't stop stealing ideas from their show. They also force the writers to appear on iCarly wearing bikinis and to fight with dog food. This show is weird sometimes. Okay, so we have now covered all of the Spencer episodes and all of the internet episodes. So I would like to now voyage into a different subcategory, which I guess is probably what the show is most known for. That being, teen drama or school drama episodes. These are episodes which either focus on drama happening within the lives of the characters, or are set entirely at school. Now, a few of these episodes do cross over into being Spencer episodes or featuring the internet in a significant way, but for the most part, I think all of the episodes we're about to talk about fit best in this category, and I imagine you guys would agree. So let's start things off with Season 2, Episode 8, I Kiss. If you sat down with 12-year-old me and you forced me to pick my favorite episode of iCarly, I think I Kiss would be the one. Mainly because it was the first bona fide Freddy Sam ship episode. And as someone who sat down to watch the pilot episode when it first premiered, I always wanted these two characters to get together. And for someone watching this video with no context about the show, who's only learned about the show through this video, that must sound crazy. You must be saying, why would you ship these two characters together? She literally physically assaults him every other episode. And to that I say, well, you know, at the time I was a big sitcom buff. I really liked watching sitcoms. Back then they were a bunch of free ones that had been uploaded to YouTube, and I used to binge the really obscure ones. And my favorite sitcom trope at the time was the two characters who hate each other in the pilot episode and get married in the finale. And so when Freddy and Sam hated each other's guts in the pilot episode, I said, hey, they gotta get together by the end. It's sitcom gospel. The other reason I remember I Kiss so fondly is that it was my first experience with like an event sitcom episode that I got to see live. Like my dad used to always tell me about sitcom events from when he was a kid where he was just proud to have been there to see them. Like he would always go like, oh, I was there when the Fonz jumped the shark. I was there when Mr. Drysdale and Mr. Haney went on a crossover road trip up to Sanford and Son. 
And, you know, it's like, you know, anyone born after 1978 doesn't know what any of those words mean. But with this episode of iCarly, I felt this swell of pride that I had actually been there. I had seen this amazing piece of television. I saw the episode where Sam and Freddy kiss. But does the episode stand the test of time? Well, let's find out. At the start of the story, Freddy enters the Shea household in a flash, revealing that, for one of the first times ever, he has pranked Sam to get back at her for pranking him. As she storms in, breaking the lock on the door, we find out what that prank was. Being handcuffed to Gibby. Sam, enraged by this even after being free, declares that Freddy has gone too far and that soon she will find the most sadistic way to get back at him. A while later, after things have cooled down, the trio are hanging out on the iCarly set when the topic of first kisses comes into view. Each kid discusses their memories of the first time until Sam leaves the room and Freddy makes an odd admission. He has never kissed anyone. The only kiss he's ever had is from Valerie, who was only kissing him to build clout and attention. And outside of that, he's never had a real, proper, first kiss. A short while later, on the web show, Sam suddenly stops the program in order to make an announcement. That Freddy, the image of masculinity on a shining hill, has never kissed another person. Freddy, shocked that his secret has been blurted out to millions of people, drops his camcorder as Carly exclaims that Sam has ruined Freddy's life. Freddy is mocked for this situation everywhere he goes, being laughed at by students and treated even worse online. And eventually, he stops coming to school, and then to iCarly practices. Carly confronts Sam, saying that she's ruined Freddy's life and that there's nothing she can do to take it all back, and as they do iCarly alone, Sam again hijacks the program to make another announcement. It's not a big deal that Freddy hasn't had a first kiss, and she should know, because she hasn't had a first kiss either. Taking the show off the air, Carly commends Sam for lying to make Freddy look better, only for Sam to admit that she wasn't lying. She really has never had her first kiss. So who wants to play a brand new game here on Quinn Reviews iCarly? I call it, was this line written by a woman? Or a man. You shocked? Well, yeah, but just because you always seemed so willing. I wish I had an answer to that riddle, but uh, when you go to the Wikipedia page, you know, the name on this one's just static. I don't know why this keeps happening. So Sam goes to Freddy's balcony, where he's been camping out all week, and they talk about the latest episode of iCarly, which he has made sure to watch despite not being involved. And as they sulk in their mutual lip celibacy, they both seem to think of the same crazy idea at the exact same time. I was just gonna say... That we should kiss? And against all logic, everything we know about this show and these two characters, it actually happens. In the show, it's a private moment between two lonely kids in a starlit night. But in the real world, it was a sensational event, viewed by six million kids on the first broadcast alone. Well, that was, um... Nice. Yeah, nice, uh... Good work. Thank you, you too. <laughs> this right here was the reason people watched iCarly. I mean, the show was fresh, it was different, it was funny, it covered this topic we were all interested in, but stories like this were the real reason we kept watching. There are a few more episodes about the love lives of these characters, but let's take a breather for a second with something a little more lighthearted. Season 2 episode 19 is another one which tends to find a place in the minds of people who saw it at the time. In the story, the famed Locker 239 becomes up for grabs after a student moves away from the school. The locker, as we learn, was accidentally built to be four times as big as a regular locker, and to decide who gets it, a competition is held. A tube in the hall is filled with fat cakes, and whoever can accurately guess how many are inside will be given the biggest locker in the school. Freddy uses complex mathematics to estimate how many could potentially be inside, Sam immediately guesses because she knows her fat cakes, and Gibby rubs himself all over the container. 
In the end, the results are announced, and both Freddy and Sam have won the locker, meaning that they have to share it. This causes much strife, until Freddy offers to buy Sam out of her half of the locker. Sam agrees, saying that she was going to move back next to Carly anyways, and then Sam's mother drives her car into the building, destroying the locker and much of Freddy's equipment. Next we have Season 2, Episode 17, I Reunite with Missy. In the story, Carly is suddenly visited by Missy, a friend that Carly made years earlier when they were both stationed at the same military base, who has recently moved to Seattle. Carly is ecstatic, immediately accepting Missy back into their friend circle. Missy begins inviting the group out to do things, but mysteriously sends Sam the wrong address. She then gives Sam expensive foreign chocolates, which turn out to be 20 years past their expiration date, causing Sam to become violently sick as Missy replaces her on the iCarly web show. Sam becomes convinced that Missy is trying to replace her, but Carly says that she's just being paranoid. However, when it's just the two of them, Missy tells Sam that she isn't being paranoid and that she fully intends to eliminate Sam from Carly's friend group so she can be Carly's only true best friend. Sam confides in Freddy, who says that he has no reason to believe her, although he seems to change his mind near the end. Meanwhile, at school, a competition is held wherein a single student from the class body will be allowed to attend the rest of their school year on a cruise at sea. Oh, who's stealing ideas now? Incidentally, what kind of school has this many insanely amazing competitions? Who runs this place? Willy Wonka? That joke isn't too funny, but we're two hours in. Cut me some slack. As we learn later, Freddy ends up winning, but gifts his spot on the cruise to Missy. Carly overhears Missy threatening Sam. She finally believes her story. And we find out that Missy is very easily seasick in the final scene. With that, the next several episodes of iCarly that we're going to talk about are notable mostly because they deal with some elements of the gang's personal love lives. Starting us off, we have Season 2, Episode 41, I Date a Bad Boy. In the story, Carly ends up meeting a new guy who's moved into her apartment complex. And he is everything that a girl could want. He's cool, he's ripped, he dated Hannah Montana in an alternate universe. I mean, he's two fangs away from being the perfect 2010's dreamboat. Much to the annoyance of Freddy, who can't stand Carly dating such a seemingly perfect guy. But one day she goes home to his place and discovers that he collects Beanie Babies. And she decides that this is something she can't tolerate as it robs him of his masculinity. Which is absolute nonsense. I mean, can you imagine someone trying to say that there's a link between masculinity and having a fun hobby? This poor guy has found something that excites him, something that really gets him going. Shouldn't that be a good thing? But no, higher than mighty Carly Shay, low random web show Carly can't handle a little bit of shelf fuzz. I'm just asking for some basic fucking respect for this completely normal dude and his cool hobby that isn't weird at all! So I actually really like this episode. So that was like a bit. That was a joke. And the reason I put it in the video is because it's an iCarly retrospective, man. And you know, I've talked to a lot of people about iCarly in the last six to 10 months. And what I've found is that this is typically like one of the first episodes people remember because they remember being like 10 and watching it and getting mad. But personally, I didn't mind it this time around. I don't know, I feel like sometimes I just struggle to live up to expectations. Like, oh, 2016, Quentin would have screamed at the TV and made a joke. I think this episode is hilarious, and it has a really nuanced joke that's easier to understand as an adult, but the people don't typically realize that, because not a lot of people actually sit down and fully rewatch iCarly, like, totally properly. And there's a really good reason for that. But I can't remember what it is. You see, what really happens in this episode is that this dude steals Spencer's motorcycle, which Carly bought him with her sponsor money, and then the two of them start dating. And so Spencer completely freaks out and he says, this guy's shady as hell, you're only 14, I don't want you seeing him, and you know, he completely forbids her from seeing this guy. 
And so the joke of the episode is that, A, this is not the kind of guy that Carly typically dates. He's nothing like her type. He's not her type at all. And she's really only dating him because it's rebellious and it's, like, against the authority figure in her life to do so. And when she finds out he has a collection of Beanie Babies... It kind of messes the whole thing up for her. Although, can I quickly just interject something about this discussion? Um, if I started dating a guy, and I walked into his bedroom, and I saw that specific wall of collectibles, my first thought would not be, Ew, Beanie Babies. My first thought would be, Hey, what's that? In a tube over there, you got a little a little teddy bear that's dressed like Ronald McDonald. Okay, all right. And then right next to that, you have a symbol that was popularized by the people who orchestrated the Holocaust. I know that the Iron Cross was for some reason used by like punks in the 90s, but like like do you think the prop department knew that or do you think they were like, "Hey, do you know who's really into beanie babies? Neo-Nazis. Did you know that?" I want to mention this real quick as like a quick aside. When I was doing research into like the iCarly brand, I found out that at one point, iCarly was featured at Build-A-Bear Workshop. And there was like this one purple teddy bear that was specifically supposed to be iCarly themed and there were a bunch of accessories that you could take and put on that bear or different bears. And you know, I looked into this and I saw it and I thought, well, okay, that's interesting, but that has no use for me. And then I thought... Quentin, what are you talking about?! And so I wanted to really quickly show off uh, my new Garfield plush. I call them iGarfield. They are a Garfield wearing exclusively merchandise uh, from Build-A-Bear Workshop of iCarly. And hey, look at this. They come with a little laptop case. So guess what I keep in there? My Zip It. Anyways, if there's anything truly incredible that originates from this episode, it's probably Freddy's reaction to finding out that Carly's new boy toy is far from perfect. Yes! Oh, yeah! Griffin overhears them talking and says that he isn't interested in having a girlfriend who won't support his hobbies. Carly thinks about apologizing, but sees a mirage of his plushies begging her to stay. And when he finally leaves, she decides that it was probably for the best anyways. This brings us around to I Make Sam Girlier. This is easily one of the stupidest episodes they've done so far. Like, it's not offensive for the most part, and it's not annoying, it's just a dumb idea that somehow got made despite being a really weak script. In the story, Sam has a birthday party with all of her friends and a boy she has a crush on, and is devastated when all of the stories told at the party are about her being tough, masculine, or scary even from the guy that she secretly wants to ask out. Fretting over this, Sam confides in Carly that she wants to be more girly, and Carly agrees to give Sam a makeover. This episode is kind of weird in my opinion. I'm pretty sure every teenage boy and a lot of teenage girls who watch this show had a crush on Sam, so on that level, the idea of a Sam makeover episode is pretty stupid, but when you see the outfit that they put her in, it all starts to make sense. See, I have no evidence of this, but I'm pretty sure this is supposed to be another knock at the Disney Channel, because the way they dress Sam in this story is pretty much identical to how Disney used to dress their teen stars at the time. Anyway, Sam makes a declaration of femininity, saying that she's going to become cordial, clean, and presentable so she can get boys to like her. However, this upsets the power balance at school, because there's a mean, six-foot-tall, 30-year-old pretending to be a teenager. So I'm no racial scholar, uh, but I've been informed that this is a pretty staunch stereotype of black women that existed at the time. That they were like these overgrown, testosterone-pumped superhumans who were scary to white people. I think this is made a lot worse by the fact that there are so few black women in iCarly, especially ones with speaking roles. The only other example I can think of from Season 2 is a classmate they bring in for the web show, who they prank in an insanely lame way, and then they literally say, Okay, haha, <laughs> get out. <laughs> Sorry, Kathy. <laughs> okay, bye, Kathy. Bye. Run along now. Just keep scurrying. Thank you. Here you go. 
Sam eventually snaps, violently assaults the bully, and the boy she has a crush on asks her out, saying that her violent side was always the part he liked about her. So the lesson, I think, is that Sam needs to be a violent, abusive person because black women scare the writers. I believe that's the message. And finally, we have reached Season 1, Episode 20. I'll be honest with you guys, I think this is one of the best episodes of the show so far. Like, it's not the episode I had the most fun watching, it's not the smartest episode, it's just the episode that they clearly put the most thought into. And I'm very excited to say it's one of the only stories where every plot beat, every scene, almost every moment in the episode follows a concise, purposeful theme. Gaslighting. Gaslighting has been a recurring theme throughout the majority of Season 2, where someone is told that they're lying with enough authority that they begin to find a fogginess in what is real and what is fake, or the people around them begin to not trust them in the slightest. This was featured in I Go to Japan when Kyoko and Yuki construct an entire narrative just to ditch them in the middle of nowhere, and in I Reunite with Missy, when Missy begins a targeted attack directed at destroying Sam, and Freddy is the only person in their friend group who eventually buys into it. These are just a few key examples. But it's clear that in the lives of the main trio, lying or being lied to is a dominating aspect of their lives. And this episode is brilliant in all the many ways that it ends up exploring this. At the start of the episode, we see a viral prank happen involving Freddy. Some of the other students at the school send him what appears to be a school email saying that it is Clown Day and that everyone should come to school wearing clown costumes, leading to Freddy being labeled as one of the most gullible people on the planet. Freddy, livid over this, proclaims that he will never fall for a practical joke ever again. Later on, the girls tell Freddy that Sam's sister from out of town is going to be visiting for a few days, as we apparently learn that Sam has a twin sister who has the opposite personality of her and goes to a school in another town because of a very solid scholarship. Now, I did not remember this storyline at all. All. So when I read the plot description online when looking this up beforehand, I thought it sounded kind of stupid? And in fact, I thought it sounded so stupid that I presumed it wasn't going to be canon. You see, I've gathered from my research that later seasons of iCarly tend to get bored and just do Treehouse of Horror style non-canon episodes, and I just thought that the episode where Sam had a twin sister would probably be one of those. And that's the brilliant thing. Watching through this, I was so unsure if this was going to turn out to be a dream, or if it was going to be a non-canon episode, or if a later episode was going to retcon this, that it was like the show was gaslighting me, too. Like, I wasn't even sure what level of reality this episode existed on. So Sam's supposed sister comes to town, and is indeed totally opposite to Sam's personality. The entire time, we never see Sam and Melanie in the same room, and you kind of are waiting for the moment that Freddy buys into it, and everyone starts laughing at him. Also, I want to stop real quick and talk about my favorite side character that Season 2 introduces, Tebow. Tebow was introduced as one of the key employees at the Groovy Smoothie, a location in Seattle which was referenced constantly back in Season 1, but was never seen until Season 2. Tebow's joke is mostly that he tries to sell things to customers that they don't want, typically with the visual of those things on a stick. You guys want some bagels? The reason I'm introducing this character here is I think this is the episode where he really stands out for the first time. In his cameo, he offers to sell Freddy pickles, and when Freddy says no, he immediately plays the race card. Why? You afraid of pickles? <laughs> Scared to take a walk on the pickle side of town? No, I just think that pickles and smoothies don't really go together. Oh, well pardon me for thinking that all foods and beverages could get along. <laughs> and you know, maybe this is just me, but I refuse to believe that the writers came up with that joke. I am convinced that that is something that Boogie came up with on the spot because it's that brilliant. I mean, it literally elevates a one-bit cameo character into something that you actually want to see more of. I understand that when Gibby becomes a main character later on, T-Bone basically gets upgraded to Gibby's old place in the dynamic. And God, I am so excited for that because he really is the best. 
Anyways, meanwhile in the B-plot, a similar story with similar themes begins to play out. For a bit of context, throughout Season 2, Spencer has numerous encounters with a boy named Chuck who lives in the complex and eventually becomes his rival. First, in Episode 4, Spencer takes over Lubert's doorman position after the iCarly gang accidentally blow him up. <laughs> I know that sounds like a pretty insane story to just gloss over, but there's another Lubert story in Season 3, so I want to talk about both of the Lubert episodes together. The point is that Spencer gets this kid in trouble for playing with a racquetball in the main lobby, leading to him being grounded by his father. And after that point, the child swears revenge. At the end of the story, he calls a group of truckers that Spencer has been taunting and tells them where to find him, leading to several large men assaulting Lubert by mistake at the end of the story. Later, in I Reunite with Missy, Spencer accidentally locks himself into the apartment complex's basement for several days. And when Chuck finds him, he watches over him and sprays him with what is implied to be human pee. Chuck gets grounded for this too, and he and his father storm upstairs without letting Spencer out. In one strange web-exclusive video, Chuck then tries to get revenge through the unique tactic of strangulation. Oh my god, my trachea! Hurry, oh, grab my trachea! Ah! Anyways, in this story, Spencer comes home to discover that Chuck has become a new student that Carly is tutoring in math. Spencer insists that Chuck is sadistic and shouldn't be in their home, but Chuck continues to act like a perfect angel around Carly. However, he secretly uses his access to the Shea household to break everything in their kitchen which Carly, again, doesn't really seem to believe is happening. He then sprays Spencer with a liquid that is, again, implied to be something meant for the bathroom, and even then can't convince Carly that something weird is happening. Eventually, he's able to record proof that he isn't lying, causing Carly to come up with the perfect idea for revenge. Returning to her tutor duties, Carly introduces to Chuck a brand new number which has been inserted between 5 and 6, tricking Chuck into doing all of his math in base 11, meaning that he, of course, fails the test. Spencer suggests math camp to Chuck's father, meaning that he has now taken away the boy's entire summer. Don't you see how it all fits together? Chuck was gaslighting Spencer, Carly gaslit Chuck, and now the only question left is, are Sam and Carly gaslighting Freddy? To put the question to the test, Freddy asks Melanie out on a date, and much to his surprise, she says yes. He tries all night to get her to admit that she's just Sam in an outfit, and during a slow dance, Melanie kisses Freddy on the dance floor, causing him to become quite flustered. You swore we'd never do that again. The next day, Freddy lectures Sam about kissing him the night before, causing Carly and Sam to admit that Freddy was right and that he was too smart to be duped. Immediately after he leaves, Melanie walks in, revealing to the audience that she really was real the entire time, despite what almost everyone presumed. Like I said, this is easily one of the smartest episodes in the show so far. But what's funny is that I remember so clearly the Durf storyline, but I do not recall the twin side of the episode. And I think this is because this is one of those episodes that I would typically tune into just for my favorite parts. People forget about this now that we're in the age of streaming services, but the weird thing about Satellite back in the day is sometimes you'd be flipping through channels, see an episode of a show that you'd already watched, and you'd turn it on just for the part that you really liked. So I feel like I've seen the Durf scene a hundred times, yet the rest of this was pretty much new to me this time around. But I did kind of feel myself revert back to a child watching this for the first time, thinking about all the repercussions this means for the characters, the fact that Freddy accidentally told another person that he kissed Sam, which is supposed to be a secret, and you start thinking, ooh, when is he gonna slip up? When is he gonna tell someone that little gem? Anyways, before we move on to the crime section of this season, it's probably most logical that we end this bit with the season finale. I fight Shelby Marks. In the episode, the trio watch a pay-per-view match of their favorite fighter, CFC competitor Shelby Marks. Shelby is only 15, but is quickly proving herself to be one of the fiercest competitors in the Octagon, and the iCarly gang put together a tribute to her on their web show. Carly says that she could easily kick Shelby's butt, only to immediately take it back and say that she's only kidding. This suddenly goes viral, as a remix, taking Carly's words out of context, gains 500,000 views overnight. 
And I think this is a great time to play another exciting game of Was This Line Written by a Woman or a Man? And I'm getting curvier every day. I know. Eyes up, dude. Much to Carly's horror, she opens her door after this, only to see Shelby Marks waiting to see her. Carly runs in fear and hides in her room, only for Spencer to drag her back down to hear Shelby out. Shelby's manager is interested in holding a faux match between Carly and Shelby, believing that the novelty and publicity of this event could be a big deal both for Shelby's career and the iCarly web show. And come on, holding a boxing match between a professional athlete and a washed up internet star? That's just silly. During this scene, there's a moment where Freddy has made Shelby raisin toast, only for her to say that she doesn't like raisins, leading to Freddy chewing the raisins off of the top layer, causing her to turn the toast down. Directly after this, one of the adults who came in with Shelby says, I like raisin bread toast. <laughs> ah, another classic Freddy gets molested joke. Carly and Shelby announce the fight, and all of her friends at school commend her for being so willing to fight Shelby, despite her being so notorious for destroying the faces of people she goes up against in the ring. Soon enough, the two groups attend a press conference, where Sam encourages Carly to trash talk Shelby to hype up the fight, only for Sam to take over when Carly isn't good enough, literally causing a fight to break out on stage, which pushes Carly onto Shelby's grandmother, making the press and Shelby believe that Carly attacked an elderly woman just to make her mad. Shelby decides that she's going to actually violently harm Carly in retaliation causing Carly to cancel the fight, disappointing fans and the charity that the event was going to be raising money for. This leads everyone in school, even teachers, to treat her like dirt, calling her chicken in reference to various viral taunts and memes. Okay, real quick, look at this splash face video that they show us. Do you see how the play button is visible and the video is playing? Any person watching this knows that that isn't right, and if you don't know, you can literally hover your mouse over the video and see that the play button isn't visible right now. I guess the reason I'm bringing this up is that I think it's hilarious that the people making this web star sitcom didn't understand the fundamental layout of video websites, but that they also predicted a modern standard of internet celebrity-dumb without even trying. Carly and Shelby initially make up, with Carly saying that it was all an accident and Shelby believing her, only for our old friend Neville to decide to intervene. Using his complex editing skills, he fakes audio of Carly and Sam planning to push Mamaw Marks before the event, causing Shelby to decide to actually violently assault Carly in the ring. Carly holds onto Shelby's leg during the entire event, and shockingly, no one can decide if this is a foul or not. After the event, the group meets up with Shelby and quickly deduce that the round-headed kid who presented her the fake audio was actually Neville, their arch-nemesis. Locking him in the ring, they threaten him until he admits what he did, and afterwards, Shelby, Carly, and Sam slowly walk towards him, and then we hear his screams, and the episode fades out. Very smart of them to not show what happens in this scene, meaning that I actually can't add it to the list of crimes, because I don't know what they did. Speaking of which, let's get into that section of the video. Okay, so for the crimes of season one, I covered a few episodes in that section which I hadn't mentioned before that. There's going to be one or two examples of that in the season two run through, but for the most part, we're going to be revisiting episodes that we already talked about. And in some cases, scenes that we've already talked about. I am, of course, going to start this section off by restating that Sam's insistent physical abuse of Freddy is hopefully illegal in the iCarly universe. Because it gets to a point in this season that it's really not funny. Now, to my surprise, I've decided that I can't with good faith call anything in the first episode a crime. Sam doesn't really raise any money with her fake charity, so at most that might be a civil case if she had raised like five bucks. And she isn't really impersonating a real charity, which apparently is a lot more illegal than making up a fake one. 
Towards the end of the episode, there's a famous scene where Carly enters Shane's hospital room and kisses him without consent. In the analysis of this episode, I called this assault, but sadly there isn't really legal precedent for unwanted kissing being illegal in any remarkable way, mainly because people who are kissed without consent rarely feel like going to court over it. So it wouldn't get Carly arrested, but it's a general scumbag move in my opinion. Moving on to episode 2 and our I Crime number 11. In this episode, Freddy has decided not to forward a haunted email, which is a very 2008 sentence. And he sees numerous things in his life go wrong because he's supposedly cursed. It later turns out that everything that went wrong was actually the result of Sam secretly doing those things. This means that Sam did things like destroying Freddy's laptop, and loosening the bolts on his bike so he'll have an accent and potentially fall onto the road during heavy traffic. At this point in the show, you really start to wonder why Sam actively tries to sabotage her own internet career by destroying technology that Freddy uses almost exclusively to maintain her status online. We discover eye crime number 12 in season 2, episode 4, the one where they blow Lubert up. Again, we're going to talk about this episode a little later, but for now I'll say that it's very explicit in the episode that if they don't kiss Lubert's ass after this, he has every right to get them in very big trouble. Mainly it seems like Lubert is just too stubborn to play that card, because at several points in the series, it really does come across as Lubert gets some kind of kick from this rivalry that he has with the rest of the cast. Also in this same episode, Sam pants Freddy in the hallway of their middle school. Now this might sound confusing, but based on my research, Sam could potentially be charged with indecent exposure for doing this. According to Washington law, exposing yourself or someone else in a way that is lewd or obscene is considered indecent exposure, and is thus a misdemeanor. All the law really needs is an eyewitness, which sadly for Freddy and Sam, there seems to be quite a few witnesses to this event. So that's eye crime number 13. In Season 2, Episode 5, Spencer is shown using a massive battery, and says that he stole it from a Prius. Later in the episode, Freddy's mom complains that she can't get her Prius to start. So that's eye crime number 14. This episode is also the event story where they end up going overseas to Japan, and is thus one of the more interesting cases in the series because they're not only visiting another city, but another country. So I asked both Noah and Scott to chime in on what they think is illegal here. And here's what I came up with. First of all, I discovered while researching this that Japan actually has laws about immigrants and tourists, which I think are kind of draconian sounding. Basically, in Japan, a police officer can stop you at any time and for any reason and ask to see your identification. And if you are a visitor, that means they want to see your stamped passport. If you can't supply this, you can be immediately detained, and if you're lucky, you'll be deported. Now here's the problem, ladies and gents. Technically, the way they enter Japan is itself illegal. Skydiving into Japan, by definition, means they can't get their passports stamped. So they were never approved as being allowed inside the country. And thus, they could be detained at any time for any reason. For instance, the scene where Freddy's mom and Spencer have to run back to their hotel naked, or the scene where Sam steals a police officer's handcuffs, or the long scene where they're trying to break into the awards show despite not having a pass to get inside, and all while you're inside of a country that operates off the principle of guilty before innocent. So let's go ahead and round the crime meter to like 18 or so. Speaking of stories set outside of Seattle, in this section I would like to very quickly mention a piece of iCarly media that's actually pretty rare. That being the character's appearance at the Kids' Choice Awards 2008. Now, this aired during the tail end of the first season of the show, so arguably I should have covered it there. But I believe this was filmed while they were shooting season 2, although actually, now that I look at Spencer's hair, it, it probably wasn't. The point is that I forgot about this when I recorded season 1, so we're talking about it here. These segments, I believe, were broadcast during commercial breaks, and were later hosted on iCarly.com. Now an interesting fact is that when I was working on this section, I found out that most of this was considered lost media. However, I saw a comment from someone who claimed that they owned a copy of everything, 
and that they just didn't want to post them because of copyright issues. So I messaged him and asked if he would be willing to send all of the segments to me, and he immediately replied with a Google Drive link to all 12 parts. And so I've decided to upload these to a brand new Vimeo account named Clinton Loose Screws. I chose this alias so Viacom can't find me, and also because I'm technically banned from Vimeo. Anyways, I just wanted to send a big shout out to the guy who sent me all of this, Race Olympics, who actually has a YouTube channel where he builds racing tracks for Hot Wheels and Marbles and sees which ones can survive to the end, which is pretty fun to watch in my opinion. And this entirely unjustified tangent in this video would not have been possible if not for this awesome guy. Anyways, as I was saying, for the Kids' Choice Awards 2008, numerous linking segments with the iCarly characters were presented to help hype up the show. In the story, it's said that Spencer was invited to the awards show to build a unique statue, and that he's behind schedule as usual. It's gonna be a gigantic blimp of wieners, made from over 10,000 actual wieners! That's a lot of wieners! But as Carly and Sam begin to stream from the event, a police officer approaches them. You guys can't be here. Um, my brother's building a sculpture for the Kids' Choice Awards. That's nice, but you can't. Here's a 20. You kids have fun. Nice. <laughs> this segment is set in Hollywood, where the Kids' Choice Awards were filmed that year. And according to California State Penal Code 67 PC, bribery of a police officer is to be considered a felony, punishable by four years in prison or huge fines. However, because it's such a small amount of money and legal action would involve generally exposing police corruption, I doubt anything would have ever come of this. Nevertheless, that's our eye crime number 19. Here's what happens in the rest of the segments. Carly, Sam, and Freddy play a game of identifying celebrity tongues, with Carly proving to be so good that it makes everyone uncomfortable. Spencer runs out of hot dogs and tries to steal some from the craft table, leading to the craft services lady chasing him throughout the building. Later, Spencer takes a breather from building his statue to break into Jack Black's dressing room. Hey guys, now as you know, Jack Black is hosting this year's Kids' Choice Awards, and I've sneaked away from my sculpture, and I'm standing in Jack Black's actual dressing room. Look, there's Jack Black's leftover bran muffin, which is really good for a celebrity's digestion. Woo. And this looks like Jack Black's actual underwear. Some very exotic boxers. What else do we got? This is Jack Black's private dressing room. Thank you for telling me that, sir. You are in big trouble, buddy. Only if you can catch me! Back to you, Carly and Sam! Hey, ah! hey, no! hey. In California, trespassing is a misdemeanor which can result in six months of jail time. Furthermore, the state also has a long history of anti-paparazzi laws since the death of Princess Diana, which could possibly apply here. So let's call this I crime number 20. Spencer finally pulls together enough meat to finish his art piece and reveals it to the world. A sculpture of a blimp made entirely out of hot dogs. Now, most people would just take this sculpture to be a meaningless mash of things that the writers thought were funny. But in a sense, what Spencer has created here is actually an abstract criticism of the superficial commercialism of the modern art world. For most sculptures that Spencer makes and sells, he probably expects to see them pop up from time to time in various art shows or auctions, hoarded away in unlit rooms by collectors until their value rises or falls significantly. So by constructing one of his most impressive and awe-inspiring creations out of a soluble, non-eternal material, something that will likely start to stink before the night is out, he has reminded us that the true important aspect of art is the impact it has on us in the moment even if it exists in a form which we cannot save or maintain. I repeat, Spencer is secretly Banksy. Make sure you watch the Kids' Choice Awards. And make sure you keep going online to iCarly.com. Definitely. And now we're gonna enjoy some wieners. Especially our favorite wiener. This guy right here. While we're in California, why don't we hop around to the other story in this season set in the state. Season 2, Episode 18, I Take On Disney. I mean Dingo. I Take On Dingo. In the story, again, the characters make fake security passes, sneak their way into Dingo Channel HQ, steal the frozen head of Charles Dingo, and then allow Sam to hit one of the writers with a, quote, butter sock over and over again. 
Sam assaults so many people over the course of this show that I'm not even sure if assault is illegal in the iCarly universe. Like, wouldn't she have gotten in trouble at some point, somewhere, if it actually was? Nevertheless, I'm gonna go ahead and call breaking into Disney HQ, stealing the head of Walt Disney, and physically assaulting Sonny with a Chance lead writer Steve Marmel as three different crimes, bringing our crime total to 23. Hopping back to Seattle, and thus the jurisdiction of Washington law, let's talk about Season 2, Episode 10, aka Fuck That Guy Whose Brother Is About To Die From Cancer. At the end of the episode, when they have the real David Archuleta on, there's this weird joke where they tell the audience where Wade Collins is staying, down to his hotel address and his hotel number. Now, if we're lucky, nothing happens, in which case this can be classified as harassment and thus a misdemeanor, which could result in a year in jail and a $5,000 fine. But if one of Carly's fans actually commit a real crime because she did this, felony charges could easily be involved. Either way, I'm calling it I Crime number 24. Anyways, at this point, I'm going to talk about an episode that we didn't talk about in the main section. And that's because it's notable almost entirely for the fact that a crime takes place within the narrative. And because it's such a key example of the ongoing flanderization of the iCarly universe with things getting more and more cartoony and less and less justified, and I really, really wanted to end off on this in the Season 2 section. And that is Season 2, Episode 15, I Go Nuclear. In the story, the main trio are given a homework project by their eccentric hippie science teacher, Mr. Henning. To celebrate Green Week, they are instructed to present an effective way that students and adults can try to save the environment. This will serve as a huge chunk of their grade, so students who fail will have to go on a root and berry retreat for extra credit, something that is infamously unfun. Carly and Freddy both work very hard to try and come up with impressive presentations. Carly buys an electric scooter, which drives incredibly slowly, and Freddy imports foreign worms to build an impressive compositing diorama. However, their teacher notes that both are extremely empty and meaningless. The worms being flown in from Portugal means that Freddy polluted the atmosphere through the use of jet oil, and the same argument can be made against Carly's charging of an electric battery at home. Sam, meanwhile, does a presentation on how the humble orange is the perfect symbol of staying green, providing food and drink, and all while coming in packaging that is entirely biodegradable. So while Sam gets an A, Carly has to redo her project, and luckily Spencer meets someone who might be of some help. Help. A new tenant in their apartment, who says that he knows how to build an eco-friendly generator that runs itself, and will surely help Carly pass the class. Carly livestreams her showing off the generator to her teacher, and gets an A on her presentation. However, when visiting the Groovy Smoothie afterwards, the police suddenly recognize the person who helped build the generator who they say is an infamous man on the FBI Most Wanted list, known for stealing uranium rods and building unlicensed nuclear generators. You built an illegal nuclear-powered generator? Uh, sorta, maybe. Remember in the season one analysis when I was like, you can't pull fire alarms? I'll be honest with you guys. When I had this idea for, like, this running joke where we're gonna, like, talk about crimes every season, I didn't know this one was coming. I just wanted to find some kind of wacky way to kind of recap some of the antics that the characters get up to that isn't, like, necessarily essential to the actual recap of the season. And so it seemed like a good idea at the time. But now I don't even know if we should keep doing this. Because how could we move on from here? What could possibly top this? Carly build a fucking nuke in her attic this week. Anyways, next week Sam's gonna steal mail again. I am still processing this. Like, as I record this, I'm sitting in my home, and I'm just... I'm, I'm just taking it in. They built a nuclear generator with stolen uranium and live-streamed it to the internet and no one cared. I think this is one of the reasons that I honestly had a little bit less fun with season two than I did season one. I mean, don't get me wrong, season two has some of the best episodes in the show's run, but there's something so magical about the first season 
of a show that's trying to last a long time. Because every episode feels so careful, so meticulous. Every single one feels like it could be setting up a sequel in the future. And then you get later into the shows, and it's always a little sad when it's just like, get something on the air. Doesn't matter. I mean, don't get me wrong, season two is great. It's still clearly in the golden era of the show, but it's always a little bit sad when you get to that point where you're like, every week that goes by, the information they present in this show gets a little bit less important in the grand scheme of things. So that's season two, where at 46 episodes, 25 crimes, and seven iCarly-themed nightmares a week. But before we try and bring all of those numbers up, let's kind of step back for a moment. So I don't know if it's been very clear so far, but my intentions with this miniseries, or at least with this video and this part of it specifically, is that in between every season that we review, we're going to have kind of a brief intermission. And during that intermission, we're going to talk about um, really anything we want. You know, tangents, um, weird things I notice, things that just mainly don't fit in the core season analysis. And the reason I decided to do this was because it, it came to my realization that if I tell you about 97 episodes of iCarly in a row, without any breaks or any linking material or anything, by the end it's just going to be mush to you, it's not going to mean anything. But if we take these little, you know, calm breathers, these little breaks in between seasons, your brain is able to, like, compartmentalize the information that I'm giving you, and also it gives us a chance to talk about fun things that, like I said, don't really fit into the uh, main season retrospectives that I'm doing. I'm stopping to explain all this because this tangent specifically is going to be probably the longest one I record. It is going to be almost unjustifiably long how long we're in this room with me wearing this shirt telling you about all these different things. And the reason it's going to be so long is because I have three or four different things that I want to explain to you guys, that I want to talk about, that really only make sense before the next bundle of episodes. And that actually is our first little tangent, the first little thing I want to talk about. What the hell do we call the next 18 episodes of iCarly? Okay, let me explain what I'm talking about here. Normally, from what I understand, because I'm not a TV guy, I'm just a guy in a basement, but normally, when a network or a TV station or a streaming service are um, commissioning new episodes of a TV show, they will send out season orders. And what season orders are, from what I understand, is, a, is like a You Owe Me bundle that says, like, you owe me one season with 25 episodes. So, for instance, when iCarly was first greenlit, I believe they were sent out two season orders, and one of them said, you know, you owe us one season of 25 episodes, and you owe us one season of 21 episodes. So that's how that usually works, right? Here's why this all matters. Um, Nickelodeon used to do this really weird thing, which I suppose they still might do, I, I have no idea. But they certainly used to do this, where if someone was in the middle of a production block on a TV show, and they suddenly decided they wanted new episodes, instead of creating a new season order, they would extend a previous season order. And that's what happened to iCarly during production of their second season. I don't know the exact numbers, but let's say theoretically, they were initially working off the idea that like, season two is gonna be 21 episodes. And then suddenly, a few episodes into filming, they were told, hey, make that 39. And so, you know, this is a big stress to people working on the show, of course, because, you know, the writers, the producers, the actors, they all have to start working overtime to, you know, uh, double the material they're putting out because this uh, season order has suddenly doubled when they didn't anticipate this. And so they produced all of those episodes with the production code that begins with the number two, because it was supposed to be season two. But then Nickelodeon took those episodes and kind of randomly sorted them into two different seasons, so they could be aired over the course of three years. And so there's kind of this big discrepancy over what you should call the next 18 episodes of iCarly. Because, I mean, they were produced as the end of Season 2, they aired as Season 3, they were released on DVD as Season 2 Part 3, and they're currently on Netflix as part of Season 2, because Netflix bases their episode numberings on the production codes. 
And obviously, this is a discrepancy that reverberates throughout the rest of the show. If Season 3 is Season 2, then Season 4 is Season 3, and Season 5 is Season 4, and Season 6 is Season 5. And furthermore, there are some fans, for a reason that I cannot understand, who think that Season 4 and Season 5 are also one season, which means if you follow that logic, then iCarly only has four seasons, and that doesn't feel right. And so I just want to say that um, I've noticed this discrepancy, and that I've made the personal choice to consider these next episodes Season 3 for a lot of reasons. First of all, they were aired that way. Second of all, Season 2 and Season 3 have different title sequences, so they're clearly not the same season. But third of all, Seasons 2 and 3 of iCarly span such a huge chunk of my childhood. You know, when Season 2 started, I was in the 6th grade. When Season 3 ended, I was in the 8th grade. That's almost my whole middle school career. You're not gonna tell me that's all one season. And I don't know, it just feels weird to put the episode where Sam and Freddy kiss and the episode where Carly and Freddy kiss in the same season, because, like, those were totally different events. You had to wait for those two things. Of course, those are different seasons of the show. But anyways, the point of this intermission, believe it or not, is not for me to rant about the inconsistency of iCarly episode numberings, but instead to talk about iCarly merchandise. Uh, my other camcorder died and I forgot to pack the charger so I had to switch to my backup. Uh, so, uh, yeah, at this point we're gonna- I'm gonna show off some iCarly merchandise that I bought. There's two main things that we're not going to be looking at. The first thing is the Happy Meal toys, because the Happy Meal toys are kind of later in the timeline and a lot of them are based on inside jokes that we haven't talked about yet, so it doesn't really make sense for us to look and analyze the Happy Meal toys as if we understand what they mean. And the second thing we're not going to look at, sadly, is the iCarly video games. I really wanted to do a tangent in, in one of these videos where I just reviewed all of the iCarly video games, but it's become quickly apparent that I do not have time to actually sit down and play through all of these. But I've considered making that like a separate video after the miniseries is done, like if people want that. I feel like I'm hardly Scott the Was, you know what I mean? I don't know if people want video game content from me, so if I do it, maybe it'll be a second channel thing, unless people like really want it on the main channel. I do want to quickly highlight some iCarly video game stuff, starting off some of the video game accessories they released, like this iCarly Wii Nunchuck or um, the iCarly DS case and the iCarly DS accessory set. And you know, there's something magical about this. There's something magical about a parent going out to buy their kid DS accessories and they go with the iCarly set. And imagine being the only kid on your block who has an iCarly themed DS. I bought this iCarly lunchbox exclusively because I thought this image was going to be the thumbnail and I needed a good scan of it, but then I went in a different direction. These are iCarly Christmas tree ornaments. One of them is Carly, one of them is Sam. This is the iCarly umbrella. It has Miranda Cosgrove's face on it. Uh, everywhere, you know, you can't, you can't escape. So many iCarly hats, so many iCarly hats. I was trying to get all of them just to show them off, but eventually had to stop myself, because I was like, you're never gonna film yourself wearing all of these. Because look, this is the purple one I wore in the intro, right? Then there's like a black one, right? That just says iCarly and it has beads. Then there's like a different one that's white and has Miranda Cosgrove. Then there's a blue one, right? Right, blue one with her face. Here we got another purple one. Then we got another black one, again, completely different from the other black one. And then these are, these are like, you know, winter wear, you know? And then this one has ALF. Here's where we get into interesting territory. There were a bunch of like iCarly Barbie doll knockoffs that, um, are really rare and it's kind of hard to get them. And when you get them, you understand why they're rare, because they suck. This is an iCarly satchel, uh, pretty self-explanatory. They released a little statue of the bottle robot that has a bunch of genders on the back. Uh, girl, boy, tech, alien. I don't know what that means, but, the, but those are the four genders, as we all know. Most of the stuff we've just talked about, in my opinion, is boring as hell, but this is kind of interesting. They at one point released little customizable dolls of the iCarly cast. So what's interesting to me is they actually ended up releasing like a little miniature playset of the iCarly set. And so you can take these figures and you can build like a little tiny version of the iCarly set. And in my opinion, this is one of the only things they put out with this franchise that's even worth highlighting. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff that was probably just like a list of not interesting facts. But um, I do want to talk about something that I, in my opinion, is one of the most interesting aspects of iCarly. And that is the active attempt to market to people's desires to become internet famous. First of all, let's talk about iCarly cameras. We have the iCarly mini web camera, and then the iCarly digital photograph camera. 
And then we have the iCarly digital video camera and the iCarly microphone. I mean, these were marketed to kids explicitly as if they could use these tools to record videos and upload them online and become as famous as the characters in the sitcom. Again, I cannot overstate it. This was an attempt to appeal to the fantasy of becoming web famous. I mean, they wanted you to create web content and use their crap to do it. Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Testing, testing. One, two. I am recording. I'm recording right now with an official iCarly camcorder and an official iCarly microphone. You know, you know, we got the best quality that you could ask for in iCarly research. The iCarly camcorder and the iCarly microphone. Now let me tell you something. Do you know what's a sign? of a good camcorder when you have to go to the store to get AAA batteries because that's what it runs on do you know what's a sign of a good camcorder when you put the video into your timeline and it, it looks like this and you gotta stretch it out that's how you know you got a good camcorder ladies and gentlemen do you know how you got a, do you know how you know you got a good microphone it, it sometimes just goes to static if you just wiggle it around too much it's like just gone that's how you know you got a good a good camcorder and a good microphone you know in the wake of this of this iCarly reboot that I didn't ask for and in the wake of you know the fact that iCarly is trending on Twitter every day and Gibby will trend for four days in a row while I'm working on this video I've been stressed out a lot and it's been really stressful knowing that I'm not going to be the only person doing what I'm doing right now. But let me ask you this, ladies and gentlemen. How many YouTubers out there made their quickie iCarly content with an iCarly camcorder and an iCarly microphone? One motherfucker, that's who. Do you want to say hi, Bum Bum? Alright, this sucks. I'm switching back. There's something so nostalgic about when you take one of these old camcorders and you stick an SD card in it and it goes, WARNING! ONLY 12 HOURS OF RECORDING SPACE LEFT! So when I was shooting that segment, I basically just ripped open the camcorder box and kind of threw it around. And when I was done shooting, I went to, you know, clean up the area. And I found something that I hadn't noticed before, which I think maybe fell out of the camcorder box. And that's this DVD. This is an iCarly DVD. I have no idea what it is. I don't remember if I bought this or if it came with the camcorder. So we're just gonna stick it in the laptop and see what happens. Hey, I'm Carly driving a teeny SUV. I'm Sam in a tiny all-terrain vehicle. We do a cool little web show called iCarly. So we were thinking. Then maybe you might be thinking. Hey, how can I make my own web show? You know, like we do. Holy shit. So Sam and I are gonna tell you how. We're gonna teach you everything you need to know. But not everything we know. We know things you're not ready to know. This is everything I've ever wanted. Please tell me how to make a web show. I wanna know so bad. Okay, before you make your own web show, you gotta pick a theme. A theme means you gotta decide what your web show is about. Like ours is about doing funny, silly, cool stuff. But a web show can be about anything. For example, do you like dogs? Then here's an idea. Do a web show that's all about dogs. Then your theme would be dogs. dogs. Woof, woof. Okay, what about this as a theme? What about a guy straight out of high school who has nothing going on, nothing in his life that's happening? And so he starts uploading videos entirely because he has nothing else he could be doing. But every time he uploads a video, he loses a little bit more of his sanity until one day he's sitting in his parents' basement surrounded by iCarly merchandise talking to stock footage of two 16-year-olds from 2008 like they can really hear him. You want to know about rehearsing? Rehearsing! I just said rehearsing. I apologize for repeating it unnecessarily. Rehearsing is just a fancy name. A theatrical name for practicing. I love that this segment is about how you should always rehearse these things. And you can tell that Miranda is reading from a cue card that she has never read before. You know what I mean? She's saying it with that cadence where she's just, it's just words to her. I just said rehearsing. Hi, I'm Carly. 
And my name is Sam. We do a web show. We... Boring! And why was it boring? Cuz... We were talking like this. Who wants to watch a show where people talk like this? I know I don't. This is Phelous Slander. Get excited! That's it. I've learned nothing. Apparently one of the things on this DVD is like Freddy explaining how to do a web show from a technical angle. And it's, it's really weird, he like starts acting out the characters in like a weird puppet show thing, because apparently the joke is he was the only person who showed up to do this part of the DVD. I'm Sam, and I have a confession to make. You know how I can come off as a psychotic bully at times? Well, there's a reason for that. I was raised by a pack of mutant wolf bears who were placed on planet Earth by evil aliens from another galaxy. So, as a mutant wolf bear with world obliterating intentions, I can get a little moody. Woo! I'm glad I got that off my hairy wolf bear chest. I don't know, when, once we get past the weird stuff, maybe Freddy at least gives me some, like, technical tips, you know? As an experienced technical producer, I've found that it's best to position your star six to ten feet behind the set. To measure six feet, you could ask a six-foot adult to lie down on the floor. Six to ten feet behind the set. I'm a web star! Yay! What I think I love about this video is usually when I work on content, I'm so carefully meticulous, you know what I mean? Like I'm planning everything out in stages and I'm sending all my scripts to people all the time just to be like, is this working? Is this good? Are you interested in this? Is every single one of these jokes funny? You know, um, is this gonna get me canceled? Just trying to be really, really careful with everything. But I've realized while working on this video that this is going to be so impossibly large that it doesn't matter if every single joke lands with every single person because no one's going to watch this far. Okay, so believe it or not, 15 minutes into this intermission and we are still not done because there is still one very important topic that we haven't even started to talk about. But trust me when I say that this is very much worth it. In fact, in my opinion, what we're about to talk about is so essential to understanding what iCarly was that I would say it's equally as important as analyzing one of the main seasons. In my last video, I talked about Lucas Cruikshank and his creation, Fred, mainly focusing on the turbulent affair of taking that little YouTube show designed to work on the internet and eventually adapting it into something that worked as a Nickelodeon sitcom. And now at this point in this video, I would like to cover the direct opposite. What happens when you take a Nickelodeon sitcom designed to work on TV and try and adapt it into material meant only for the internet? Well then why does my head? Oh, I'm getting a text. Who's it from? It's from your mother. What does it say? It says, Gibby, hit Spencer over the head with the stop sign. That's weird. Why would she tell me to do that? <laughs> As many of you have probably figured out by now, at this point in the video, I want to discuss the completely real iCarly web show, hosted on the once real iCarly.com. As we've mentioned in the past, iCarly.com featured a ton of content in reference to the show, which was basically intended to advertise the sitcom and to also supply supplementary material. This is where I've been pulling a lot of the blogs that I've been showing throughout this video, and it's also where a couple iCarly video games were once hosted. However, the biggest appeal of the iCarly website was the exclusive videos, and obviously that's the main thing that people went to it for. The iCarly sitcom was all about them creating internet content that was supposed to be the best stuff in the world. And so when the show would tell you that iCarly.com was real and that you should go visit, video content is what you were expecting. Now, I was really disappointed to find out that there isn't a very good archive of iCarly.com videos. 
I kind of expected that if I went to YouTube and typed in the right keywords that there would just be like a half an hour upload of all of them in the right order, but not only could I not find that, but I couldn't even find a list of every single video that was once uploaded to the site. Things are made worse when you realize that the video tab on iCarly.com was one of the things that way back almost never archived, so there's not really a lot of good final screenshots of that page. Luckily, however, I did find pretty much all of the videos that I remember and I wanted to see again, and there's still a few gaps in here, but by the end of the segment, I think you guys will get the gist. Also, while I could find a good amount of these videos, some of them I couldn't find in very high quality, so while some of the stuff we're about to look at is like crystal clear HD, a lot of it's gonna be like unregistered hypercam 2, you know what I mean? But anyways, yeah, let's talk about this. <laughs> so in its earliest form, iCarly.com was mainly used to upload clips from the show and various extra material which still made sense in universe. For instance, when the show featured a storyline where Freddy autocorrects a boy that Carly has a crush on so that his singing isn't bad, Freddy later uploads the original audio where he still sounds terrible. However, eventually, unique skits featuring the actors in character started to be uploaded to the site. The earliest of these were a short series of skits featuring the characters doing spit takes to various situations and jokes. But that's not apple juice. It's hamster pee. I'm just kidding ya. Oh. Well then I'll have another sip now. It's hamster pee. A quick note, the Kevin McLeod music loudly playing over that clip is not supposed to be there. That was just literally the only copy I could find. But yeah, you can probably get the gist from here. A couple times a month on iCarly.com, exclusive content and skits would be uploaded, featuring the characters doing something mildly in character, but still relatively low budget. For instance, hey, what am I leaking? Hey, what am I sitting on? and I smash it. All featuring Spencer being forced to lick, sit on, or smash various things. Then there was Random Debates, a debate show where three characters from iCarly would be given three random topics, and they would argue over which one was the most important or cool. This of course later evolved into three-way random debates. Three-way. Three-way. Three-way three random debate. debate. I'm Sam, and I'm all about cheese. I'm Spencer, I'm gonna tell you why ointment is number one. Global warming is super important. Now, if you actually went out of your way to visit iCarly.com back in the day, one of the first things you probably noticed was that Miranda Cosgrove, AKA Carly, almost never did these videos. There was a brief string of videos in I think 2009 that did actually feature Miranda as Carly, but those always felt kind of low-key, like it was something they just casually did one day after they finished rapping, and they convinced her to do it for a week, and then she went back to not doing it. Outside of these few contradictions, the general rule of iCarly.com was that if a skit or piece of content had any kind of quality or effort put into it, Miranda was never involved. This had positives and negatives to the content. The negatives are that as a kid, it felt like kind of a ripoff that Carly wasn't in the iCarly web show. The positives are that because there was this big vacancy in the cast, a lot of fan favorite smaller characters ended up getting extra material in these online skits. For instance, Spencer, Gibby, and later on, Tebow. I gotta start hanging out with people my own age. I think this is one of the many reasons that some of those characters ended up getting so much extra material in later seasons, because they really did prove that they were capable of carrying whole scenes. What's Gibby thinking about? When I grow up, maybe I can be a social worker. Yeah, that'd be sweet. But the negatives to this were that sometimes Carly and Sam would be replaced with... some guy? Good heavens! Why must you always make me angry whilst I drink my chamomile tea? Um, father, I believe your tea is pronounced chamomile. This is an outrage! Please, father. Don't be cross with us. We only want to be loved. We yearn for your love. What father would love two hobnockers like you? 
This is Andy McSteen, one of the strangest characters in the extended iCarly universe. Andy McSteen is an actor inside the iCarly universe, played by the real-world actor Andrew Hill Newman, who is also a writer on the iCarly program. Andrew Hill Newman also plays the eccentric science teacher at Ridgeway, and he was the voice of George the Bra, but this character is like an exclusive element to the universe that you would only find on the iCarly website. McSteen basically existed for whenever Jeanette McCurdy was too busy to play Sam for an internet exclusive skit. The entire bit was that as an actor, he would replace Sam, and no one would notice because they look identical. I distinctly remember as a kid watching some of these videos and getting the vibe that the iCarly web show in the real world is so much funnier than the iCarly web show in the iCarly sitcom. Like, a lot of these videos really did pick up on that late 2000s, early 2010s weird internet surrealism that the show never properly understood. Cell phones are so important. Okay, cell phones are nothing compared to the wonders of barbecue sauce. I like ladies. Yeah. There's nothing like a lady in a pickup truck on a hot summer's day. Just sitting in her pickup truck, holding a toothpick. Just picking at her teeth, trying to dig out a tiny, teeny little piece of shrimp. Okay! I don't like doing this with him. Well, Freddy's not here. In my opinion, the peak of iCarly.com exclusive material happened in late 2008, when a string of fantastic videos featuring Spencer, Freddy, and Sam were uploaded to the website. And the best of the best was iDriveThru, the best video and the best miniseries ever uploaded to the iCarly.com website. Carly's recording the action as we all head to... Inside Outside! But not because we're hungry. No, sir, we are just bored. <laughs> what? Mr. Honker Man, hey! Here's something for you! In every video in this little series, Spencer, Freddy, and Sam would drive to Inside Out Burger, pull up to the speaker, and then try to prank the guy inside by doing something funny or random. Hi, what do you want? I think I'll have a double trouble with cheese and a large... A, a large what? Well, you know, just a large... <laughs> And this isn't something they do once or twice or just casually on some weekend. This is a consistent thing that the iCarly characters do for several years in a row. We don't want food. Uh, no. We just want to give the drive through dude a nervous breakdown. Nervous oh, breakdown. Yeah. But to me, the spiritual finale to the series was always the cathartic episode where the dude actually comes out and confronts them. All right, what do you guys want? When I started looking into these, I was really surprised by the amount of meme material that actually originated from the web-exclusive content. Like, what's Gibby thinking about, or the stop sign meme. Both of those things I presumed I would find in the iCarly show when I started binging it, but instead, it was all part of some weird side project that people have forgotten about. And it really makes me wonder how much of the public perception of what the iCarly web show was is driven by this material that we remember going out and finding as kids. For instance, I've seen a lot of people make jokes about how Carly didn't contribute enough to the iCarly web show for her name to be in the title, and that it should have been called I Sam or I Freddy. And that is certainly not true within the fictional context of the iCarly sitcom but within the context of the material hosted on iCarly.com, it's definitely true, because Carly literally didn't do anything. She's not in any of the skits. But out of all the stuff that iCarly.com hosted, out of all the material that it ended up contributing to the universe and the public perception of that universe, the most famous and the most infamous thing was Baby Spencer. Disclaimer. 
this shit's about to get really weird, and then I'm gonna move on like it wasn't weird at all. Now, Baby Spencer is a skit where Spencer is kind of tied up in this baby costume, and he controls this little puppet, and the other actors on set force-feed him really gross food and refuse to stop when he asks. Come on. They don't like it! They don't like it! Do what they say! Oh. Oh. Now, the question worth asking at this point, even though it's probably going to hurt me to try and find a way to say this, is, are the iCarly.com videos from the real world canon to the iCarly.com webcast from the iCarly universe as seen in the iCarly sitcom? It seems to me that the answer was kind of fluid. At the beginning, it was yes, with an exclamation mark. And then it became, yes, with a question mark? And by the end, it was no, with a period. When you look at, for instance, the skits of the characters going to Inside Out Burger, these feel like essential pieces to the iCarly lore, to the extent that I don't know how I would explain to someone why I used to love these characters without showing them some of these skits. But then you get into the era where they were doing, like, segments where Neville would come on to do a show on iCarly.com, and then the other characters would prank him, and it's like, why would they invite Neville to Carly's apartment? Like, it's not a communal bath. It's not like anyone can get in. They probably wouldn't want him in her apartment. And then by the end, they were doing, like, weekly crossover videos with Victorious, and it became so detached from the iCarly sitcom that they would just break character like it didn't matter at all. Hey, is Rex in character? Are, are we supposed to be in character? All I know is I thought by now they would have spun off Spencer and given me my own show. What are we talking about? Am I Gibby or Noah? I should start my own show. Hi. And this kind of foreshadows a theme that we're going to have to inevitably cover in the future. And that is that as the writers of iCarly got further and further away from 2007, they started to really lose their confidence in their ability to write about the internet. And so the iCarly sitcom started to cover the web show less and less and started to focus on more things like what was going on at school and what Gibby was up to, you know, that kind of thing. And because of that, the web show became something that was taken less seriously both in the show and in the real world. But with that, we have now finished the longest intermission in the history of intermissions. Which probably means that it's about time for us to start discussing Season 3, The End of the Golden Age of iCarly. I mean, we could always talk about the novelizations, or the annuals from the final few years, or, or what about iCarly charades? I mean, imagine trying to play a game like this with people who have never even seen iCarly. I mean, it's just... it's just too much. And I know that it's probably time for us to move on. This is gonna sound stupid, but do you ever dread having a good time? because you know what comes after that is going to feel so much worse in comparison. Anyways, I guess all that's left to say is, um, I'll see you on the other side. Here's the first thing you arguably need to know about iCarly Season 3. It very easily could have been the last season of the show. Not because there was any dip in popularity, far from it, but because at that point in Nickelodeon history, three to four seasons was the standard for even the most popular live-action sitcoms. And that made sense. These shows were usually set in a school setting, either middle school or high school. So three to four years was basically the maximum length they could go on for before people started to ask questions. And furthermore, there was always a short window of time for teen sitcoms to remain marketable. Because teenagers, fun fact, eventually become 
adults who don't watch Nickelodeon anymore. And perhaps because of this, Season 3 is packed full of massive event stories which were heavily advertised and tend to focus on a lot of character-driven drama. One thing I remember really pissing me off at the time was they'd air these commercials for episodes that had some really funny or notable moments, and then you'd watch the episode and it just wouldn't be there. It always felt so cheap, like were they filming scenes just for the TV trailers? Were they that low? Nowadays the understanding is that the trailers often just use deleted scenes, but I still think that it's a pretty lame thing that they did. The reason I'm bringing this up is that while for seasons 1 and 2, I typically caught most of the episodes in reruns, kind of in a random order depending on what was on after school. With iCarly season 3, I saw most of these episodes the day they originally aired, and when they came out in the season order, thus feels much more important. Talking about the Bigfoot episode, and then the episode where Freddy and Carly date, and then the school dance episode, would just feel so very wrong. Talking about these stories almost in broadcast order also means that I can write and record intermediately, which means I can get the video out much faster, because my goal at this point is to have something out by the time of the revival. Hope this all makes sense. I think the most notable aspect of Season 3 was its sudden milking of one of the most essential pieces to the iCarly show since its beginning. Shipping culture. Basically, from the day that the pilot was shot, iCarly was trying very hard to get you invested in some kind of relationship pairing in the cast. So either Sam and Freddy, aka Seti, or Sam and Carly, aka Creddy. Back in 2018, I made a Fallen Titans where I talked about iCarly for like half of the runtime. I think that video is bad, and this year I've been kind of stripping it down for parts, but I do want to steal one really funny joke from it real quick. I now officially support Frappy. It's the ship where Freddy moves to a different town and gets better friends. That's such a good bit. I realized while working on this that it's weird that Seti and Creddy are the ship names that stuck, when we really could have gone with the vastly superior Fram and Farley. Think about it. Fram sounds like Spam, which obviously Sam would probably love eating, and Farley reminds me of Chris Farley. A man so funny, even photos of him make you feel good. But the names are stuck, so there's nothing I can do. Anyways, my point is that building off of these ships and stretching them out as long as possible was the basis for quite a few episodes in this season. And starting us off is the sequel to I Kiss, Season 3, Episode 1, I Think They Kissed. In the story, Carly is tasked with taking Sam to the dentist and making sure she goes through with it and isn't violent. Sam gets hopped up on nitrous oxide and begins speaking to Carly while she's not clear of mind, even briefly believing that her thumb is missing. Suddenly, without prompt, she makes an admission. Me and Freddy kissed! As Carly begins to freak out to this shocking news, Sam suddenly adds, don't tell Carly. When you watch all of these episodes in a row, binging through them in a few nights, the impact of this story doesn't hit you quite right. But being there, seeing that kiss go down, and feeling the anxiety of it needing to remain a secret lest it rip the trio apart, that made the story a must-see episode, while today it's basically something you can read the title and skip. This episode is actually considered a Creddy or Farley episode by most fans, because the way that it was marketed was to imply that Carly was mad at the idea of Freddy with another girl. But in the actual episode, of course, her actual anxiety draws from the fact that she's been told a secret she's not supposed to know, while not being sure why it was kept from her. Again, playing into Miranda's strengths as portraying a human-shaped bundle of anxiety. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, Spencer begins teaching an art class at a local prison, where it goes poorly when one of the inmates tries to murder him numerous times. But who gives a shit about that? Carly tries to confront Freddy about what Sam said, but when he tries to evade, she tackles him to the ground to try and force him to answer the question. There's this joke in Season 1 where Carly and Sam are both constantly able to tackle Freddy and hold him to the ground against his will because he's so tiny. But the payoff in this episode is that he easily turns around and does it to her instead. Whoa! Where did 
did you get so strong? Same time the voice got lower. But yeah, it's a weird moment if you don't go in with that context. Freddy explains that it's all true, but makes Carly promise that she won't bring it up to Sam because if she finds out he talked about it, she'll kick me in places that should never be kicked. Meanwhile, Spencer and his prison students build a massive pair of pants and a few of the prisoners hide inside while he's in another room. Spencer is apparently the strongest man in the world because he brings the pants home and in his own words, drags it upstairs. Meaning he pulled the weight of two fully bodied adults up to his apartment all on his own. The trio have a confrontation and discussion about the kiss, at the same time that the prisoners break out of the pants, tying them up in the apartment. Forced to work things out, they all agree to never keep secrets, promising Carly that they'll tell her anything. You'll tell me everything? Yeah, I swear. How long was it? <laughs> what? Spencer runs back in, but is so distracted by trying to bang a girl he met who likes banjo music that he doesn't even notice the kids are tied up. To be fair though, these three are basically YouTubers. I imagine this isn't the weirdest thing he's walked in on. In episode two, the iCarly gang do a tribute to their favorite network, Food TV, a parody of the Food Network. In the segment, they speak about their favorite chef, Ricky Flames, who challenges people to sporadic cooking competitions. And they then show off Spencer's special recipe, spaghetti tacos. The next day, Spencer runs into the trio of school to announce that Food TV got in contact with him about the iCarly webcast, and that they want to feature iCarly in an episode of the show. Carly says that since it's Spencer's recipe, he deserves credit, but Spencer says that growing iCarly.com is much more important. Before he electrocutes himself because Sam hooked up a security system to her locker, Spencer runs off, having seen a vision in his electrocuted state, which he's convinced showed him the future. And later on, Food TV arrives to film a segment on iCarly. So tell me about these spaghetti tacos. I'm Freddie Benson. <laughs> But it turns out that they are actually on Ricky Flames' show and are challenged to a food fight as Freddy makes a pog face. They have the competition downstairs and things are fierce, but the iCarly gang somehow win. A shocking outcome considering that Ricky Flames has never lost a cooking competition in his entire life. This causes him to have a physical and mental breakdown, as this is truly a level of defeat that he has never experienced before. After he quits his show and becomes bedridden with depression, the gang try to force him to remember how he loves cooking and what it felt like to be a winner. Later on, he sends them a V-mail, saying that thanks to them, he now does remember that winning was what kept him going, and he's found the one place where he can always win. A community wrestling league where Ricky wrestles children. Oh my god, this scene has implications that I didn't notice when I was 13. Ricky even forces Carly to wrestle him while she's screaming no, and says that finally, no one can beat him. Sam kicks his ass, proving him wrong, and he's left an empty shell of a man once more but this time the gang doesn't seem to care very much. Moving on, season three, episode three is perhaps the quintessential iCarly episode because it's 98% filler not worth talking about and 2% scenes that everyone would be talking about at school the next day. In the story, Carly has trouble finding a date to her school's Sadie Hawkins dance, and Sam ties her up live on their web show and announces that any teenage boys in Seattle should enter for a chance to go on a date with Carly. However, close to 50 boys end up showing up at the Groovy Smoothie, and the gang do a series of speed dating rounds to see which boy she ends up liking the best. She ends up picking a boy who's rather talkative and charismatic, and Freddy ends up with the only girl in school who asked him and no one else. Freddy and Carly have a miserable night, but after their dates leave early, they decide there's still time for one last dance, which they share in the empty restaurant. Sam enters, having been abandoned by the guy she wanted to go to the dance with, only to feel stunned as she leaves right away. Have you picked up on that weird ambiguity where each girl maybe has feelings for Freddy which materialize in a lack of comfort with him being with the other person in the group, but that it also might just be awkwardness about social boundaries and a closely knit friend group? Yeah, I cannot overstate this. This is the reason we watch the show. Season 3 episode 4 is called I Carly Awards and we're gonna skip this one for now. Episode 5 is called I Have My Principles and it's a high school episode which means that it's almost worth skipping entirely. But one interesting detail is that the story features Mindy Sterling returning as Miss Briggs who you'll recall was a recurring character in season one who appeared almost as often as the school did. 
This is a big example of why it felt kinda sad to go from season 1 to season 2, because it's always a shame when a recurring character who builds a sense of normalcy suddenly shows up so rarely that it's a spectacle when they do. After this story, I believe she has one more appearance in the season, and then she's completely missing until the final season. In the story, Ridgway's regular principal, Mr. Franklin, makes a brief appearance on iCarly to wish his daughter a happy birthday. This episode breaks iCarly records as it's viewed by the most people ever, with 900,000 viewers tuning in. Which... That's not the number you said in season one! However, Franklin is fired by the superintendent because of the web show, and Miss Briggs and Mr. Howard are selected as temporary co-principals, leading to the school becoming an authoritarian police state with an enforced dress code and immediate punishment for speaking out against the administration. The students organize a revolution, locking the principals in the closet, going crazy, and putting the superintendent on a mechanical bull. Seeing how Franklin is able to control the students through their respect for him, the superintendent gives him his job back, and all is well. The thing about episodes set entirely at school is that they feel kind of non-specific to iCarly. This is a phenomenon you notice a lot in these gimmick shows. As an example, Hannah Montana, Cory in the House, and iCarly are all super different programs, right? Hannah's about a teenager who's secretly a pop star, Cory is about a teenager who's best friends with the President of the United States, iCarly is about teenagers who become web famous and run an internet show. But despite this, whenever one of these shows does an episode that's set entirely at the school, they're basically interchangeable scripts. I'm not saying that iCarly episodes set at school aren't fun, it's just that they aren't what made iCarly different. With that, it's time for a little bit of a special moment in the analysis. Throughout this analysis, I've occasionally told you guys that we'll be skipping various characters or episodes because it's better to save them for later. Well, by the end of Season 3, I intend to circle back around and talk about every single story that we've missed. And starting us off is a little character who we've only managed to mention once or twice, despite the fact that many would argue that he represents a huge part of the show's legacy. And I think you guys all know exactly who I'm talking about. Lubert. Y'all remember Lubert, the disgruntled lobby employee who becomes the target of the gang's pranks and ridicule on the viral web? It's been a while since we talked about this guy all the way back in season one, which for me was several months ago, but for you guys it was probably just like 15 minutes or an hour or something. I have no scale for how long this video is going to be. Now, here's the thing about Lubert. He exists only to be someone who is the target of the cast's constant harassment. And from the start, the show tries really hard to justify why it's okay that they do this. But the way the show does it doesn't really work, in my opinion. Basically, the show's logic is Lubert is a bad person, thus it's okay when bad things happen to him. But it then extends this to say Lubert is a bad person, thus it's funny when bad things happened in his past. Let me give you a great example. Do you remember the iCarly.com character blogs, which existed to tie into the show and were sometimes advertised at the end of the program? Well, at one point early on, the website posted a blog from Spencer, saying that he had gotten in contact with Lubert's mom to learn more about his origins, and that she had sent him a very interesting email containing stories about him. Lubert's mother then basically takes over the blog post, pretty much using it to brag about all the ways that she has been an abusive parent. Dear people of iCarly, Shut up! I ain't seen Lubert in over two years! Who gave you people my email address? I hate mayonnaise, and I'm glad Lubin moved out of my house two years ago. You don't got no idea what a pain in the butt it is having your 38-year-old son living in your dang closet. You think Lubin's normal? He ain't. You want to know some stuff Luby did as a kid? Here's a list. When he was five, Lubin picked his nose with a fork. When he was seven, he bit off one of his toes. When he was nine, he had a birthday party, but nobody showed up. I left my butt off! Ha! When he was 30, I accidentally slammed my car door on his tongue. I left him there for two hours! Ha! He couldn't even call for help because his tongue was squished in the car door! Ha ha ha! When he was 35, he won $7 million in the state lottery, so I flushed his winning ticket down the toilet! Then I said, tough luck, Lubert! He cried like a baby duck! LOL! So anyway, I don't know where Lubert is. Now shut up! Best regards. 
Lupert's mom. And when you see stuff like this in spinoff media and even in the show, it feels hard not to feel bad for this dude who was just constantly abused by people in his life until he became an asocial aloof being bullied by a new group of people finding his pain amusing. And the way the show tries to justify this is to say, well, Lubert's a bad person now, so it's funny and okay. But Lubert being a dick to a couple of self-righteous 8th graders does not justify his mother literally hating him since he was born and taking joy in sharing his lifelong suffering with millions of people on the internet. Anyways, let's hop back a bit to Season 2, Episode 4, I Hurt Lubert. In the story, the iCarly gang play a prank on Lubert where they set out a basket of muffins and when he picks one up, it's supposed to spray confetti in his face. However, due to a technical error, it actually explodes. This sends Luber to the hospital, and he comes back, covered in casts. Spencer takes over his job at the front desk, and the iCarly gang try to take care of him as an apology for nearly killing him. However, they accidentally drop a ceiling fan on him, and soon enough, Freddy's mother takes to helping nurse Lubert back to health. Freddy is horrified when he pieces together that his mother and Lubert are dating, and they try to find a way to get her to break up with him. Eventually, they have Freddy trip down the staircase to the lobby, and as Lubert dismisses her worry about him, she ends things immediately. Once he's well enough to take back his position, Spencer says that he's organized Lubert's messages into... From your mother, death threats, and death threats from your mother. The episode ends with furious truckers entering the building and violently assaulting Lubert, presumably breaking his body for a third time. This brings us back to Season 3, as Episode 6 is a full-out exploration of Lubert's origin and trauma. In the story, the iCarly gang decide to prank Lubert by hiding golf balls in one of his office cabinets, so that when he opens it, they'll all fall out and he'll trip and fall over them, causing him great annoyance. While Sam is in his office, she steals a box of his personal items, as the gang go through all of the contents, learning everything about Lubert's past and upbringing. For instance, a photo of when he was seven and was run over by a car while riding a bicycle, and his portfolio from when he was a male model. They then find a romantic CD from a former girlfriend, and after playing it, decide to reunite him with his former partner. However, the moment Lubert sees this woman, he screams for her to get out, while the iCarly cast presume that he's being unreasonable because, well, it's Lubert. Lubert sucks. But it immediately comes across as if what Lubert feels is not hatred, but unfiltered fear. Oh God! Get Lubert says that he didn't move across the country, change his last name, and find a quiet, reclusive, rundown job for fun, and that the reason is that his ex was extremely persistent and abusive, something we see for ourselves when the iCarly gang used their hidden cameras to spy on the couple, as behind closed doors, she's extremely emotionally and physically abusive. Who gives haircuts by force? I don't know, but if this was a real TV show, it'd be more popular than anything on NBC. Eventually, things get so bad with Lubert's ex that he slaps a police officer on purpose so he'll go to prison for six months, because being in jail is a better option for him than being anywhere near her. Oh boy, I can't wait for him to get out so the iCarly gang can do something else funny, like, like kill his dog. <laughs> Let's jump back into the rhythm of things with Season 3, Episode 7, I Move Out. In the story, Freddy's mother barges onto the web show and forces him to finish eating his asparagus from dinner causing that clip to become a viral meme as he's bullied at school. Freddy decides he's had enough and announces that he's moving out. On the same web show, they make over Gibby's dog and take photos of it. And these too go viral, as kids at school begin hiring them to do decorative photo shoots of their pets. However, in doing so, they've challenged a timeless Seattle monopoly, as there is only one pet photography business in Seattle and they declare a turf war on iCarly.com. The Twink Twins break into the Shea household in the middle of the night and trash the iCarly set. They call the police, but we learn that the entire force is corrupt. As Officer Carl explains that the hipster duo take photos of cop pets for free, and he thus refuses to do anything about it. 
Since they're not protected by the law, the group decides to break into the studio of the other pet company and trash it as well. Carly has second thoughts, and through a wacky, uncharacteristic series of events, Sam ends up kidnapping their cat. And they blackmail the pair into coming and fixing their set, or else they'll shave the cat to the skin. Meanwhile, Freddy finds his apartment to be a difficult living situation. And once his mother finds it unbearable for him to be on his own, they move back in together. The trio get their studio back, their rivals get their cat back, and I'm tired of saying sentences like this. And as we move on to episode 8, we also move on to the season's first big event story. I quit, I Carly. If you watched Nick at the time, you knew this was airing. Because this was one of those episodes that they advertised like it was the second coming of Christ. So let's go ahead and figure out if it's holy or filled with holes. In the story, an extended episode, Carly and Sam are sent in a really funny sketch by two local friends, Fleck and Dave, who make web content together. Excited over the material, they invite them on iCarly, and their sketch goes over very well. However, Fleck and Dave have a falling out after Fleck paints Dave's father's car purple, with no plans on how to get the paint off. After an argument, they insist that they'll never speak to each other again. Carly insists to Sam that they need to try and mend the open wound left between the two boys, but it becomes clear that Fleck and Dave are just not compatible. Dave is responsible, reserved, and careful, and Fleck is flippant, prone to violent tendencies, and even known to physically hurt Dave in the hunt for a funny punchline. As you can probably guess, each girl ends up relating to the opposite person. Sam loving Fleck's reckless disinterest in not catching people on fire, and Carly feeling alarm at the story that Dave has literally been caught on fire by his comedic partner. Meanwhile, Spencer wins a boat. Classic Spencer. Getting in the middle of Fleck and Dave's conflict accidentally makes Sam and Carly realize that they're frustrated with each other as well. Carly hates that Sam isn't on time, doesn't put the work into why Carly, and is violent to Freddy. Actually, she doesn't say that last thing, but I imagine she was thinking it. And Sam hates that Carly isn't creatively sporadic and doesn't respect all of the work that she puts into iCarly. It might be nice if you showed a tiny bit of appreciation for the work I do to make iCarly happen. More appreciation? You already named the show after yourself. Later at the Groovy Smoothie, Carly and Freddy talk about the drama and the stress of best friends changing. Tebow walks up to her and says, My best friend changed too. He got hit by a bus and died. And then he walks off. I love this character. Carly and Dave have decided to enter the same web competition as a pair. And at that exact same moment, Sam and Fleck enter, apparently having come up with the same idea. Tebow! What? We want a table as far away from them as possible. Have I ever cared where you sit? At the groovy smoothie, their fight turns ugly when Sam throws a muffin into Carly's face, and Carly accidentally throws it back at an old lady. Afterwards, Carly announces that Sam is banned from their household. They try to do the show remotely, but they experience technical glitches, and in the middle of the stream, they both decide it's time to end it. Freddy says that they've never quit a webcast in the middle of it airing, which that's definitely not true, Freddy. Season 1, episode 17, you idiot. But Carly says that she means quit iCarly, and Sam agrees, as they both decide to end the web show. Man, there's some crazy stuff going on over at Spencer's boat right now. The next day, Sam and Carly are both planning on filming new solo work, but both want to use Freddy at the same time, and they begin fighting over who gets to keep him as technical producer. They wrote this bit exclusively so they could put this clip into the trailers. I have as much of a right to Freddy as you. You do not. Freddy loves me. <laughs> Do you understand why something like that would be annoying if you were a kid? Sam and Carly end up on a window washer's platform. I could explain how this happened, but does it really matter? The platform suddenly breaks and Carly is left dangling eight floors from the pavement below. Spencer's got a slingshot and a bunch of watermelon. Oh, Spencer! Carly and Sam work together to keep each other safe, and Spencer finishes up his B-plot just in time to send a rope down for the pair. The two begin crying, and the group all reconcile. The four then reunite to make a supposedly hilarious collab, which actually kinda blows. Believe it or not, the next episode of iCarly was also a massive event episode, which shook the foundations of the relationships in the main cast, and was also advertised relentlessly. In 
fact, not only was this the highest viewed premiere for any iCarly episode, but it remains the second highest premiere for any Nickelodeon TV show, being only barely beat out by that episode of Rugrats that was basically like a soft backdoor pilot for All Grown Up. And that episode was the ever iconic I Saved Your Life. Now, for those who weren't there, the reason this was viewed by so many people is that this is the episode where Carly decides that she wants Freddy to be her boyfriend, and they start going out. Now, what's funny is that I don't think that Carly and Freddy were ever the most popular ship, but the idea of this was so surprising that you kind of had to see it go down. I feel like what people always forget about the main two ships between these three cast members is that the most important element was Freddy. Freddy was such a unique character in that era, and I think it's something that everyone really appreciated. Around this point in the history of teen sitcoms, most boyfriend characters were either cartoonish buffoons who didn't come across as real people and were sometimes played by 30-year-olds, or himbos, male bimbos who were pretty to look at but didn't have a lot going on behind the eyes. And so with characters like Freddy, people got invested in them because they were cute while also being human. Sure, Freddy had his weaknesses, he had his limits, but he was also funny and kind, even to Sam usually. You wanted to see him push through it all and find some kind of happiness because he really deserved it. And I think that's why everyone tuned into this episode, not because Carly and Freddy were the most popular ship, but because we all were rooting for Freddy. We all wanted him to find some kind of happiness, even if it was for only one episode and he had to break every bone in his body to do it. With that, let's get into the story. Live on their web show, Carly is dared by a viewer to go into public dressed as a bunny and to offer to brush people's teeth for money. Sam accepts on her behalf and the trio head off. However, partway through the day, Sam comes running back into the apartment with horrible news. While they were filming, Carly was using a crosswalk without paying attention, and a taco truck almost ran her over. But at the last minute, Freddy pushed her out of the way, and now he's in the hospital. Sam is also eating a taco, leading Spencer to deduce that she bought it from the taco truck that ran Freddy over. You know, it's funny, I only saw this episode once as a kid, but I saw the trailer for it like a hundred times, so I totally forgot that a taco truck runs him over, because in my head he'll always be saving Carly from the title card landing right next to them. As Freddy recovers at home, Carly and Spencer come to visit, although his mother is notably enraged over what's happened. It should have been you. While this is all going on, Spencer and Sam are having kind of a paintball war, which is used as an excuse to shoot really cinematic sequences. Man, where have I seen that idea before? At one point in the episode, Gibby identifies a rabbi as Spencer in disguise, causing Sam to shoot him and get detention because it was really just a rabbi. And afterwards, they do a parody of a scene from The Wire where someone gets shot in the head. How my hair look, man? You look good, girl. I'm a hair look, Sam. You look good, Gib. Later on, Carly comes over to look over Freddy again, and his mother leaves to get a prescription for him. Quick disclaimer, a lot of the stuff in this scene is weird, and I'm going to describe all of it in extreme detail. Freddy falls in the shower, and Carly wants to come in to help him up, but Freddy reminds her that he's in the shower, and is thus entirely naked. So she makes a blindfold and puts it on before going in to help him. He puts on a robe while she's carrying him, and brings him to his bed. Even as a kid, I knew that they wrote that one bit just for the shippers. I mean, doesn't that sound like the start to a fan fiction? Anyways, once they get Freddy in bed, Carly says that people are calling him a hero, which he doesn't seem to believe. And then, she says that he's a hero to her, and she leans over and kisses Freddy, as we fade to commercials. We then fade up to see that they're still making out, although they take a break as Freddy is left stunned. What? Freddy then uses a Galaxy Wars branded taser to see if he's awake, and once that he's sure that it's all real, they begin making out again, just as Freddy's mother gets home, before she takes out a pair of Freddy's underwear and begins beating Carly with it. Carly runs into Sam and immediately tells her about what happened, and the two gossip behind closed doors. By the way, I did some math here, 
When Freddy's mom leaves for the pharmacy, she says that she'll be gone 36 minutes, which feels too exact to be an estimate, especially from her. And the time between her leaving and the commercial break is 2 minutes and 49 seconds, and the time between it fading back up on them still kissing and her getting home is 1 minute and 4 seconds, meaning that during the commercial break, they were making out for exactly 32 minutes. And it was only after they stopped that it actually occurred to Freddy what was going on. Yep, this is happening. Freddy is ecstatic to finally be going out with the girl of his dreams, but Sam is rather doubtful, causing Freddy to speculate that she's simply jealous. However, Sam points out that Carly only started liking him when he saved her life from the food truck. She compares it to when a boy at school she hated subscribed her to a Bacon of the Month program, and afterwards she decided that she loved him. In reality, she didn't love him, she loved the bacon that came with him. While they're kissing later, Freddy can't get this out of his head, and says that he can't go forward with the relationship, because he feels as if she likes him because of impure reasons. But I love- You love what I did. You love that I risked my life to save yours, but I don't think you're in love with me. And so, Freddy says that they should take a break until he's all healed up, see how they feel, and if they feel the same way once this is in the past, they can start dating again. In this very mature moment, Freddy enters the elevator and then begins screaming at himself for doing something so absolutely stupid. I didn't register it at the time, but I Saved Your Life basically sets in stone the subtext that Carly and Freddy dating would never be a thing again, at least for the rest of the original series, that is. At the end of the story, Freddy says that they can start dating again when his injuries are healed up and people have forgotten about what he did. But that's basically the next episode, and they're not dating in that one. And indeed, as far as I know, there isn't another story in the rest of the series that was marketed around being a Carly Freddy story. I'm sure they have cutesy moments from here, but this episode is mostly remarkable for being the story where they date, where Freddy decides that it isn't going to work out, and where he breaks up with her. It's basically closure for the crush that he's had since the pilot episode, which becomes much less of a thing starting from here. Because they can basically start dating again whenever they want, so him mentioning that he's in love with her doesn't make sense. And this gives space in the series for his relationship with Sam to be developed in later arcs. But that's a story for another day. In Season 3 Episode 10, we find out that when she was a child, Sam's mother used to force her to enter beauty pageants. On second thought, let's not talk about this one. Skipping that luckily means that we can now move on to a topic which many of you have probably been anticipating. The one, and only, Gibby. Gibby is notable in iCarly history for being one of the few recurring background characters in Season 1 who not only survives to the end of the show, but also becomes a main character on the same level as the main four. And the reason he was elevated so quickly is simply that Noah Monk gives an absolutely standout performance, at least in the stories that I've seen so far. A little bit of context. The iCarly gang are supposed to be 13 years old in season 1 of the show, and for every season after this, they will eventually age a year until they're 18 or 19 by the time of the finale. But quite infamously, the actors were actually older than their on-screen roles. They were all 15 to 16 around the time the pilot was filmed, and were basically playing their ages down. Gibby is remarkable, because he is the exact opposite. When the show started filming, Noah was 11 years old, and he was playing his age up to come across as a 13 year old. And thus by the end of the show, it feels like Gibby gets quite a big arc, partially just because he was the performer who physically changed the most by the time the show was over. In season 1, Gibby is mostly sort of a hallway punchline, someone for Sam to hurt or such, in a way that rarely takes up much time but typically does leave an impression. However, eventually, he starts to appear as a performer on the iCarly webcast, and quickly this becomes what he's primarily known for. Season 1 episode 24 is a story that I skipped earlier, and that's because it's the first Gibby-focused story, which sets in place his flanderization quirk. I feel like I explain this every time I mention it, but a flanderization quirk is some joke or element with a character which starts off as a one-off bit before becoming the only thing that defines them. 
For instance, an early episode of Parks and Recreation once featured a scene where Leslie says that she likes waffles, and by the end of the show, that becomes something that's brought up in nearly every story, to the extent that she becomes the girl who likes waffles. In this little adventure, titled I Win a Date, Gibby reveals to the iCarly cast that he has a crush on a girl at school, but that he's afraid to approach her. The trio come up with the idea of holding a game show on the web show that will secretly be rigged, which I think is a legal, but I forgot to add it, so we just gotta let that one go. Basically, the idea is Gibby is given a chance to win a date with one of three girls, and he somehow ends up picking Carly, despite her trying very hard to make it clear which number his crush was. Gibby and Carly is actually a potential romantic pairing, which the show teases as a joke sometimes. It has an official shipping name, which is Kibby, C-I-B-B-Y, which, come on, people. Carly was right there. It's funny. It sounds like garlic. Use your goddamn brains. Anyways, it turns out that Gibby's crush actually likes Freddy, and they come up with the idea of doing a triple date at the Cheesecake Warehouse, hoping that Gibby and his crush will get to know each other once they're there. Carly tries to make Gibby sound more like Freddy so the girl will take to him instead, before making up even more grandiose lies to try and make him seem appealing. Gibby invented cheesecake. Gibby eventually says that he can't hide who he is, as he begins dancing on their table without a shirt. This isn't the first time Gibby has taken his shirt off on the show, it's actually the third? But it is the moment that ingrained the joke into the minds of kids watching at home. And soon enough, bombastic underage nudity becomes his core defining characteristic. <laughs> Gibby! How did you- I- I have no idea. In season 2 episode 19, he goes to school without a shirt on, and when he's called out by a teacher, he notes that the student handbook technically doesn't say that you have to wear a shirt. And for the rest of the story, he can be seen occasionally removing his top to do various things. His comfort with his body being used as a source of comedy on the internet is often something that is discussed and expanded upon. In I Rocked the Vote, Gibby appears on the show and delivers one of my favorite one-liners in the entire history of the program. Hey there. When I wake up in the middle of the night screaming, this is a song my mom sings to calm me down. And you. In season 2, episode 18, we see Sam approach Gibby with an idea for iCarly, saying that she wants to have Gibby wear a bikini and then fight someone with wet dog food. Gibby runs away in fear, but towards the end of the scene, comes back and says, Okay, no fighting, no dog food. But I will wear the bikini top. But season 3 is truly where Gibby is expanded the most, being given numerous stories which could be considered Gibby episodes, while also doing them in a way that doesn't feel like a unique phenomenon. It just feels natural, in a sense. Firstly, in Season 3, Episode 3, you'll remember that a Sadie Hawkins dance is being held at the school, and Carly convinces Sam to ask Gibby so he won't feel alone. However, when she eventually does, he says, Nah, I'm good and then walks away, causing Sam to become enraged and then obsessed with forcing him to go with her. She goes to his house the night of the dance, only to see that there's another woman there spending the night with him, as he explains that his girlfriend goes to another school, and Sam walks away shocked to learn that Gibby actually pulls. Next, in I Quit I Carly, Gibby joins Spencer's boat as his boat boy, and they have some fun in that B-plot. There's not really much to say here, except that this is the first B-plot to focus on Gibby and Spencer as friends, which becomes a bigger thing later on. You ever notice that Spencer doesn't have adult friends? Like, he'll hold a party and it's all 14-year-olds? That's weird, right? Anyways, this gets us caught back up to Season 3, Episode 11, I Enrage Gibby. In the story, Carly has a bum party at her place where she encourages everyone to come dress like they're homeless. Like I said, this is a recurring thing, you never get used to it. Anyways, Gibby's girlfriend Tasha is in attendance, and privately asks Freddy what camcorder she should buy Gibby for his birthday. He takes her upstairs to show her a model which would make the perfect gift, but she trips and falls on top of him. And at that exact moment, Gibby comes upstairs and is convinced that she was cheating on him with Freddy. Angered like never before, Gibby tells Freddy to be prepared for a fight behind the school gym at 3.02 that Friday, because it is going down. Bring a mop for your blood! Gibby spends several days away from school, training for the fight, and when he gets back, Freddy isn't able to convince him to cancel. That was a chai latte. 
Well, I'm gonna make you a die latte. Sam encourages the fight, becoming Gibby's trainer and moving the venue up to a live broadcast on iCarly.com, before Freddy remembers that he has a personal camera set up which vindicates him, showing that it was an accident. Gibby admits that he was a turd, he apologizes to Freddy, and he gets back with his girlfriend. Now a quick note here, and keeping in mind that I'm writing this as I go, so I might get some details about future episodes a little bit wrong, but I've been told that in later seasons different stories show Gibby hooking up with random girls, and instead of just saying that he broke up with Tasha, they have Gibby explain that they have an open relationship. So what the fuck, man? Also, Lubert has a voice cameo in this one, so I guess it's been six months. That would also explain how Freddy's wounds were all healed. Moving on, let's talk about Season 3, Episode 12, I Space Out. The one where they go into outer space. Alright, they don't really go into space, but they almost do, and that's kind of weird. So at the start of the story, Carly and the gang are holding an event on the show where viewers can call in to dance with them live on the internet. And suddenly, something happens that they didn't quite anticipate. A famous bald billionaire appears on the screen, who the gang recognizes as someone who has recently started a massive space program. And he says he wanted to come on the show for one simple reason to send the iCarly gang into orbit. And to promote my company and show the public that space travel is safe, how would you guys like to do the first live web show from space? You want us to do iCarly from space? Ooh, here in the future, that's a red flag. Kids, if you meet a billionaire and he says that he wants you to be the first civilian to test their trillion dollar space program, that means you're gonna die. If they thought it was safe, they would go into space. You're going to die. By the way, remember last season when Spencer told Carly that it wasn't safe for her to go to an MMA match? When she says she wants to go into space, he doesn't even blink. He's fine with that. So Carly and the gang go to train for the space program, but find competitors in a famous exercise web show, with only one of the teams actually having the chance to be selected. After numerous tests, which both groups do equally poorly at, they're given their final challenge. And basically, if the iCarly gang lasts, they'll be going into space. However, as you can expect, the three are incapable of standing in the same room for even 10 minutes without fighting. They struggle to get used to the enclosed space with the many odd switches and gadgets, and their chances are worsened when Sam sneaks food into the capsule. However, Carly is surprisingly the one to snap, developing space madness and breaking out of the room, sending them all packing. Meanwhile, Spencer begins seeing a little girl inside the apartment but can't get her to appear when anyone else is around. A psychiatrist suggests that this is an effect of him secretly missing Carly, and thus imagining a little girl in his home as he grows nostalgic for when she was little. However, when Carly gets home, she sees the little girl too, before diagnosing it as space madness. Season 3 episode 13 deals with the characters once again being given a chance to briefly transcend from working on the web to working on TV, but not in the usual way. A quick tangent about the start of this episode that kind of reveals what it's like to watch a weird sitcom like this. There's a part in the intro to this one where a bunch of kids are invited onto the iCarly web show, but then run away screaming from Gibby. And when they leave, they go to the left of this door. And that bent my brain a little? Because we've all agreed that to the right of this door is the staircase, and right across is a mystery room that we've never seen inside. But to the left? To the left, there's another mystery room to the left? And the kids run back with all these foam mallets and begin beating Gibby with them, and the gang are all shocked to see this happen. So it was a room where they were keeping foam mallets that were not intended to be used on the web show? We find out in this episode that the music video Freddy filmed for Wade Collins, despite Collins being a terrible person, was actually a huge hit, being one of the most downloaded music videos of all time. Which is a big accomplishment for Freddy, and no doubt something that will help him get a real job when his high school friend circle inevitably collapses like a building loaded with TNT. 
At the same time, we're introduced to Ginger Fox, quite clearly a mean-spirited parody of Britney Spears. Ginger was once the hottest star of all time, being called the sexiest woman alive by some magazines, until her mental health collapsed and a viral video shot by paparazzi cemented her legacy as a joke. However, the star sees the Wade Collins music video and insists that they get that director to take control of her next performance, which will be a live song at the Pop Music Awards. Awards. The web show trio accept, but quickly learn that Ginger is a total wash-up, using the bathroom in the corner of the room when they first meet her, and just generally being unsexy in the eyes of Freddy. However, when a music video news channel stops by, they announce that the iCarly gang will be creating Ginger's comeback hit, meaning that any good or bad that happens will be their fault. However, and I don't think I've had the chance to say this so far, who gives a shit about the A-plot? The Spencer half of the episode is where the good stuff is at. In the story, Spencer meets a beautiful woman while she's out on the town, and they begin dating. They both feel like the relationship is too good to be true, with Spencer suspecting that he's seen the woman somewhere before. Suddenly, when Freddy and Gibby stop by for a quick second, everything clicks together. Gibby? Mom? Oh my god. Yeah, Spencer is banging Gibby's mom, and struggles to get past this emotionally, as every time he looks at her, even after making out, he sees a vision of a 14-year-old boy that he's best friends with. Soon enough, they both struggle with this, as she sees Carly every time she looks at him, and they begin screaming, and I presume decide not to go out for a final date. Meanwhile, the kids direct the star's performance at the PMAs, and it's a disaster as the kids rush to try and cover up her lack of talent or appeal. She looks okay from a distance. That's too much light! We can see her face! More smoke! Thank you. This is a direct imitation and spoof of Britney Spears' performance at the 2007 VMAs, and I gotta say, it's a pretty ballsy move for this team to have such a mean-spirited attack on Britney, because do you know what show this team was working on in 2007? Do I look good, my dear? Zoe 101, a show starring Jamie Lynn Spears, aka the little sister of Britney Spears. Thank God that child stars are so traumatized by their previous work that they can't watch anything associated with the network anymore, or else she might have been really pissed to see this. Anyways, the Ginger Fox performance goes over shockingly well, with fans cheering for her performance and her career being reinvigorated, and the team are left annoyed that no one else sees her lack of talent or beauty, but realize that at least their internet clout wasn't hurt by this fiasco. Season 3 episode 14 is called I Bloop, and is a bloopers episode. It's, uh, alright. They play bloopers. If you want to see that, you can. There's an outtake where Drake Bell walks onto set and calls Miranda Megan and asks where Josh is. And boy, did this have value six months ago. I don't know, when I was told there were 97 episodes of iCarly, I didn't anticipate that a few of those were literally just blooper reels. It kind of ruins the fun of that number. That's like having 95 gold medals for Olympic perfection, and then two bronze medals for tying your shoes. I don't remember ever seeing this at the time, but I'm told that they syndicated this like a regular episode, and that it was super common to see iCarly was on, but then you switch to it, and it's just like, ah, fuck, it's the bloopers episode again. I Won't Cancel the Show is one of the saddest episodes so far, if just in the context of why it was written. You see, suddenly, during the production of this batch of episodes, Jeanette McCurdy was suddenly admitted to hospital, and thus wasn't going to be able to film I, Carly. And so the writers flocked to come up with an episode that could explain why Sam was missing, while also trying to expand upon it. And it just feels kind of weird to see them struggle so hard to explain why Jeanette McCurdy isn't in the show, and why it's still just justified that the show is going on without her. Still, you know, one of my favorite episodes of Frasier is actually the one that stars Niles, because Kelsey Grammer had to suddenly go to rehab. And as we all know, iCarly and Frasier are set in the same universe, so I guess there's a little bit of promise within this story. In the episode, Carly's father calls to say that he's ended up in a place that has a solid internet connection. So that night, everyone on his submarine is going to watch the iCarly.com webcast live, making this the first time he's actually been able to see his daughter's show. 
However, there's very bad news, as we find out that Sam has been sent off to a juvenile detention center after assaulting an ambassador from Mexico. Freddy thinks that they have to cancel, but Carly says that she won't give up the chance for the first time her father is able to see the web show. To which Gibby responds, I thought Spencer was your dad. This makes Carly realize that Spencer would be the perfect co-host for the show. Which, yeah, he basically hosts half of the content on iCarly.com. I, I agree, Carly, no brainer. However, that night, Spencer is having an extravagant date with a sophisticated woman, and he tries to turn Carly down. Her name is Candace. Ha! Candace. More like Candy's Nuts? I feel like I did that wrong. Anyways, Carly begins crying and Spencer agrees to do it, trying his best to do both the silly web show and his date with this woman at the exact same time. How long are iCarly web shows, by the way? Sometimes they come across like a five minute thing and sometimes they'll literally last an entire episode. And also sometimes they act like there's a limit to how long the show can go on for. Like they'll bump people from the schedule to the next week if it's going on too long. Does the web show have to be an exact time every week? Is there a reason for that? Or is it just totally random? Spencer runs upstairs with only 45 seconds to broadcast and everything about the web show is explained to him during that time. Freddy says in 5432, then points at us, then we introduce the show. Why doesn't Freddy say in 54321? No one knows. Because he starts every webcast on the number one. And if he says the number one out loud, then everyone home is gonna hear him say the number one. And then you got a bunch of people in your comments saying, hey, how come every single one of these webcasts starts with some guy saying the number one? Think, Carly, think! So Spencer takes over the show and it seems to be going quite okay. They do an SCTV reference that no one watching Nickelodeon could possibly recognize, and they get to the game and later some skits. However, partway through the webcast, Candace comes upstairs at just the wrong moment. Spencer? Could you give me like five minutes and I'll be right down? They embarrass Spencer, they embarrass Spencer's date, they probably embarrass their father watching with his Navy buddies, but most importantly, Carly learns an important lesson. I, Carly, doesn't work without Sam. Anyways, so we only have three episodes left in the season, and the next one, in my opinion, was pretty memorable for the time. And that's season three, episode 17. I believe in Bigfoot. <laughs> Let's just leave that in. So my schedule this year, in terms of what videos I want to get out, has actually been destroyed by this miniseries. And one of the videos I thought that I would be making right now was my mini-series about Bigfoot. I wanted to sit down and analyze every aspect I could about Bigfoot culture. And now, because of this mini-series, it's looking like we're not going to be able to do that this year. And so to suddenly remember that there's an episode of iCarly about Bigfoot was kind of a kick in the groin, because iCarly is also the reason that I'm not talking about Bigfoot right now. But anyways, I do remember this episode fondly, so let's go ahead and get into it. At the start of the story, as the gang are preparing for an 80s-themed episode of their web show, we find out that Carly has a secret hyperfixation on a famous cryptid, the one and only Bigfoot. On the northern outskirts of Mount Baker National Forest, two hikers saw something that at first they thought was a large bear. It's Bigfoot. I know it's Bigfoot. Shh. So was it a hoax? No. Or was it Bigfoot? Yes! Discussion over. Carly, we discover, is really, really into Bigfoot and is excited by a local sighting in the woods, still being bitter that their fifth grade teacher gave them an F for writing about Bigfoot in an essay about nature. And then Mrs. Gontrell was all, Bigfoot isn't real, so you get an F. I'd like to give her an F. We find out that while Carly believes in Bigfoot, Spencer believes in a cryptid called the Beave Coon. Oh, but there is such a thing as the Beave Coon. Yes, there sure is. Ha! The Beave Coon? More like the... Beave... Nuts. God, I'm not on my A game today. It's fine, it's fine. No one's gonna watch this far. No one's gonna watch this far. <sighs> because of the viral footage of Bigfoot, he becomes a hot topic at the school, with Carly deciding that they're going to do a Bigfoot-themed webcast, having invited a Bigfoot researcher onto the show. Miss Briggs then appears, which is only notable because we don't see her in a canon story again until the finale. Random notes about this episode. Sam name drops the Food Channel, which is, I'm guessing, a distinct Food Network parody separate from Food TV. 
And Freddy watches a reality show called Celebrities Underwater, where David Schwimmer drowns and dies. Guess there's never gonna be a friend's reunion. <laughs> the gang's webcast about Bigfoot goes over so well that they decide to drive up to the northern Washington forest, hopefully avoiding the Black Lodge, to try and find evidence of Bigfoot. They run into two adolescent boys and the Bigfoot researcher that they met earlier. But while Spencer goes out looking for the Beave Coon, the kids mostly stay camped out in their RV, so they don't see much. <laughs> two squirrels wrestling. <laughs> Carly? Hmm. They're not wrestling. <laughs> oh. For some reason, that joke is one of the first things that comes to my head when I think about iCarly. Sam sets up a bear trap, and they capture what seems to be Bigfoot, before they see that it's actually the same researcher in an elaborate costume. As we learn, Bigfoot researchers are so desperate to build clout and income that they're easily willing to fake evidence of him in order to fool more people. However, Spencer says that he was attacked deep in the woods by the real Bigfoot. And as they go to find him, they hear the RV's horn, meaning that someone has stolen it. They initially believe that the researcher did before they see that he's still there. And we soon learn that Bigfoot is the one who stole the RV. <laughs> Let's go ahead and return to our list of things that are real in the iCarly universe. I'm adding the frozen head of Walt Disney, because I forgot to do that before. And of course, Bigfoot. We also briefly see the Beave Coon standing in a tree during the episode, so I'm adding that. And I'm gonna write down David Schwimmer is dead so we don't forget. Moving on, I actually want to cover the penultimate episode last, because I think it's important that we end with a bang on this one. So before we talk about the crimes of the season, let's talk about the season finale. Season 3, Episode 18, I Beat the Heat. In the story, a heat wave strikes Seattle, which leads Spencer to buy an industrial air conditioner for the apartment. Soon enough, the power goes out across the city due to so many people doing the same thing. But Spencer remembers that he has a generator and gets things back going. This leads to their apartment being the only one in the city with power. And soon enough, character after character starts showing up to the apartment, each more obscure to the lore than the last, and all wanting a break from the heat. You kind of get the vibe that this was written to work as a series finale, while they also felt pretty good about getting renewed. It features a ton of throwbacks and payoff to episodes from seasons 1 and 2, while still being a lighthearted episode that isn't really where we'd like to end a show like this on. Lubert shows up to the apartment trying to convince Freddy's mom to take him back, Spencer's shady doctor from the Shelby Marks episode shows up, as does Griffin, who wants to use the air-conditioned apartment to make sure his peewee babies don't get warped by the heat. Meanwhile, Freddy has a girl over that he met online and is much taller than he anticipated. And Carly tries to protect her model of a utopian society, which she made for science class. Fighting naturally breaks out in the apartment among the many visitors. Until Carly gives an impassioned speech about how America can become a utopia if we all just learn to love and respect our neighbors. Towards the end of the speech, however, the power comes back on and everyone flees. And Carly's project is destroyed by Freddy's new love interest after he accidentally sprays lemon into her face. With that, let's quickly get into the crimes of season three. As I mentioned last time, it's really hard to move on with this list, knowing that we ended this bit last time with the illegal construction of a nuclear generator, but we'll keep marching forwards because there are a few weird things this season. In episode one of season three, Sam visits the dentist and suddenly turns violent. And although she gets the procedure done, Carly later claims that the dentist was bit by her four times and might lose part of his finger. Obviously, this is another example of assault, which somehow has become boring with the Sam character. Nevertheless, I'm calling this eye crime number 26. Later in episode three, I Cook, Sam announces that she's hired someone to rig a security system up to her locker with the intention that it will deter thieves. In actuality, we learn that anything that touches the locker will be severely electrocuted, illustrated in the episode by a wiener becoming immediately crisp and black after being placed upon it. Sam tries to convince Freddy to touch her locker before Carly stops her, and Spencer then accidentally backs into it, severely injuring him. 
This could be tried in numerous different ways depending on the broader context, but the plan certainly seems to be carefully crafted to assault someone at the school. This is thus, I crime number 27. Now, the next crime is actually a little bit different from the rest of the ones I've featured today. Typically, in the iCrime segment, what I'm doing is applying external logic from the real world to the iCarly sitcom. It's about saying, well, according to this set of rules, these things would be illegal if the show was real. But iCrime number 28 is actually about quite the opposite. As we're going to be applying internal logic to iCarly based on its existence within the main Nickelodeon sitcom universe. I'll be talking more about this theory in the next video, how it's confirmed in some episodes and contradicted in others, but to sum it up briefly, it's implied numerous times that iCarly is set in the same shared universe as several other Nickelodeon shows, mostly those made by the same creators. Here's why this matters. You'll remember that in Episode 2, they face off against Ricky Flames in a cooking competition. Well, towards the end of the food battle, as they rush to finish it, Carly can be heard yelling this. Now, why is this important? Because this is an Easter egg reference to the show Drake and Josh, which Miranda starred in before iCarly, as we've discussed several times. I'm going to quickly break that story down, because first of all, it's relevant, and second of all, I think this is going to be the last time I ever find an excuse to watch Drake and Josh. In the story, Season 3, Episode 2, Josh is also planning to enter a cooking competition, the annual Salsa Fest. He tells Drake that the winner will get a plasma TV, and Drake begins trying to join in, accidentally cutting Josh's thumb off in the process. Man, that's gotta be the worst thing Drake Bell has ever done. After they get it reattached, Megan hears about the competition and asks if she can join their team, and when they say no, she mixes something into the sauce that makes it explode in their faces. Megan! After some general sitcom shenanigans, the boy figure out that Megan is planning on entering the salsa competition on her own. Later, they hear a strange man delivering something secret to the home, and sneakily, they see Megan speaking of what was delivered. The Peruvian Puff Pepper, a secret ingredient that is extremely rare and will make her salsa better than man could dream of. The boys research the pepper, discovering that it's indeed extremely rare and hard to buy. It says here they're only available in South America. <laughs> what? South America! The boys decide to sneak into Megan's room and steal the peppers and use it in the recipe. Megan tries to bully them into giving the peppers back, although they play stupid, something they're very naturally good at. Later, at the salsa competition, Drake and Josh wow the judges and are crowned the winners. However, when they're asked what their secret is and say that it was the Peruvian peppers, a hush falls over the crowd. I'm very sorry, but the Peruvian puff pepper has been illegal in the United States since it was proven to cause kidney failure and our chapped lips. <laughs> Boys, I'm afraid we're going to have to disqualify your salsa. And so, Megan is crowned the winner, and slyly admits that she set the pair up. Anyways, if we accept that Megan smuggling the Peruvian puff peppers into America is a crime, and that it's illegal for Drake and Josh to use said peppers in a cooking competition, then we have to also accept that Carly having and using the same peppers in a different cooking competition is also a crime on the exact same level. This also technically means that they should have been disqualified by the judges, and Ricky Flames actually still hasn't lost a cooking competition? Anyways, that's iCrime number 28. Next, let's move on to the first story that I skipped over in the main intro. In Season 3, Episode 4, the iCarly gang hold an awards show on their web show where they give out awards to people who have sent in the coolest clips of themselves. Due to a miscommunication, Spencer builds one 10-foot-tall statue of Carly when she was meant to build 10 1-foot-tall statues, and Spencer has to build the statues for the show as it's being broadcast live. Due to a tip from Freddy, Spencer learns that there are foreign models in the lobby of the apartment complex wearing only swimsuits waiting for their photographer who missed his flight. We find out that the models are all men, much to the annoyance of Spencer. He commissions them to help build the statues, and soon they get pretty into the rhythm of it. However, eventually the group's photographer shows up to take the models to their shoot, even as Spencer is so very close to having all of the awards built. Spencer asks to speak to him in the hall, goes outside for a second, and then rushes back in, saying that the photographer agreed to give them all 30 more minutes. And as he says that, you think, 
Oh god, Spencer's holding duct tape. And yep, Spencer ties the photographer up in the hall, entirely so he can keep the Eurodance sweatshop running. And after struggling for 20 minutes, the photographer finally breaks free and rushes upstairs. This might be the worst thing they've done so far in the show. Because unlike the episode where they build a nuke or the one where they cause a pileup, there's no sort of innocence implied about the topic, and it's not a situation where they were forced into it, like when they skydived into Japan. Spencer fought a man, tied him up, and held him against his will, and all to save the iCarly web show from mild embarrassment. So first of all, boy does Spencer love his sister. Second of all, you might be quick to call this kidnapping, but I believe this is actually false imprisonment, a similar but different crime. In Washington state law, a person is guilty of unlawful imprisonment in Washington if he or she knowingly restrains another person. And so, I'm calling this our iCrime number 29. Oh, that rhymes. Episode 7, as you'll remember, features a turf war between the gang and another pet photography business which turns dirty very quickly. Unprotected by the police, they break into their rival's pet business, kidnap their cat, and blackmail them over the situation. Now, the gang are entirely justified in this episode. If the law won't protect you, you protect yourself. Fuck the police and fuck Officer Carl. Moving on, this takes us to I Crime number 30, which we find in Season 3, Episode 11, I Enrage Gibby. In the B-plot for this story, a newspaper incorrectly insinuates that Spencer is actually dead, and he initially wants to correct this in the press before he's informed that the art of dead people sells for considerably more money than those who are alive. He thus not only becomes reclusive to sell the narrative that he is departed, but ropes his off-screen friend Sako and later Carly and Sam into selling his artwork while enforcing the lie that he is no longer among the living. Now, I'm no lawyer, and as we know, neither is Spencer, but my understanding of fraud is that to be charged with it, it needs to be proven that you A. Knew you were lying, B. Lied for personal benefit, and C. Lied to cause some kind of harm to another person in this case financial harm, by asking for more money based on the narrative that Spencer isn't alive. I know this one is a little difficult because I couldn't find any similar cases like this, and there's no paperwork for it, but in my opinion a court case could easily break out over this entire scheme. So I'm calling it I Crime number 30. In the same episode, Spencer puts Pop Rocks into his mouth and then does this to Sam's head for an unusually long time. She's 15! I'm calling this a crime. Later, in Season 3, Episode 15, Sam shoves a hot dog down the pants of a Mexican ambassador, which is why she ends up in juvie and the explanation for why she's missing from the story. In reality, assaulting an ambassador could easily land you with up to three years in jail. So it's lucky that we end up seeing Sam in the next episode after all. That's I Crime number 32 and the final crime of the season. Do you see what I mean when I said these sections were going to get less impactful as we went on? Anyways, let's rewind a little now and talk about the only story we have left. Season 3, Episode 17, I, Psycho. In the story, the troop are planning on going to the annual Webicon, when they get a V-mail from a local fan, and goddammit, the play button is still visible when the video is playing, when will they learn? Anyways, they get a V-mail from a hyperfan named Nora Dorschlitt who says that her 16th birthday is happening that year, and since no one came last year, she wanted to invite the iCarly gang. Against all logic, they decide to stop in before the convention, and Nora is so excited that she puts on her favorite 8-track and gets the party going. As she starts a slow dance with Freddy, and Carly dances with a geriatric clown, who soon leaves in a stretcher as he had an aneurysm. The iCarly gang have a great idea, however. They do a spontaneous live stream from Nora's house, telling all of her school friends to stop by if they want to meet the gang and see the show. So the kids start flooding in to watch the skits, and oh hey, it's Bertha. So the kids start flooding in, and it turns out to be the best party of the year. Nora kisses Bertha, which should be a positive representation because you don't see a lot of lesbian or bi characters in Nickelodeon during this era, but I know for a fact that they only threw this in to hint that Nora is deranged and about to do something very unhinged. So it's less than woke, I think. The party leaves and everyone at school seems to love her, and the girl she kisses asks if she wants to hang out later. And she thanks the gang for doing something so amazingly nice. And I feel... this swell of anxiety. Because we're at the 23 minute mark, and normal like Carly episodes are 22 minutes with the credits. And if we stop here, this is the nicest, most wholesome episode of iCarly ever. But I look at the counter, 
and we're only halfway through. And the episode is still called I Psycho. The gang say they had a good time, but that they have to leave. Nora says that she put all of their luggage in the basement and to follow her down. In the basement, they find a recording studio where her father records commercial jingles, and she invites them to go look. And then she locks them inside, saying that she intends to keep them there forever. You're angels that were sent to me to change my life. I can't let my angels fly away. As they try to call for help, she reveals that she's stolen all of their phones, meaning that they really are truly trapped. So I bet y'all are wondering what Spencer is up to right about now, right? Well, get this, he accidentally breaks part of the countertop, and then he invites Gibby over to have summer camp at his place, but says he can only start once he's repaired the counter. But the more they try and repair it, the more it breaks until they crack the whole wall and it goes straight up to the ceiling. Oh, Spencer, oh, Gibby, you two rapscallions. Partway through the day, Gibby's little brother Guppy shows up, apparently missing him. This kid is played by Noah's actual little brother, and for what I remember, he exists so that Gibby could evolve past the original gimmick, while still retaining a memory of what his character was in Season 1, but that's kind of a whiles away at the moment. Nora keeps the gang there overnight, texting their friends and family to convince them that they're okay, and only giving them food in exchange for a kiss with Freddy through the glass. Now the only continuity error is they're stuck in this recording booth for like two days, and it's never explained where they go to the bathroom. And I know you guys are thinking, like, Quinn, that's a weird thing to bring up. But no, every other time something like this happens on iCarly, they are so careful to explain when and how the characters are going to the bathroom. But in this episode, they don't even think to bring it up. When the gang nearly escapes, she appears with an axe and a Richard Nixon mask, and they're chased back inside. Thinking fast, Carly says that Gibby's birthday is the next day, and that they promise to send him a birthday message. And when Gibby gets said message, noting that it's not his birthday, he figures out the hidden message inside and makes it to Nora's house. <laughs> An insanely choreographed fight sequence breaks out, as the pair break much of her living room before tumbling downstairs. She kicks him against a wall of boxes, and his mouth bleeds, and it seems like he's out for the count. But he takes off his shirt, revealing his true power, and the brawl intensifies. All while Guppy lets the iCarly gang back out in the background. Nora is knocked out for the count, the iCarly gang are freed, and all thanks to the heroism of Gibby and Guppy. The gang finally have a summer camp moment together, Nora goes to prison, and they all celebrate that they'll never see her again. Or will they? Bum bum bum! So you have just watched four and a half hours of iCarly analysis. Is everything okay? So at the start of this video, I made the pitch that iCarly was going to be the thing that was going to set my life right. I was going to be happier, I was going to start going to the gym all the time, you know, stuff like that. So how did that end up going? Well, let's put it like this. I'm still playing Raid Shadow Legends every single day. I'm actually in Gold Arena 4 right now, which if you play the game, you know that that's a pretty big accomplishment. But yeah, I didn't do any of that other stuff. I initially thought about just cutting that out from the final release, but I, I thought, you know, I think it's important that I'm honest to my audience. And more importantly, that fanboy and chum chum joke is really, really funny. The thing about iCarly is that I found it really hard to rewatch for this. It's got this weird, gross, mean energy that I didn't really notice until I was watching it as an adult. And so my initial plan of watching one episode a day from January to May didn't end up working out because I kept getting depressed because this show makes me feel like shit. And I think this like weird mental state I've been in got about a million times worse when they announced the day that the revival was coming out. When they said the revival is coming out June 17th and suddenly I had a deadline that I didn't ask for. I had this deadline, I had to get something out by June 17th. And, and the time that I'm recording this, by the way, it's 9 p.m. June the 14th. But I just, uh, I'm gonna log off everywhere because I don't want to hear about this show because it's just gonna remind me that I failed. I failed to get this miniseries out before the revival, which is exactly when I should have gotten it out. Um, 
And I feel like a failure because I only got one of these videos out. But, but I did my best, to be honest with you. And so I just want you guys to understand. You'd be surprised. You would think that making, a, you know, a piece of analysis of iCarly that's longer than the Snyder Cut would be easy on you. But it turns out it's actually, you know, slightly emotionally taxing. <laughs> but with that out of the way, we have officially finished iCarly Season 3. And can we talk about exactly how much of an accomplishment that really is? To me, there's always been this kind of weird separation between Season 3 and Season 4 of iCarly. And the way that I've come to look at it is that Seasons 1 through 3 of the show were the middle school arc, and Seasons 4 through 6 of the show were the high school arc. Now, that's not actually representative of the actual text of the show. At the beginning of season two, they say they're attending middle school, but a couple episodes later, Carly says she's in the ninth grade. So I guess you could argue that in season one, they're in the eighth grade, and in season two, they enter high school. But that's not, that's not what I mean. I mean that when seasons one through three of iCarly aired, I was in middle school. And it was the biggest thing on television. And after that, you know, when I entered high school, not only did I kind of stop watching kids shows as much, but I feel like iCarly stopped being a thing that they promoted very often. Suddenly, a new episode of iCarly would feel exceptionally rare and also kind of meaningless. Like losing a toy when you're a kid and then finding it behind your dresser when you're a teenager. Like, oh, this is still around? And so while I would on occasion tune into iCarly just to see what was happening, it became more and more rare as every year passed, and based on ratings alone, it seems like I wasn't exactly alone on that. And that's why I have decided to split my iCarly analysis at this exact point. In other words, this is the end of I Binged iCarly. After this gets uploaded, I'm going to work very hard to get a follow-up video about the final three seasons done, but I really do think this is the perfect place to split the video up, because watching these final three seasons is going to be a completely different experience to me. And for those of you saying, Quentin, how am I supposed to last without more iCarly analysis? What am I supposed to do while I wait on this second video? Well, just live life. Breathe air. And don't forget to go down to the description and make sure you're subscribed. Hitting subscribe will notify you when the next video comes out, and the more subscribers that I gain from this, the more motivated that I'm honestly going to feel to make sure that I get that next video turned around as quickly as possible. I'm trying to get to 500,000 subscribers this year, and if we can get there early, I think it's just going to energize me so much to work on this miniseries. And with that, I've been Quidden Reviews, and that's all you need.